Saturday, February 18, 2023, Ghanaians woke up to the unfortunate news of the demise of Christian Achu. For close to two weeks, Ghanaians have been praying that the blaster swinger who had been trapped in the rubble of a building in Turkey following an earthquake in that country was going to be found alive. Our hopes and our aspirations never materialized as Achu was on Saturday confirmed dead. We are at Ashalibotri, an area where his family resides to speak to people in the area on their fondest memory of him, what they will remember him for, how they reacted to news of his demise, and some words to his family. How, how did you hear the news of Achu's I mean, unfortunate person? Okay, um, this morning <clears throat> my brother um, came to me and he told me they discovered his body and also said um, they found him, um, they declared him dead um, on Sky Sports too. So when I heard the news, seriously, it really pained me because someone should go, it's, it's, I think it's been almost two weeks and someone, I wouldn't wish that for any, any other person. So when I heard the news, I was really down. Yeah. What's your biggest memory of Christian Achu? Okay, um, let me see. It was, I think, a, a match, a Ghana match against Lesotho. He scored a very nice goal, a finesse goal. I think outside the 18 box. Yeah, yeah, I really like that goal. So, what, what message would you give to his family who are going through the pains now? Um, I would like to tell them that we are all in this together, but they should take heart. Actually, I woke up this morning and I was just scrolling through my phone. And it was so funny getting to see the age intervals, and it, it hit so hard on me. What is wrong? Is this guy really gone? Until I, I saw one blogger giving out the information that we didn't hear good news this morning. It was so heartbreaking. Like, I, I don't know how to say it, but being in this neighborhood, uh, Christian has been one of the people that you could easily hear and then be proud of that there is someone who is nationally recognized and is in this locality. But coming out, I know it's, it's difficult for me. I don't know how the family is going to take it right now, but to we as a people in the society where he lived, it's, 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 it's not easy for us. Me personally, I can say that. Actually, I have a little bit close relation with the family because, um, I don't know, but I just want to wish them the strongest condolence that they can ever have. But it's not easy having a child who has brought this joy to the family and passing out as if <laughs> just a nightmare, like just one day and then everything is just gone like that. So I wish them to stay strong and then I pray and encourage them that they are good people that are here to come in the family, just as he, he also came. So I wish them strength. One of my colleagues just told me about the news. I wasn't having data, so I couldn't follow the, the update. So I just heard the news, and in fact, I was really sad. I was really sad. I don't know. I'm even short of ways. And I believe we have lost a great legend. All I have to say right now is my, con my condolences to them, to the family. May God strengthen them. It's not easy. It's not easy. Someone came to me today that they said Christian Atu is dead. And so it's so very sad. And we are praying to, I mean, to their family to, I mean, hold it. And what I'll say is, it's very painful. But everything is in hands of God. Sadly, we just wake up just one day. We just said uh, there's an earthquake that happened in Tiki. And that very day, crab before the match he played, he scored a goal. And he was relaxing and the earthquake just happened. So, after now, we are all still waiting for what is the news coming up. Whether it is true, whether he is, he is found or not. Yeah, but today, the came out today. It's gone? Yes. Okay. For now, they have not have concrete evidence that whether he is gone or not. We are still waiting. When the body is found? The other we all can believe that he's, the body has been found and he's gone. This is sad news to all Ghanaians. We are very, very much because he's a good player. Everybody, I like the way he plays his football. 
So it's very, very, very sad. I'm very sad, in fact. I really like the way he plays his football. What, what would be your message to his family who are now going through the things of losing the lab? What I would like to say is that my condolence to all of them. It's very sad that we hear that our brother is gone. It can happen to anybody. It can happen to you. It can happen to me. So just take heart. I feel very sad. At the time I was having my grief, as I, I just, I don't know what to say again. I need to be telling my wife, I have, I have a bad day this morning. I'm very sad. So we've been hearing from some residents of Ashalibotio where Christina Chu's family house is located. It's sad that the man who wowed Ghanaians with his amazing talent is no more. It's unfortunate that the man who helped rescue prisoners could not be rescued when he needed this most. As the nation grieves and as the family grieves, Ghana Web wishes them its deepest condolence. <music>
I don't know whether H.A. you went through that education oh, no, system. Not at all. <laughs> I'm sure you probably went through GHS and SHS. I did. So because of the education reforms, mm -hmm. and I went for A level for two years at Kumasi High School. Okay. And then from there to Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, where I pursued uh, a first degree in civil engineering, and then. Uh, I've been a member of the Ghana Institution of Engineers or Engineering. I'm a corporate member. In terms of education, to I hold my executive master's degree in public administration. I've also acquired knowledge and skills training from some international inst uh, institutions, including uh, international procurement knowledge from International Law Institute in Washington, mm -hmm. uh, pro Project and Programs Management from REPA in the United Kingdom, Road Asset Management from Swedish International Development Agency in Sweden. I've had the opportunity to be trained in emulsified bitumen, which is used for roadworks, okay. uh, for production, for application of that as a road construction material. And so, in terms of working life, I've worked in both construction, road construction industry, and then road consulting firms. And then I've also worked with the Ministry of Roads and Highways before as a civil servant. So it was at the Ministry of Roads and Highways as a civil servant, then I resigned in the year 2008 mm -hmm. to contest for the first time to be a member of parliament for Mampong constituency. So I won the primaries in May 2008 and went on to win the general elections of 2008 and entered parliament on the 7th of January 2009. So for two terms, I served the good people of Mampong. Mm. Then 2014, I made my first attempt to seek the leadership nomination of the new patriotic party out of seven contestants, I came in third in that contest. And then after that, we supported our candidate, then now sitting president, Nana Kufuado, and the party won in the 2016 election. It appears you've done nearly everything, your political life and all of that. Now let's, let's just come down to the main uh, cracks of the issues. Now you want back in the race. Why now? Well, this is an ambition that was based on my personal conviction. And my first attempt was in 2014. And you know, in life, you make progress. Mm. And that ambition has not been truncated. So if the opportunity has come for 2023, the new patriotic party will search or look or elect a new person to lead the party for 2024 elections. Once I have not truncated my ambition, I need to put myself forward. You believe it's the right time? Well, the timing cannot be uh, more than now. In any case, in 2014, I was 49 years when I made my first attempt. Okay. And in interacting with the rank and file of the party in 2014, they saw the potential in me and some encouraged me that even 2014, if I was not successful, I should consider that in the near, in the future, I will still have the opportunity to lead the party. So we move on. Okay. It's not a step by step. And so if this year, which will be a competitive elections to be run by the party. And let me, let me uh, let you know that after 2014, the party has not held any competitive presidential primaries because the sitting president won. Mm -hmm. And then 2020, he had to run on the polls on the ticket of the party. So almost eight to nine years now, we are now going to have another competitive elections in the party. It's interesting you mentioned that because um, as you are well, well aware, there are a number of faces, names that have come up 
who are also interested in this same position. How well do you see yourself uh, in terms of performance? Well, how well would I see myself in terms of performance? When because there are a lot of big names, actually. Big names do not win elections. Elections are won by your character, by your good self, endearing yourself to the electorate, articulating your vision, and they having the acceptability for you that you could be and you are able qualify to be their leader. Not necessary any name as such. Mm. And so the similarly, in 2014, when the seven contestants that I was one of them, I was seen to be the underdog. I was seen to be somebody unknown in the political environment of our country. The other six contestants had all worked under J. Kufo's administration, either as ministers of state or deputy ministers of state. And I didn't even have not been in that position before. Mm -hmm. But when we went through that process in 2014, I came in third, which was an enviable position that I secured for myself. And that shows the potential that the MPP delegate found in me and then encouraged me to make progress with this ambition. So currently, uh, we are all expressing interest to seek the leadership nomination. Mm -hmm. The race itself has not begun. Sure. It will officially begin when the party opens nomination. And then one is able to pick the nomination form, complete it with all the supporting documents as it may be required by the party, together with the prescribed filing fee. Once you submit all these things, then you are in the race. Mm. And for, so for now, I'm sure you are also hearing names that may contest. Yeah. But it could surprise you that at the opening of nomination, some of the names that you may have in mind may decline not to contest because conditions every day in every day are conditions are changing. Now I am championing the cause of a new face okay. for the party. Why do I say so? Since 1993, it has been an eight year cycle between MPP and NDC. NDC had their first eight years under Jerry Rawlings as their leader and president of the Republic. In the year 2000, we had Professor Mills as a sitting vice president. Mm. He became the candidate for NDC, the presidential candidate. But he could not bring the eight because he was part of the government. He was in the government as a sitting vice president. So he couldn't break the eight. Then in 2008, under J. Okufo led administration of MPP government, the current president, Anado, was a minister in J. Okufo's administration. He also became the candidate, the presidential candidate for the MPP in 2008. He was part of J. Okufo's administration at that time. He also could not break the eight. Mm. Then 2016, which is the latest one, you had um, Mr. John Dramani Mahama as a sitting president with NDC eight years, his effort to break the eight, he couldn't make it. So you're drawing all of these on a pattern? Yes, of course. And that is clear. And it is clear that after eight years, if you pick somebody, in the government as your presidential candidate, I mean the party in government after your eight years, you'll pick somebody who is also part of the government, then you are not likely to succeed. But be that win. as it may, the MPP seems like a very unpopular party right now. Well, Don't you agree? No, I do not agree with you. Maybe some people may be disgruntled, some may be unhappy, okay? Some, the appeal may have declined, but it doesn't mean that it is unpopular. Okay. You don't agree because it's unpopular? 
No, the party is made up of individuals. We are all party members. I'm a party member. Okay. And so our base as a party still remains. And usually it is the what we call the undecided voters or the floating voters that we want to appeal to because by your own base, you may not be able to secure the 50% plus one to mm -hmm. win the general elections. Then you need to stretch your hands and appeal to the un undecided voters or the floating voters. And so if one wants to make a claim that the party is unpopular, you may be dissatisfied with the character and behavior or performance of one or two or three people in government. But to make a general conclusion that the party is unpopular, I beg to disagree. Mm. Because uh, it, is, it wouldn't be all the people in the party, it wouldn't be all party members whom that you or other people may be dissatisfied with. And that is why I say that it is not appropriate to describe that the party is unpopular. Maybe the behavior, the character, the performance of some personalities in the party at the moment may not be satisfactory. Let's have a scorecard. Let's mark the MPP mm -hmm. on a scale of one to 10. Where would you put the party? In terms of what? You well, know, generally, if you want to score, you must have your criteria. Maybe we can start from the economy, on the economy. Score the MPP. Well, I mean, it, it's, it will not be prudent on my part to give a score between, from zero to 10, honestly. It, 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 it will not be appropriate Maybe let's for move away from the economy. How about on the delivery of promises? But the, the, of course, we are experiencing difficult times in the economy. I agree. We are experiencing difficult times because of the level of indebtedness mm. that we have, both external and domestic. And government is taking the steps to see how the economy can improve by the microeconomic indicators in terms of interest rate, inflation, the exchange rate, how we can achieve stability mm -hmm. on all these microeconomic indicators so that the happiness of citizens can be fully restored. Yes, we are experiencing these challenges. Now, government is dealing with the debt exchange program. We're talking about some haircuts here and there, you know. So all this approach is intended to restore the confidence back into the economy and to stabilize the economy with all these indicators. And it is possible that it will take a year or a, a little over a year to see some signs of recovery. Mm -hmm. Okay, to see some signs of recovery. And I also believe that once government also prudently looks at the expenditure, the expenditure side of the budget equation and then be able to cut down on some expenditures that may not be necessary for government, it will also help to cushion the liquidity of the country for our ability to service our debt and still have sufficient funds for our investment project. Let me hold you right there. When we return, I would, I would pick a conversation right from here. We are speaking to um, Honorable Francis Adenimo. Seeking the nod of delegates of the NPP to become their flag bearer. Now, before we took those messages, you were actually talking about cutting down expenditure, unnecessary expenditure. There's also the issue of the DDEP and all of that. What do you say about what's happening now? The government asking people to more or less enjoy all these haircuts and things like that, yet yeah. itself as a government is not taking a lot of the forefront doing these first. What do, what do you say about yes. that? Yes, there's a problem. 
And the problem is that our debt is not sustainable. We are using our 70% of our domestic revenue to service our debt. So how much is remaining to pay for compensation? How much is remaining to pay for other government services and statutory payment? Then how much will remain for you to undertake investment projects in terms of infrastructure, roads, schools, hospitals, you know, and then even the ability to feed yourself. So currently we have a problem. I do not want us to focus our attention on what I will put in quote, Nahu Kosa. At this stage, where there's a problem, you look for a solution to the problem. Then when the solution is secured or is found, then we can come back home and ask ourselves who is a causative agent mm. or who caused that. And then once we identify who caused that, then we can see that we are prescribing this punishment for you. We have a debt on our neck. Our economy is in distress. It's in crisis. We are seeking $3 billion loan, concessionary loan from IMF. The IMF money is not going to be free. Oh. Because we are a member country of IMF, that is why we are getting it at that low interest rate. But it is repayable. But the IMF also wants to make sure that by extending that credit facility to Ghana, we have the ability to pay it back at the appropriate time. So they are saying that, look, look at the level of your debt. Do something about it. Let's see how the program you have to contain your debt, sustain it, be servicing it, whilst you take on board to our money, and still you'll be able to service that money at the appropriate time when it is due. Mm -hmm. The best thing in my view to do is to engage citizens. And I'll give for the benefit of viewers and listeners an incident, a situation that happened in Germany. At that time, we had West Germany and East Germany. When the Berlin Wall was broken and the unification came, mm -hmm. West Germany was more developed than East Germany. So there was this differential. Then the chancellor at that time came up and said, look, those from the West, the East guys are our brothers and sisters. We need to help to develop the East as well. So let every individual make a contribution for the development of the East German portion of the entire unified Germany. And by the engagement, the citizens of West Germany accepted that we are now one country. Let us help one another. And they all made contributions to support the work of the government. And today, if you go to Germany, the east portion or east side of Germany even has modern infrastructure more than the west part of Germany as at that time today. To relate it to our country, we have a problem. Let's look for the solution. What I will admonish the Kufuado led government is to that they should engage people. They should put the figures down. I know pensioners who have invested their pensions in bonds are so dissatisfied and they said they will not participate in the debt exchange program. Because some say, you won't pay me until 10 years. Mm. Even my coupon that should be paid maybe twice a year, you are also going to reduce the rate for me. And my principal will be in 10 years. By 10 years, will I be alive? Or not. These are genuine concerns that they have all expressed. But granted, we also have a problem. So the admonishment goes to government for government to put the figures down. This is the, the total number of pensioners who have invested their pensions in bonds. The total number is this. 
the quantum of their investment is so much. If we have to pay this pay that we are unable, the spreadsheet will indicate. And then, then the government can decide, let us perform some iteration. We vary this, we vary that, we vary that. Whilst you government, you are doing that, check your expenditure side. Maybe the president can decide to issue a directive that henceforth, apart from the president, maybe the chief of staff and the executive secretary to the president, the speaker of parliament and the clerk of parliament, and then the chief justice and the judicial secretary and the vice president and his secretary, no government official should travel outside the country on board business class. Everybody traveling as a public official on government business, you should travel economy. Though that directive can be issued. If you are a minister of state and you, you are going outside the country on uh, government business, why can't you also uh, sit in economy class in the airplane? You know, it will also be cutting, it's part of cutting down the government expenditure. Maybe expenses on fuel, we should need to look at expenses on fuel. Can we reduce so that you encourage all public officials or appointees, government appointees, to use saloon cars whilst they are in what? In, in the capital city of Ghana and working. If they have to trek to other parts of the country, then they can have access to their um, cross-country vehicles, the V8, and then travel. It's, it's very clear. The, these things are things that administratively, yeah. it can be done. Sure. It can be done. But these are things you can do. Sure, absolutely. Now, now and it's they are clear. part of the things that I have in my mind. That is why last week when I announced my intention mm -hmm. and within my speech, one of the areas I said was how we would improve on our public service delivery. And therefore, we will not go into the usual business of incremental budgeting. Now is the time for us to do budgeting from first principles. If a, a, a state institution, you have computers, laptops, or office equipment, or office uh, furniture, and they are just a year, two years, three years, and they are still in good use, why would you want to continue to purchase those items again in the ensuing year? Because you have budgeted for those things. No. So we have to look at budgeting from first principles. And once we do all these things, administrative expenses can be lowered. Then it comes to public procurement. Procurement of um, 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 contracts, especially the the large value contracts where you have to allow for competition because where there is competition then you can be sure that you will achieve quality and achieve value for money because all players in the game everybody is now going to the drawing board to be very competitive in pricing in all the proposals the technical and the financial proposals that they will submit for the job that they have been asked to tender for mm. let me let me let me allow you to also get us into your your bigger picture of what you want to do for the country you've already painted a very gloomy sort of gloomy situation of what it looks like now what exactly is the message you'll be selling to Ghanaians okay. and then and then we can look at how how much of in the my campaign speech, is going on actually in my speech of last week first February mm. in which I will share uh, copies with you, I outline seven point policy development program mm. for a country under my watch. My team, my good self, we, ha we, we have studied the situation and have developed the seven point. There is an eighth point, but that one is reserved until I secure the nod. And then once we are into the competition, the campaign competition with our uh, our competitors next year, then I will share that eighth point. So the eight is the game changer. Yeah, that is, is, is that it's going to tie to the breaking the eight. Mm, well, the breaking the eight has three basic conditions that need to be satisfied. 
the unity within the party itself must be strengthened so that we maximize our efforts. Then the government performance is also key you know, to help the party to break the eight. And then the third condition is the face who will lead the party to be able to break the eight. But on my seven point policy development plan, the first one is on agriculture. And as a country, we should be able to feed ourselves. We should be able to provide our carbohydrate needs, our protein needs, and then our minerals and vitamin needs as a nation. And all this we can do. For carbohydrate, we know is a cereals, maize, millet, rice, name the rest of the cereals. Mm. We also know the protein, livestock, poultry, fish. We should be able to do all this, to be able to feed ourselves. Then vegetables and fruits. So the policy is that no Ghanaian should go to bed, go to school, go to work hungry. We can do that on our own. To achieve that, yes, we must look at agriculture and food sufficiency and security. So that is the first point. The second point, having eaten and you are satisfied as a human being, you are concerned with your education and your health. So the two, the second and the third can be education and health or health and education because they are all social sectors of our economy. You need to develop, you need to go to school. And in terms of our education, technical, vocational, and skills training will be key under my watch. I'm tempted to just ask a follow-up question just on this. We know how many times politicians have invested in education and health in particular, but it doesn't seem like the same politicians want to be part of that system their children don't school in the same schools. The politicians don't use those health facilities. So we need to reverse it. How do because we do if that? You, if you come up with that policy, then you must believe in it. You must believe in it. And leadership is by example. Okay? So for now, we are pursuing free senior high school education, which in my opinion is very fantastic policy. So every child, right from kindergarten or nursery through kindergarten through basic education primary jhs you should end up at least at the senior high school level mm. and that is good so it is for government to improve on the quality of the educational institutions so that all of us i should find my children provided i have children who are still young to go to school and for in this particular case I do not have my kids have all completed <laughs> and tertiary institutions. Okay. But everybody should be encouraged. Because if you are introducing a system and you cannot participate, then it means you don't believe in it. You must believe in it, participate in it, because it's leadership by example. And ten Canadian dollars for the first transaction. Would you send this guy a coffee? Dialogue to Lemonade Finance.
President George Okonwia. President of the Republic of Liberia. I am deeply saddened to hear the devastation news of the passing of my neighbor, my small brother, and my young friend, the late Christian Achu. Uh, <laughs> for president of this year. Uh, it, team of the recent earthquake in Turkey. The, I knew him personally and in his formative years in the game of soccer. I had the opportunity to interact with him with his early training. And I'm a witness to it. Because when um, the late Achu was with Cheetah FC, and the former president, I mean the president of Liberia used to train when he comes on holidays. And he used to tell Achu, do this, don't do this, do this, like coaching him on the field. I have been there on several occasions with him. So the president is trying to express to everyone his, I mean, sincere, um, uh, the torment that he's going through. Because he called me, immediately he heard the news. He called me to ask whether it is true. And I told him that, yes, but uh, the news out there is that he is he has been found so that is all we are all basing our hopes on and seeking the face of the most high god to preserve him because we had no knowledge about where exactly he was so when the news came out that my brother and friend and co-footballer had passed on Immediately, the president called me to inquire if it is true. And not being able to affirm what the news is saying, if I don't get it from the right source, I will not. So I had to call the GFA, and the GFA told me that, yes, indeed, that is the formation they have. So from there, I related the, relayed the message to him, and he decided to send this uh, delegation to just come and express his condolences to the whole family. And uh, at the appropriate time, he himself will come. So I'll continue what he has written. I would like to express my deepest condolences and sincere sympathy to the bereaved family and to his friends everywhere for this irreplaceable loss. President Dr. George Manning, we are in the land the work here. Dr. George Manning, we are President of the Republic of Liberia. May his soul rest in perfect peace. And um, this is an envelope too from him of uh, 10,000 US dollars to be given to the bereaved. And he has written it under to the late Christian Achu bereaved family from President George M. Weir, uh, President of the Republic of Liberia. So 
I give this all to the family. Presentation. No, the brother. I will say this again. <laughs> My immediate predecessor, the Right Honorable Professor Aaron Mike Okui, who took over as a Speaker of Parliament on the 7th of January 2017, and who surprisingly, miraculously, has succeeded on the 7th of January 2021, after on the 4th of January, on the 4th of January 2021, I had gone to bid him goodbye. And he gave me his blessings, and I told him I was going to establish my Institute of Parliamentary Studies, and I'll be inviting him to support me. Later, did I know that I was to supplant him. just three days after our conversation. He actually taught us, he lectured us in the second parliament as part of civil society at many of our workshops coming from Legon. You know he headed the Department of Political Science and he used to be a consultant to the Institute of Economic Affairs. Those days, there were not many uh, think tanks. Uh, the CDD joined later, which was called then, uh, it was not uh, um, CDD, it was a Commission on Democracy and Development. Now is Commission for Democratic Center, sorry, Center for Democratic Development. So he did a lot to groom the early beds of the Fourth Republic. That is my lecturer, my teacher, my former speaker, Right Honorable Professor Aaron Michael Kui, who is now having a chair at the Institute of Economic Affairs, continuing with his writing, publications, and his tutorship. Prof, congratulations. <laughs> Thing again is coming from my left. <laughs> it's very painful. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, Ayawaso has been my, my Waterloo. It's something that in the performance of the duty of the state, an individual has been unjustifiably held liable for something that that individual knows nothing about. I have perused the 500-page report of the Ayawaso West Wagon Commission, more than 500 pages. And my name was not mentioned anywhere in the report as having done anything. In fact, if you look at the findings and I have a copy, an abridged version of the findings here. If you look at the findings of the, of the report, Mr. Chairman, except for 
um, chapter three, findings and recommendations. Bullet point one, seven. The chairman for the record I want to read. In this regard, the commission finds that these persons were deployed. These persons here means the SWAT team were deployed and commanded by a police officer named DSP Samuel Azugu under the authority of the Director of Operations of the National Security Secretariat. It continues to say that, and with the ultimate responsibility of the Minister of State for National Security. Honorable Chairman, I'm not too sure what the Minister of State for National Security is doing here in these findings. Because there's no evidence was adduced in the committee to suggest that the Minister of State for the Ministry of National Security was in fact the authority under which the SWAT people for, I'm talking about the functional organogram of the Ministry of National Security. There's no evidence to suggest so, that I was responsible for the SWAT team at the Ministry of National Security. So if a finding is made that the people were sent to Ayawaso under the command of a police officer, and the police officer was under the command of um, a director of operations, and the director of operations is under the command of the Minister of State of National Security, and the Minister of State of National Security is under the command of the Minister of National Security, and the Minister of National Security is under the command of the President, and so on and so forth. Where does it end? And why would they come and end it at my doorstep? Not being part of the operation, not being part of the command on that day, to come and, and, and place a finding that and the Minister of State must have ultimate responsibility. No evidence was given to that. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if you look at the recommendations that were made, it frightens me. Of course, the Commission did not recommend, notwithstanding the issue of facts that I have against it, they did not recommend my prosecution because there was no facts to support that. But they placed an individual liability on me. And the individual liability is born out of the fact that, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and I read, the commission recommends that Mr. Brian Champon be reprimanded for his ultimate responsibility as minister in authorizing an operation of that character on a day of an election in a built-up area. Mr. Chairman, even in the unlikely event that I was a minister of state and authorized that operation, what I am being asked to be reprimanded for is on a crime. Of my interest is not the speculation. Did you authorize that operation? Mr. Chairman, I did not authorize that operation, and that is why it was easy for the white paper to say that they reject the recommendation because it is without basis. But I must add that the Ayawaso incident is a blot on our democracy. I pray that it doesn't happen again. I, I sympathize with those who are wounded on that day. Indeed, when I was there at the Ministry of National Security, I ensured that all those who were wounded uh, were treated at the 37 military uh, hospital and all expenses to, uh, of such were paid by the state um, that authorized the operation. Um, Subsequent to that, Mr. Chairman, laws have been passed by this House, and today we no longer hear about uh, vigilantism the way we used to hear about it in the past. It was unfortunate it happened, 
It should never have happened, but be that it may, um, it's passed and gone. But where the liability is being placed is where I think it's misplaced. <laughs>
Hello and welcome to Business Moment on Ghana Web TV. My name is Na Oyokote. Today we'll be talking about the real estate business here in Ghana. Don't go away, I'll be right back. Welcome back. I am at the Greens Estate here in Tema Community 25, and I'll be speaking to the Chief Executive Officer of this beautiful estate. Her name is Kiran Daswani. Daswani, I hope I got the name right. Yes, you did. Hello, Kiran. Welcome to Business Moment. Hello, how are you? I'm Thank very you well. for coming to visit us and join us here at the Greens today. Thank you for having us as well. How long have you been in Ghana? So I moved to Ghana in 2014. Okay. And I started a company called uh, Alubond West Africa, mm -hmm. where we used to cater to the construction uh, industry. We used to do facades, so uh, glazing, curtain wall, cladding. Um, company from Dubai called uh, Mul Holdings. Mm -hmm. So that's how mm -hmm. I came to Ghana in 2014. Oh, okay. Yes. So I see you've been in Ghana for like, should I say, almost 10 years now. So I'm sure you might have had some favorite food of yours. What was your favorite Ghanaian food? Jollof, Wache, Kinke, which is which? which one? I love Wache. Okay. I like Jollof. And I, my favorite is light soup. Oh, wow. I don't that's know nice. if that's a, 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 a typical favorite, <laughs> but my favorite <laughs> is, yes, oh, I that's like nice. good light soup. Oh, wow. Yes. That's nice. That's, yeah. that's really nice. Spicy and all little spicy okay <laughs> all right so then we are delving straight to business we want to talk about um the greens estate what is the greens estate and what do you do so we actually uh founded the company in 2017 uh we came across a parcel of land um that we acquired and uh, luckily we had no issues with the registration the title uh, which sometimes uh, happens to be a problem here in ghana mm. Um, then an architect, when I actually first bought the land, um, we didn't really know what to do. Um, so it was getting the architect and uh, he actually had a vision. Um, so we had that as an option. We had reselling the land as an option. And we also had doing uh, service plots as an option. Okay. Right, because we were like, okay, this is not our re our, our trade. Mm -hmm. So we start. We had three options, and we were very convinced with actually um, the architect's overview of what the estate could look like. Okay, which was what you have visited today. Oh, wow. So, so the plan was not to essentially start an estate. No, just wanted to acquire property yes. in, in Ghana. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. We had. I uh, had. Uh, we just thought, okay, real estate whether it's land or finished product, it's always a great investment because I do believe that uh, real estate is tangible. So it's a real asset that you can actually see. Mm -hmm. um, so we just bought the land and then from there we have come quite far actually. Oh, okay. That, that's, that's nice. So prior to starting, I mean, as I getting the advice from the architect about starting a real estate, um, do you dream of having um, such a big space or um, over 100 homes or units? Not at all. Okay. And I remember um, an architect in Dubai actually said to me, once you start being a developer, you will never stop. Okay. So it's like you will never look back. And I was like, okay, that, that's stuck here. And the, where we are right now, we've acquired another parcel of land right next to here, another uh, almost six acres, okay. where we'll be building another 75 homes. And we are also doing a joint venture with um, ANC, ANC Mall. Mm -hmm. uh, they are developing um, ANC Village uh, in OEB. So there we're also going to be uh, building a residential complex okay. within the uh, ANC Village. Okay. Um, yeah, so from my research, I, I realized 
you guys have a good taste when it comes to housing. I mean, the features are quite unique and all. What, what went into that thinking or that, um, the building, you know? So definitely um, design, uh, the architect has had the eye. And uh, of course, I think um, we also appreciate aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do believe that you don't necessarily have to spend um, extremes amount of money to have something looking good. Mm -hmm. So we do consider ourselves in the middle income bracket. Okay. So people mainly from the diaspora are our um, preferential buyers and then professionals, doctors, people in the oil business, like people working for these companies. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Did you face any challenges while starting up? Um, a lot of people asked me, like, how have you actually succeeded being in such a male-dominating industry? Mm -hmm. But I have been very lucky um, that I've been treated very well by, you know, the Greta organization, the Ghana real estate um, banks, um, clients. It's, it's been quite smooth. Okay. Um, and I've had a great team also. I mean, it's not just... Yes. Kudos to the team oh, as yes, well. Yes, Very yes, important. Yes, you should yes. always have um, the right team for yes. your business to yes. help it spread and yes. grow to reach this level. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I see you have quite a number of amenities. Um, there's, there's the pool area, there's the bar area, there's the a playground for children. What went into that? So again, I think um, coming from uh, Dubai, like I'm originally Indian, but I am born and brought up in Spain and I've been living in Dubai for the past 15 years also. Okay. So my husband lives in Dubai uh, and I am between Dubai and here. And I've always uh, appreciated seeing, you know, uh, gated communities where you have the amenities. Mm -hmm. So you don't have, especially for children, uh, when they come home after school, they don't have to commute to go for swimming classes mm -hmm. or tennis classes or you know just hang out in with your community um, neighbors friends it's just safe mm. so that that's why i think we also think that it's it's more a lifestyle than just amenities it's like people that come here look to have a better lifestyle oh, okay so meaning there's there's something for everyone yes whether mother father yes. children yes there's something for everyone yes. okay yes, yes, so yes. I, I i want to find out what what makes you different from other, I mean, your company, the Greens Estate, what makes it different from other real estate companies? So one thing that uh, we really pride ourselves in is that we actually do our construction in-house. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I always think that it is one of our unique uh, advantages. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, developers um, contract or subcontract the construction to a construction company and construction it is like a very very difficult industry to actually know what has gone into the construction mm -hmm. like if we look at the wall you mm -hmm. don't know how much what's the iron rods that are inside the steel you don't know how yeah. many coats of paint mm -hmm. so there's a lot of you can't really measure construction So for us, we do our construction in-house, and I think that gives us an edge in controlling our quality and what we actually deliver to our clients. Okay. I want to delve just a little bit personal. Have you always been interested in the real estate business? I have. Okay. I have always admired growing up um, people that would get passive income, like uh, 
I would be like, okay, so this gentleman, you know, he's collecting X amount of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. or euros when we were in Spain. Uh, it wasn't his main business, but it would be like his passive income. He had invested in real estate. He was like older at that time mm -hmm. and he could just sit and just get that income. So I've always, uh, I've always um, uh, looked up to investment in real estate. Oh, okay. And again, like I said earlier, the fact that it, it is a tangible asset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what's your clientele base? Uh, mainly uh, your diaspora. Targets? Okay. From the USA, from the UK. We've got some clients that have come from actually even Ghanaians from Japan, oh. from Israel, Canada. Okay. Mainly, I would say 80% of our clientele is from the diaspora. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. So, I still on clientele base, um, you already have um, already made units and you spoke about um, acquiring another land. So, what if I'm your client and I do not want the house but I want a land? Is, that, is there an option like that? No, no, okay. because uh, as a gated community, also, we believe that you know, we, we do want to protect your investment. Mm -hmm. And I think having the, uh, you, let's say like um, units that will be easy for you to resell in case of mm -hmm. wanting to resell, it would be mm -hmm. easier when it's all um, properties that are standard, not different colors, different uh, styles, different designs. So that's why we don't we don't sell land. Okay. No. Okay. All right. You you spoke about style. I saw. I see the houses are almost in the same style. What what inspired that? Colors, mm. style. Yes. 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 So the architect. Okay. The architect. So an advice based on the architect. Yes. Yes. So okay. he's the he's the the let's say the the master behind the designs that you see the okay. colors you know mm -hmm. oh all right okay so it's 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 been nice having you kiran daswani thank you so much for thank joining you. us on thank you um business moments on ghana well, thank you for sharing your business with us telling us how what you what you put into it and 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 everything that's thank got you. to do with your business thank, thank you, you so, so much for coming thank you when we return, we take a tour of the Greens Estate. Stay tuned. Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. Well, this is the part where we take a tour of the facility. I believe you've been enjoying the interesting conversation so far, but we are going to check out what the Greens Estate Company has for us so you would decide on the kind of house you want. I have with me here the project manager of the Greens Estate Company. He is Prince Nyako. Hello, Prince Nyako. Welcome to Business Moments on Ghana West. Thank you. Thank you. Thank right. you. Welcome to the Greens. Thank you. And what do you have for us? Take us on a tour. Well, we have a lot, a lot to offer. And uh, I think once we go on the tour, you should see what we have to offer. All right. So, so come with us. He has a lot to offer. Yeah. Let's go. Okay. Okay, so um, I've noticed something interesting when I entered. I realized the street names are named according to, I mean, the streets are named, named according to flowers. I see marigold, I saw tulip over there. Yes. Is there any inspiration behind it? Well, the, the, the vision of the greens was to, I mean, as the name suggests, the greens. Mm -hmm. um, we are trying to project nature and give a refined living experience to our clients. And so that is the reason why we have named our streets also after nature so we okay. have the palm street and as you can see 
you have palm trees all labeled here you have the tulip marigold and all that so basically that is that is the vision here oh, okay okay that's interesting and i read your profile and I, one of the things i saw was that building affordable houses how affordable <laughs> is the greens to the average Ghanaian? well um well, people may say that affordability is relative. Okay. But what we have done here at the Greens is to give you quality for not to also break the bank. Okay. And that is what we've tried to do. And mm -hmm. so we have houses ranging from one bed to five bedroom. Okay. And as much as possible, we try and control the cost by making sure that we do our own construction. We source materials from very competitive sources to be able to also beat down the prices for our, our, our clients. And so as we go along, you learn about the prices we have. Okay, clients. sure. And so whilst we are sourcing your materials, do you do local or international? Basically, we do local. I mean, the, vi the vision of uh, our CEO is also that we want to get a community involved. Mm -hmm. And so we have a lot of workers here. Um, who are Ghanaians, indigenous people, and then as much as possible, we source our materials also from here in okay. Ghana. Yes. Okay, okay. I think that's beautiful. At least there's, there's some sort of employment for our local people exactly. here exactly. in Ghana. Exactly. And I've also noticed one thing that's um, you, ha you are using particular colors. Yeah. I see um, ash, I see white, and that color is it light Taracota. burgundy? Terracotta. Okay. Exactly. okay. Is there a reason? Well, I mean, we have a professional architect who does all our designs, and so the concept is to make sure that we, we have uniformity and also not to have colors that are too, you know, uh, pungent on the eyes. Exactly. Okay. So we have white, which gives you a brighter of the environment. I mean, we have gray, which is also like a bit of a shade of um, not too deep a, a gray. Okay. But so it, it just, you know, blends in, it gives you a very bright, you know, um, community. Okay, okay. Yeah. So as the project manager, what are some of the amenities um, house owners get to enjoy? Okay, so maybe I'll take you there. By in here, we have a swimming pool, a community swimming pool. Mm -hmm. We have a gymnasium. Okay. We have um, a multi-purpose court. Mm -hmm. And then we also have playgrounds, as you can see from behind me. We are yet to finish okay. though, but we have some of these dotted all around, so you don't have your kids go outside to go and play. So we have some things like this for our kids to be able to also play. And then for the adult, we have um, a rooftop bar. Okay. We'll go and see that. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. It's, okay. it's really beautiful. How, how much went into all these? Okay. What, what plants went into putting okay. these edifices? Okay. So where we started from is where we actually started in 2017. Okay. So that was our first phase. So we have um, some two beds, three beds, and then two bed terraces. Okay. Okay, so that's ended the first phase. And then we have the second phase, which started from um, just opposite to the first phase, all okay. the way to house 57, just in ahead of us. Okay. So that also comprises some two beds, three beds, basically. Yes. And so um, we have a mix of everything, two beds, three beds for, for, for our phases, one, two, phase three. And then on the way, we have some one bed as well. I'll show you that as well. Okay. Very beautiful. Okay. Um, in terms of space, you know, yeah. a lot of, some of us like our spaces. We like big spaces. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed some of these real estate um, um, companies have quite smaller spaces. How, how big is your space? Well, um, it's quite sizable. Um, we have actually optimized the spaces we have. And so as you can see on my left, this is a typical four bedroom which is part of our, you know, um, th phase three. Mm -hmm. um, you have your parking to your left here. Mm -hmm. um, you have the building there. You can go all around the building. Oh, okay. um, you have also some greenery to your left as well. And so, I mean, we have really optimized the space. Definitely, um, it is really um, a design for a family. I mean, yes. Yeah, and for this particular house, I could see your your client understood the concept because I can see more greens actually it, it is, in it, the house, it is, and it yes. makes it more more exactly. beautiful. Exactly. Okay. So as you can see, I mean, he's done a lot of you know additions to it. Mm -hmm. um, we have spaces for families to uh, sit around for, yeah. for families. Um, we have a lot of greenery around there, so there's a lot of space for families to be able to sit around and enjoy enjoy the, the facility. Okay. Um, I see quite a number of units around me. How many in total do we have? Okay. So in total, we're doing um, a community of about 108 houses. 
308,000 as we speak. We are on the last phase of it. Uh, we just have just about six buildings to go. So those of you who want to be uh, part of this community, you better run. You have to we rush, rush, rush while the deal rush. is still hot. Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. Okay, that's nice. That's nice. So we are going to. You're heading towards the phase three. The phase I want three. to first okay. show you the recreational area, okay. so you appreciate what you know the, first, the entire community also okay. comes with. So when you talk about the recreational area, yeah. is it just one particular spot? Because you showed me one particular one. Is okay. is that the only place no, for yeah. the unit? No. So okay. that is a playground for kids. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then we have an additional space where you have an open top bar. Mm -hmm. You have the gym. And then you have also a multi purpose hall and a swimming pool. Okay. So that is where I'm taking you to now. All right, so this is a recreational <coughs> space. And like I said, I actually thought it was a unit, a housing unit, but it okay. really looks spacious. There's a pool, I yes. think there's a tennis court. That's courts. a bar you spoke about there's up a bar, there. Exactly. Okay. I'll take you there to look at it. All right, um, sure. Very beautiful. Okay. But let me not also, um, let me not catch you, but we also have apartment, one bed apartment here, a three bed apartment as well. So those of you who are looking to do in some investment okay. can consider a one bed apartment here That's fine. for Airbnb. I mean, it will give Airbnb, you very good yes, I was going to ask if exactly, you yes. do Airbnb. Exactly. Okay, so take yeah. us around okay. and let's see what you've got. Yes, so okay. here is a community pool. As you can see, it's all done, mm -hmm. uh, ready for swim. Um, I don't know whether you brought in your costume. You got, you got <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then we have the multi-purpose court co here. So that's okay. for long tennis. You can do basketball as well, oh, okay. and even volley. How deep is the pool? Um, we have the deepest side is about one point three feet. Okay. And then we have um, very very shallow. Even for babies, you can sit on the staircases to your right. Okay. Yes. But is this enough for the 108? Oh yes. I mean, units. this is about 15 by 8 meter pool, so okay. quite you know okay. very big. It's quite big. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, so the gym is not finished yet, mm -hmm. but that is where the gym is. Okay. Um, so we have about 80, um, 162 square meters of mm -hmm. gym space with washrooms, yeah. male and female with lockers. Okay. Yes, it's not finished yet. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I see. And that. then. Up here is our open, I mean, rooftop bar. Okay. Maybe I can also take you there so to look at it. So, before we go to the rooftop yes. bar, let's have a look at the one bedroom. Okay. Apartment or unit. So, you have so two of these, right? We have two units of these. Okay. These are not completed yet. Okay. They're not completed yet, so. Oh, mm. we, well, we can just have a fair a idea, fair idea yeah, of what it is. Of okay. how right. it actually oh. looks. Okay. Oh, I, I see some of the cabinets exactly, already. Exactly. So yeah. it comes with an open kitchen. It's an open kitchen concept with the, an island. Okay. And then you have the sitting area. Sitting area here. Okay. You have a bedroom to your left. Mm. Yes. So you have closet space. Okay. You have a closet space here. That is the washroom. Oh, wow. That's, yes. that, the washroom is even spacious. Exactly. And the then bedroom the bedroom is quite, here. Yeah. Exactly. A total of about 95 square meters. Okay. So how much is something like this? That something like this cost? Yes. So this is going for a cool 109,000. 109,000 dollars. 109,000 dollars. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So that's the staircase. That's the staircase leading up. Moving. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So how, how was it for you handling this huge project? I mean, how, how did you well, feel from the on start and to where you've gotten to? Well, I mean, for me, it's been an experience. Um, my background is actually in quantity surveying. Okay. Exactly, yeah. And um, veering into project management has not been too difficult because our training really allows us to do that. Okay. And so we started off in 2017. Um, as you can see here, we are building our last gate. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's, it's been a beautiful experience for me, a learning experience, and uh, um, we we thank God for it, for how far He's brought us. Well done, yes. actually. Thank so, you. tell us thank about you. the space. Okay, so this is about 252 square meters of space. Okay. Um, you have a pergola here for if you want to sit under a sheet, mm -hmm. and then we have um, a bar. Okay, so this is where the bar will be. This is where the bar okay. is going to be. So we have also a kitchen as well, mm -hmm. a kitchen in there. 
Then you have washrooms. Okay. Um, you have about four slots of washrooms in there for visitors. Okay. Um, it gives you a very beautiful view, as you can see yes, from yes, here. Yes, yes, actually. Up here. So you can even yeah. watch your kids. Exactly, play from, from here. here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, you can okay. watch your kids play from here. Okay. Yes. Is it, is it open to outsiders or just yes. homeowners here? Yes. So what we're trying to do is to be able to manage the influx of people from outside. And so we have an external gate that brings people from outside to come and enjoy the space while not disturbing the community. So the, you, as you can see, the whole recreational area is fenced. Yeah. So you're going to have a biometric you know, access system oh, from okay. outside into the estate. So once you're a member here, you can just access and come in here without necessarily going through the estate. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Talking about fencing and all that, we'd yeah. like to talk about security. Yes. How secured is the place? Extremely secured. I mean, we have a 24-hour security. It's, as you can see, you saw there, it's manned. Um, we have a second gate here as well, which is also going to be manned. Okay. And as much as possible, we try to incorporate other things to enhance the security. So the perimeter fence wall is actually electrified. I mean, we have electrocuted ones. Um, and then we also added on CCTV cameras into the estate and all that. And so just to enhance the, okay. uh, yeah, the security of the estate. All the street lights are solar, solar powered. So okay. that when there's blackout, you still have, you know, oh, some that's, light. That's good. Yes. That's, that's a fair deal. Yes, exactly. I yeah. mean, um, aside, aside this space you have, yeah. um, is that Green's planning to move on to another space? Because I, remembered, I remember you told me this is your final unit or your exactly. final gate exactly. you're constructing. Yes. So definitely, yes. I mean, we are in this for the long haul. So as we can, um, just right behind these properties, yeah. uh, we have a land there which is starting very soon. And I mean very, very soon. So those who want to book their units um, should talk into us. We have um, another one probably coming up in OEB mm -hmm. as well. So, I mean, uh, we have other developments coming up. Okay. Yes. Let's, let's go back to the final phase okay. of um, the whole project. Yes. How long is it going to take to complete the final so we actually looking at that. How yeah. So as that? Our, ta our tagline goes, refined living. Mm -hmm. What we try to do is to keep a very safe environment for kids and also give a very hygienic you know, environment for our, our inhabitants. So what okay. we've done here is that we have an underground drainage system, as you can see here. It also serves as a walkway. Okay. So all our drainages are underground. Mm -hmm. And then, as I indicated to you last, with all our street lights are also solar powered. Exactly. So when there's blackout, the homes can have lights because they all have 1.5 kV solar panel, solar inverters, mm -hmm. and then the street lights are also lit because of the solar solar lighting. Okay, so yeah. meaning you're working the talk of being an eco-friendly exactly. estate exactly. company. Exactly. Okay, that's exactly. amazing. So we are moving to um, a show house. Yeah. Um, Prince here is going to show us what exactly a house at the greens look like. So come along and let's show you what's up. Okay, so this, this is a typical entrance. Yes, so okay. this is our three bedroom, um, okay. known as the cedar. As I told you, all our houses are named after, you know, nature. So a cedar mm -hmm. is a form of a tree. Okay. Exactly. So this is our three bedroom. All right. Yes. Oh. So Should I call this a grand entrance? Exactly. <laughs> what we have done is to give you a very big, you know, it's our 1.3 meter door. Okay. It's quite very wide. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so where, where are we starting from? The so wall? Let's go to the living area. Okay. Yes. So very beautiful, I guess. Yes, I, I see. Exactly. Neutral colors. Well, exactly. that's my kind of, yeah, yeah furnishing. A lot, of, and a lot of people like this, paintings. these colors. Exactly. Yes. So what we have done, I mean, to your left here, you see a very big sliding door. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we have one to your right. Okay. Exactly. So um, that is what we call, I mean, it gives you um, cross ventilation. So you don't always need to have your ACs on. You can just, you know, shift one door here, slide another one here. You have a mosquito net in here, so you can just slide. And then you enjoy the fresh air. Okay. It also gives you a lot of lighting. Um, mm -hmm. Um, into the house so you don't have to always put on your artificial lighting so yeah i see a lot of modern yes. decorations yes. i mean with regards to the the, the ceilings lighting. the lightnings exactly. yeah. the tiles you know i was i was looking at something on, on facebook actually okay. and you know people were teasing landlords or complaining about landlords that they use a lot of brown and you know those multicolored kind of tiles but i see yes. this is quite different exactly. for their building so simplicity yeah. they say you know it's, it's the way to go yeah. okay 
So does the client have an option to have a furnished house? Oh, most definitely. I mean, for, we are very open. Okay. We are very open. So if you want us to furnish for you, we can also do that for you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes. Okay, sure. Yeah. All right. So the TV sits yeah, here TV, exactly. and then the couch. The couch, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we go upstairs? Yeah, we can. Let me sure. show you the kitchen. Um, okay, you but want to enjoy my sofa? Yes, I do. Oh. I do. It actually looks cozy. <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, yeah. wow. You could sleep here, take a nap, oh, even yeah. spend the night here. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. it's a very And I think it's space. even spacious for family gatherings. Exactly. And all. Exactly. Okay, so a space like that. What was the space? So the this is about um, 30 square meters here. Okay. For the dining and then the living area. Yeah. All right. Mm. That's nice. Let's, let's <laughs> move on to the next. I can't wait to see what you have in store. Oh, okay. So okay. let me show you what we have here on the ground floor. Okay. So we have a guest washroom to your left. This yeah? is it? Yes. Okay. I have a guest washroom here. Oh, okay. Very beautiful. Well, well, this is what some people call the powder room, I guess. Yes, the powder room, exactly. Okay. Yes. All right, let me yes. see. Let me take, have a look at it. Yes. Very okay, spacious. it's quite spacious, Very not spacious. really small. Yes. You know, the, the door is deceptive. It looks exactly. quite tiny, yes. so yeah. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So next, yes. I see the yeah, kitchen. the kitchen. Okay. So we finished the kitchen for you. Um, mm -hmm. We give you an instructor. It comes with the, um, the gas. Oh. Wow. Exactly, yes. So and these are the storage these spaces? These are the storage spaces, yes. Okay. Quite, quite spacious. Yes. And to your left, you have a storeroom. Okay. Yeah, you have a storeroom here. Mm -hmm. um, that houses your um, washing machine. Oh. And then the solar inverter is also kept in here. Oh, okay. If you want us to do some additions for you in terms of shelves, that can also be done. So okay, so th walls. there's an option for renovation. Oh yeah, I mean additions. That okay, we okay, have additions. Have for additions. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. Okay, so where does this door lead this to? This actually takes you to the back here. Okay, but let's, let's finish with the top. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. okay. So I see the same towels you use for the hall is yes, where you are the using. Same. We carry the same towels through. Throughout every space. Throughout the space. Yes. Oh, exactly. okay. Yes. All right. Spaces. How safe is this? Very the safe. Glass it's actually very safe. This is about ten mm thick glass. Okay. Ten mm thick glass is very. Quite tight, and then we also have the option of you know metal hand railing. Okay. So whichever one you, you, you choose, okay. I mean, we can do that right. for you. Sure. So here is a master bath uh, bedroom. Oh. So this is a master bedroom. Oh. Yeah. This is a master bedroom. This is lovely. Yes. This is a master bedroom. Oh, it has built-in wardrobe. Exactly. Yes. Oh, or well, closet. Yeah. Okay. That's a queen size bed. Yes. Oh wow. And then. You have the washroom to your right. Okay. Also quite spacious. Mm. And then we give you a balcony here. Okay. Oh. So you can enjoy. This one there, face me, I face you. <laughs> <laughs> you can oh, that's nice. It's quite airy here. Very. Yeah. Very airy. Yeah. It's quite airy. Very airy. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. So the, the, the washroom. Yeah, that's the washroom. Yes. Okay. 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 All right. So we move on to the next room. Yes. Yeah, so we have two other bedrooms, all in suits. Okay. So one to your right here. Okay. Oh. Yes. This is quite smaller. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's a bit yeah. Smaller. Okay. Yes. Oh, another built-in closet. Exactly. All the rooms comes with that. Okay, the last so that, that's bedroom. the last bedroom. That's the last bedroom. Yeah. Okay. I see two beds. Yes. So for ki like a kid's room, kids right? Room, Children's exactly. room. Yes. Oh. But oh, well, I didn't feel all the beds. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's a clean space. Yeah. Oh, okay. So like, let's talk about the units. Yes. How is, it, how is the units, or how are the units like? Two bedroom, one bedroom, three bedroom. Yes, so we start from one bed. Okay. Um, as I showed you at the recreational area. Yeah. And then two beds. We also have three beds. We have um, some um, variety in the three beds. We have the cedar. Mm. Um, we have another unit, another three bedroom known as the oak. As okay. well, those are under construction. Um, and then we have the four bedroom known as the, the cypress. Okay. Yes. All right. So, um, okay. This is the parking lot. 
Oh. The parking so lot. how many cars can fit? You can fit two cars actually. Okay. Two SUVs can even fit here. Oh. Yeah. Okay. It looks it looks yeah. small. It's a three point five. Okay. The average car size weight is about 2.5, mm. so you still have space to move around. Okay. Yeah. And the payment plan? Yes. Yes. How, how is it like um, if I want to purchase? Yes. And As I indicated, I mean, we are very open. Um, okay. We, we have um, self-financing mm -hmm. where we give clients up to, say, one year. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, we also have asset mortgage. Exactly. Um, and then when you're doing self-finance, as I indicated, I mean, within a period of, say, six to one year, okay. I mean, we can, we can consider that. Yeah. Okay. So does that mean um, you make a lump sum in the first month? Yes. So what we'll What's do is... What's the percentage? That, okay, so what we'll do is that you do a 30%, between okay. 30 and 40% down payment, and then the rest, if you're doing self-finance, is spread for you between six and one year. Mm -hmm. And then if you're doing a mortgage, depending on your income, and your commitments, um, the bank can look at 80, say 80%, and you do a down payment of 20%. Okay. The bank disperses the 80% when you have made your payments, and when the house is also completed, the bank does, um, they do the payments of the 80% for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's and quite for, flexible. And for Ghanaians, I think you can get between 5 to 15 years on your mortgage in terms of mm. payback period, yeah. Mm. So for how many homeowners do you have? Out um, of the 108? Living here? Yes, living oh, here. In and out, we have almost about, say, 30. Oh. And we have clients who live abroad, so they come in and go. Uh -huh. mm. And then we still have some residents also in there. Yeah. Okay. And, and finally, what, what sets you apart? So we are this is still yeah, the backyard. This is the backyard, okay. yes. I think we should, we should give I mean, a full tour uh, yes, of I mean. the, the house. So one thing I need to mention is the, side, the, the, the cedar. Okay. It also comes with an out room, yeah. This is an out room. room. What's, exactly. it, what's it for? So if you have a house help, you can put a single, oh, okay. yeah, single um, this is student bed can fit in here because mm. it has its own washroom. Oh, it has a washroom. Exactly. Okay. If you want to also say set up an office space, you can also okay. hide away from the kids. All right, all right. Yeah. Okay. That's nice. Oh, okay. that's fine. Yeah. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. So finally, whilst we are moving, or we are moving out of the house, what, what, what differentiates uh, the greens from other real estate companies? Well, w what I would say is that we control a lot of the things we do. Mm. And so, um, in terms of quality, okay. in terms of quality, we can really assure our clients that we are giving you quality and value for your money. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of payment terms, we are very flexible. Um, it, the construction, the construction itself, I mean, some estate developers are averse to taking people around to see the start of the construction mm -hmm. but we are very open we wish that people come here to see the construction right from the onset i mean the the, the convention here is that people use blocks in the foundation but we yeah. use so i mean concrete solely for the foundation from foundation all up we use concrete for the foundation i mean the block we do, we produce it ourselves to just to satisfy ourselves that we are giving you quality and then our materials are carefully sourced, I mean, from the right sources. It's not like we want to cut corners. No, we don't do that. So that is what actually set us apart from others. Okay, but I want to take you back just slightly yeah. um, about the housing units. Yeah. What's the range from the lowest to the highest? Okay, so our pricing, as I indicated earlier, start from 110000 to 262000 Okay, yeah. all right. Thank you very much, Prince Thank you Nako, for, 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 for joining us on Business Moment. It's, it's been lovely having you take us on a tour to your project and as well as uh, a showroom house. Thank, Thank you very much. We've come to the end of another interesting conversation on Business Moments on Ghana Web TV. Our guest was the Greens Estate. If you are interested in owning a one-bedroom, two-bedroom, three, or even four, the right place to go is the Greens Estate here in Tema Community 25. Also, if you're a business owner and you're interested in being featured on Business Moments on Ghana Web TV, see the numbers below and give us a call. Log on to www.ghanaweb.com for more news stories. Get interactive with us on all our social media handles. We are at the Ghana Web on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos. My name is Na Oyokoti. Thanks for watching.
Money back home from UK, Canada, and now US. I am subtle. I get instant charges. I still wait in this year. I get unbeatable. We should be promo code Dr. Like it. Nigga, ten pound, ten dollars, and now ten Canadian dollars. The first transaction. What is send this guy a coffee? No, download the Lemonade Finance. pathway for responsible and sustainable small-scale mining with community ownership and we have developed an operational manual setting standards and guidelines which all community mining schemes must meet and or comply to ensure that they operate in a safe and healthy environment and that their operations are sustainable and environmentally sound. Mr. Speaker, two small-scale mining license, licenses have been granted for community mining scheme in the Bole Bamboy district. These two licenses, which cover an, an area located in Tenga, were granted to the Kulpe Kamara Mining Group, led by Mr. Abuse Aseidu, and the Kulpe Small Scale Mining Group, led by Seidu Shaibu. Both licenses, granted in 2020, are valid for five years and will expire in 2025. The Minerals Commission constantly monitors their operations to ensure that they are in line with the Community Mining Operational Manual. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the House the government is committed to a viable, sustainable, responsible, and environmentally sound small-scale mining that contributes meaningfully to our national economy. And the Ministry will continue to work with all stakeholders to promote this to realize the vision of the president to make Ghana the mining hub of Africa. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member, any supplementary question? Mr. Speaker, in paragraph 3 of the Minister's answer, he mentioned two licenses that have been granted. He went further to state the community, and for that matter, the area, in this case, Tenga. He also mentioned the lead people, Abu Aseidu, is an uncle, and Seidu Shaibu is a cousin. These two people live in the Kupe, far from Tinga, and so the two lances that he's mentioned cannot be located in Tinga. Would the minister want to reconcile this? Thank you. I, I. You talked about one being uncle and one being a cousin to who? Uncle, uncle. to who? Cousin to who? Mr. Speaker, what I'm saying is that these two people I've mentioned, I know them very well. And I'm saying that they, they are my relations. And I'm saying that they are not at Tenga. Tenga is far, far away from... Simple, simple. The yes. yes, so you are saying that it's a cousin to you. Yes. And an uncle to you. Sure. But they live with you in your community. Yes. And that community is Dakrupe. Dakrupe. But... And I'm aware getting... that these two licenses are located at Dakrupe and not Tenga. By his answer, he's saying that they are at Tinga, and that's what I want him to reconcile. So, well, Minister. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, first of all, the records I have suggest that the district is Bole Bamboy District, not Bole District. 
for the records. Yes, yes, secondly, I'm, with the greatest respect to my senior colleague, I'm really trying to understand the um, contours of his question. But Mr. Speaker, this is a house of records, and I come before this house to provide the records as captured by the Minerals Commission. And the record the Minerals Commission is giving me is what I provided to this house. Which records are that there are two small-scale mining licenses granted in the Bole Bamboy district, which is a question, the substantive question the Honorable uh, Member uh, asked me. And those mining licenses are granted in favor of... even before I became a minister. So because finally, you, you, the, the, the mining concessions are located in Tinga by the records of the Minerals Commission, unless the Honorable Member has some uh, unimpeachable evidence to contradict what the Minerals Commission is providing. I have no reason to doubt the records of the Minerals Commission. You don't have to live in Tinga to own a mining concession in Tinga. You can live in Accra and own a mining concession in Tinga. So those who live in the area he talked about, they are more than capable of holding mining concessions in Tinga. Mr. Speaker, these are the records provided by the Minerals Commission, and these are the records I stand by. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member, these are community licenses. The names mentioned are just leaders of the community. The community is being described as group, which means not the whole community, a number of them forming a company, being led by one. The leader could be living in Accra. So I didn't get the import of your question. But first, Deputy Speaker, to take the chair now. Yes, honourable members, I'll move to question number 1512, in the name of the honourable member for Bolly Bamboy. Mr. Speaker, as the member of parliament for Bolly Bamboy, I do a lot of community visitations, and I'm reliably informed that there are two community mining uh, licenses granted to two associations in the Tinga area. And these are Tinga Wenji Wenji cooperatives, led by one Osman Sedu. And the other one is Tinga Mining Cooperative, also led by my good friend Alhaji Kwame Sapo. And these are located at Tinga. And then we have two separate ones, also located at Dakurpe. I want the minister to confirm whether or not these four cooperatives exist in their records or not. So that I know those who are doing illegal uh, mining and those who are legitimately registered and licensed. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I will respectfully um, ask my senior colleague to proceed with a bit of caution. So I you should proceed with caution because people apply for mining licenses, they are granted, they are captured in the records of the Minerals Commission, which is by law the repository of all mining records in our country, Mr. Speaker. And yet they go on the ground and they um, parade themselves with all kinds of names. And so you may find the mining operations is just referred to with the names is mentioned to be the case in terms of the banner and the rest are the mining operation. But when you come to the records of the Minerals Commission, you will find something different. But for our purposes, Mr. Speaker, what is of consequence is what is captured in the records of the Minerals Commission. Mr. Speaker, the other two mining operations he talks about, I have no reason to doubt him. If that is the case, 
him and I can reconcile the facts we have. And if they are found to be illegal small scale mining operations, we will deal with them. But the records I've given to this House are the records as captured by the Minerals Commission. And that is what I will stand by. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I don't doubt my good brother, whatever he has presented, like he said, will reconcile that. I also have my facts, so we'll reconcile that. My last question has to do with a mining activity and that, I mean, going on around Bamboy, Joboy area by some Chinese companies. Just last two weeks, I received so many calls. I want to find out from my brother, the minister responsible for lands and natural resources, whether he's aware of that operations and whether it is a community uh, mining scheme or otherwise. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm not aware. And uh, the Honorable Member for Bole Bamboy knows that whenever he brings these matters to my attention, we deal with them swiftly. So after um, my session in this house, I'll have a chat with him, and whatever we have to do, we'll do it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well, I'll move on. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Question number 1513, the name of Ronald Member for Tamale North. Alas, Yes. Thank you very much, right, Honorable Speaker. I rise to ask the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources how many hectares of plantation the Forestry Commission through the Youth Employment Agency has established across the country since its introduction. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Youth and Afforestation reforestation project as a component of the Youth Employment Agency was launched in 2018 to engage the youth to undertake forest restoration, management and protection interventions nationwide. Implementation of the project, which is a fully funded government initiative, commenced in April 2018 with the progressive engagement of 46,000 beneficiaries as at the end of December 2018. Currently, there are about 33,000 employees under the Youth in Afforestation Program, directly under the Forestry Commission. Mr. Speaker, since the introduction of the program, a total of 179,861.6 hectares of forest have been cultivated. The breakdown is contained in the table below, and I want hands out to capture same. Mr. Speaker, in addition to the above, the program has also produced a total of 24,554,485 seedlings to support various afforestation programs of government. Employees of this program have also, so far, undertaken maintenance of 21,734.1 hectares of established forest plantations. Some of them, some of them have also been involved in other forest management and protection activities, including forest reserve boundary cleaning and patrolling, fire protection, and stock surveys. So far, 1,200 of them have been involved in these forest protection measures. Mr. Speaker, these afforestation measures are being complemented by other initiatives such as the Green Ghana Day, the Green Street Project, the Forest Investment Program, the Cocoa and Forest Initiative, the National Alternative Employment and Livelihood Program, and the Ghana Landscape Restoration and Small Scale Mining Project. Mr. Speaker, the importance of trees to our survival and the sustenance of our planet cannot be emphasized. The government of President Akufuado remains fully committed to protecting the forest cover of our country, increasing our forest estate, and restoring degraded forest lands. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me commend the Minister for the detailed response provided. Mr. Speaker, when I look at the table that has been provided as part of the answer to the question, I see forest plantation, 2018, 6,685 hectares, 2019, 9,620 hectares. 
the speaker, 9,620 hectares translates to 23,722 acres. And Mr. Speaker, this means, given that a football field is 1.32 acres, that we are talking about a size of about 17,900 football fields. Will the minister be kind enough to point to locations of these plantations that are so large? Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the information the Honorable Member is asking for was not um, part of the question which was posed, the substantive question which was posed. Let's be if the... I gave him notice, he will provide the details, but you may ask another one. Mr. Speaker, it's curious that the minister gives us the uh, hectares, but does not seem to have the information of their location immediately available. Just ask another question. Okay, Mr. Speaker. As you wish, I will move to my next question. Mr. Speaker, I want to find out from the minister who states in his answer that currently there are about 33,000 employees under the program. How many unpaid allowances are owed to these workers? And why the burden of the debt is on the Forestry Commission and not the National Youth Employment Program, as he indicated? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so. Speaker, thank you very much. Speaker, just for the records, um, with the greatest respect to my friend, I don't have to have all these records off, off my fingertips, Mr. Speaker. This is a house of records. When the a member asks a question, you need to make sure that the records you provide are unimpeachable. So a diligent minister will have to seek the records from the relevant agencies. I can't give it off the top of my head. Mr. Speaker, the issue of the allowances of employees of... Um, youth in afforestation, Mr. Speaker, I must admit has been a major challenge. And the ministry is working hand in glass with the Ministry of Finance to be able to address the issue of arrears of beneficiaries under the youth in afforestation program. Mr. Speaker, and also to find a mechanism in the context of the current economic challenges we are going through to rationalize this program so that it becomes sustainable. Mr. Speaker, the um, number of months which is owed the employees of the youth in afforestation is quite substantial, but I don't have the exact number of months. If a substantive question is posed, Mr. Speaker, I'll provide that answer. Thank you. Yes. Mr. Speaker, again, I don't have an answer to the number of months and why the burden of the debts owed is on the Forestry Commission and not the Youth Employment Program. But I will, as you have directed, proceed to my next uh, question. The Speaker, in answer to the question on the table provided again, the Speaker, the Minister indicates to us that about 16,308 acres were cultivated as forest plantations in 2018 about 23,700 acres, that's uh, if you translate it into acres. And we don't know the locations yet, but there is a sharp drop in 2022 to 3,302 hectares. Yet there is no corresponding drop of workers under the program. Can the minister explain to us what accounts for the drop in the number of hectares cultivated when workers significantly have not dropped under the program? The number of workers significantly has not dropped under the program. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I sought to explain in my substantive answer, the youth in afforestation program employees, Mr. Speaker, are deployed for various purposes. And Mr. Speaker, you will recall and possibly take note uh, that when the Green Ghana Day was initiated, a lot of these youth in afforestation program employees were deployed to support that program, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, these various components are given, the breakdown, forest plantation, enrichment, planting, trees on farm. These are programs, Mr. Speaker, we get worn down as we move forward. And so if you have 2018 having 6,685.6 hectares, it is just because the program had just begun. And as we move forward, there is a lot more to do with maintenance, nurturing of the trees and the rest. And you will have the same number of employees, but deployed for different purposes, which I said, such as cultivating, nurturing the trees, and making sure that the tree grows. So, Mr. Speaker, when you have a reduction to 3,302, you shouldn't be surprised. It is just because the program moves in phases. That is the explanation for the drop. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Kole. Thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. Um, just seeking your leave to ask a supplementary question. Very well, yes. Thank you very much. Um, if I may ask, does the Minister have any aerial photographs of these areas that he's saying have been cultivated that he can share with the House? Aerial photographs of these areas that you're saying you have cultivated so we can actually see where they are and what the um, extent of the... Yes. The um, Thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm even more than happy to come here with the officials of the Forestry Commission to, to give a PowerPoint presentation and videos of these uh, plantations. Mr. Speaker, the Forestry Commission is a state agency, a creature of law, and I have no reason why they will provide this House with statistics or data which are uh, impeachable, Mr. Speaker, they will never do that. These are hectares which have been cultivated, they are verifiable, they are located in this country, and we can provide any information relating to these hectares. Yes, they are unprecedented, I appreciate that. This is a lot of uh, cultivation being done in such a short space of time. But these are, these are the facts, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Very well, I move on to question number 1570 in the name of the Honourable Member for Sisala West, Mr. Mohamed Adam Sapsu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to ask the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources what measures the Ministry is putting in place to prevent general encroachment of government lands. Thank you. Yes, Honourable Minister. Thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the issue of encroachment of public lands is widespread due to several years of inaction. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, in the case of Memuna Modi and Enchi, Justice Datiba had this to say about public lands. Compulsorily acquired land is constantly being encroached upon by private persons, and the practice is well known. The public authorities responsible for the lands in question often do not take the legal step necessary to evict the encroachers. End quote. The Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, in collaboration with the Lands Commission, the constitutional body responsible for the management of public lands, is taking every step necessary to move away from this situation. Currently, the Lands Commission is undertaking an inventory of public lands, including those that have been encroached upon, to ensure maximum protection of these lands. Mr. Speaker, Section 236 of the Land Act 2020, Act 1036, and join the Lands Commission or any agency for whose benefit land has been acquired to take the necessary steps to recover the land from encroachment. This includes using reasonable force to eject encroachers from the land and demolish any structure on the land. In accordance with this statutory provision, Mr. Speaker, the Lands Commission, in collaboration with the Ghana Police Service, has undertaken a number of operations to recover encroached public lands. The Commission is also working with the Ghana Police Service to provide protection for all public lands and prevent them from further encroachment. Through this collaboration, 
adequate logistics are being provided to the Ghana Police Service to undertake regular patrols and improve visibility on public lands to deter encroaches. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources has constituted a public lands protection team chaired by the Deputy Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Honorable Benito Usubio, to support the efforts of the Lands Commission and the Ghana Police Service in the protection of public lands. We are also engaging ministries, departments, and agencies, as well as metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies, to take steps to protect land acquired for their use, or which fall within the jurisdiction of the assemblies. The Speaker, since the coming into force of Act 1036, encroachment of permanent offence, punishable by a fine of up to 2,000 penalty units and a term of imprisonment. We are therefore also continuing with public education on these provisions of the law as certain encroachment. Mr. Speaker, public lands are by Article 2571 of our national constitution, the property of the, the people of Ghana vested in the President of the Republic. In the exercise of this fiduciary duty, the President, through the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, is committed to working with all stakeholders to put for the benefit of the Ghanaian people. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to find out from the Honorable Minister. Despite these systems put in place, there is often a perception that some state officers are connived with notorious land gas or contractors such as Clement Zatu uh, in places like Dairy Farms, Enma Research, and some other places uh, who is engaged in demolishing people's properties on government lands. I want to find out from the minister what authority do these people have. Thank you. Yes, I will minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's very interesting and striking that my friend from Sisala West is very interested in the public lands of Greater Accra. But, Mr. Speaker, that is fine. Be that as it may. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it tells me that he's a, he's a member of parliament who's look, who is interested in all the public lands of our country. Mr. Speaker, as I said in my answer, we have established the Public Land Protection Unit at the Ministry, the Public Land Protection Team, which is chaired by the Deputy Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Honorable Benito Ousubio. Mr. Speaker, this team is made up of various actors from various agencies of our country, the Ghana Police Service, the Ghana Armed Forces, and several actors who have expertise in the protection of public lands. So we got a team has been working to protect encroach to protect public lands and also ward off encroaches of public lands. So we got, I thought my friend was interested in the protection of public land. That is the, the, the import of his substantive question. He's now asking me why this team is demolishing properties and what authority they do. The authority they, they have is that I have constituted that team and the team is supposed to protect and recover public lands. And in instances where they have to demolish, where they have to use reasonable force, as dictated by the New Land Act 1036, they do so. And some of the examples we cited is very much in accord with the dictates of the New Lands Act, which is that we deploy reasonable force to protect the public lands of our country. We are, we are, we are doing exactly what you, you expect us to do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. Uh, but I just want to use the opportunity to correct uh, a perception created by my good friend. Mr. Speaker, the minister knows very well that I am a member of Lands and Forestry Committee, Mr. Speaker, and we are doing our job as committee members. And so if there are issues in the sector, and I ask for the minister to come and tell us happening, at the sector, I don't think that I must come from Accra to, 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 to have the right to ask questions regarding Accra. 
Le speaker. Uh, only, this... only, only smart there is that I'm surprised that committee members will bring the minister here to ask questions when he is available to you on call. Let's see, my yeah. second question. Yes, uh, you see. The Honorable Minister said that uh, a committee is being constituted. And in my question, I asked, a, I mentioned a particular name, Clement Zato. I want to find out from the Honorable Minister whether they said Clement Zato is a contractor being hired by his ministry or he's an officer or he's, he's, he, he's an employee of the Ministry of Lands and Natural. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, I, um, I, the gentleman in question, Mr. Clement Jato, is being an agent or contractor of the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, I believe uh, since the year 2013 or so, since the year 2013, he's been working with the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. And I inherited his arrangements with the Ministry of Lands and Nature. So, Mr. Speaker, I reviewed those arrangements by setting up this uh, official team under the Ministry, which is the Public Lands Protection Team, of which he is a member of the team. And the team is chaired by the Deputy Minister. Mr. Speaker, that is um, the involvement of the gentleman in question in respect of the protection of public lands in our country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well, you are done. The last question to the Minister of Lands is in the name of the Honourable Member for Gumwa East, Mr. Desmond de Graaf Peitu. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, Honourable the Graf Pedro is indisposed and has asked me to ask permission from you to stand in for him. If you give Please me proceed. the opportunity. Ask the question. Okay. Mr. Speaker, I rise to ask the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, the State of Ghana's Forest Reserves, and measures put in place to curb illegal mining and agricultural activities in the forest reserves. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Section 2 of the Forest Act 1927, Cap 157, empowers the President of the Republic to by executive instrument constitute land as a forest reserve. The total size of the forest reserve together with the protected areas is approximately 1.2 million hectares. Outside these forest reserves and protected areas, there are also several forests across the country known as off-forest reserves. A 2020 study undertaken by the Forestry Commission in partnership with the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology and the University of Edinburgh put Ghana's total forest cover, both reserve and off-reserve at approximately 6.57 million hectares. The Speaker, the Forestry Commission has put in place several measures to protect our forest reserves from these drivers of deforestation and forest degradation. Among them are regular patrolling of the forest reserves, protection and maintenance of internal and external boundaries of forest reserves, awareness creation and stakeholder sensitization, decommissioning and demobilization of equipment used for illegal mining in forest reserves. Mr. Speaker, specifically in curbing illegal mining in forest reserves, we have suspended recognizance, prospective and or exploration activities in forest reserves, except in exceptional circumstances. With the help of the military, the Forestry Commission has called on all, the, all forest reserves and protected areas in the country. Operation Hall 2 continues to support these measures. Mr. Speaker, Operation Hall 2 has since seen the decommissioning and demobilization of a number of equipment and structures in forest reserves, including the decommission of four excavators in the Bibiani Forest District between 2022 and 2023, seven 
excavators in the Oda River Forest Reserve in January 2023, six excavators in the Akramprama Forest Reserve in January 2023, one excavator in the Chua Forest Reserve in January 2023, among others. Mr. Speaker, government will continue to take all measures against illegal mining activities in our country. And I'm happy to report that these measures are yielding some results, with some of our river bodies visibly clearing up and the turbidity levels of these river bodies uh, on, the, on the downward trend. Mr. Speaker, we are not out of the woods yet. Illegal mining persists. We are dealing with money, and we know that the cartels involved will find every possible means to outweigh our efforts. But we will not relent. Mr. Speaker, government's commitment to the protection and management of the forest reserve of our country is evident in the gamut of measures that have been enumerated above. Let me assure the House that we will continue to employ all necessary measures to ensure that the forest reserves of our country are protected. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Um, Mr. Speaker, paragraph 4 of the Minister's answer is informing us about measures they have put in place to deal with the situation. It's an admission that uh, such illegal activities are going on. Minister, tell us how many arrests have they made so far in connection with these illegal activities? The minister did not say he has made arrests, so ask him whether he has made any arrests. Honorable Minister, have you made any arrests in respect of illegal mining in the forest reserves? Mr. Speaker, several arrests have been made, and indeed, um, numerous prosecutions are ongoing. Some convictions have been secured, sentences have been um, given, and I do know that some of these criminals are serving custodial sentences as we speak. Mr. Speaker, but the information the Honorable Member is asking of me is, uh, with, with respect, quite strange. Mr. Speaker, even as we speak now, arrests may be ongoing as we speak. And so if a substantive question is asked on a specific issue of the number of people who have been arrested up to a particular date, Mr. Speaker, I can find the information and provide it to the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I think the, uh, the Minister did not answer the question I asked. I asked how many arrests how many? Honorable, Minutes, uh, Honorable Member says that if that question had been asked specifically, he will pick from the various stations and provide it to you. But he knows that several have been made, several cases are pending before court, but he can't give you a specific number. Kindly ask another question, please. Mr. Speaker. Can the minister assure the House of proper investigations of the arrested individuals and prosecution to serve as deterrent to others who are engaged in destroying these reserves? I don't remember. You can file that as a specific question. He will get the details for you. If you have another question, please ask it. Are you done? Very well. Honorable Minister for Lands, thank you for attending upon the House to answer questions. You are discharged now. The next set of questions will be answered by the Minister for Transport. You may now take your seat, Minister for Transport. The first is by the Honorable Member for the group, Mr. Kwame Governs Abuja. You may ask your question now. Right, Honorable Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to 
ask the Minister for Transport what steps the Ministry has taken to construct an airport in the Upper East region and an international airport at Takradi as, provide, as promised in the 2019 budget statement and economic policy of the government. Yes, Honourable Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think my Honourable Member knows that this question has answered it already in June 2022 this year. And if there's any check, I will consult with him. But he's very much aware that this particular question has been answered. Thank you, Mr. Honourable Mr. Speaker. Honourable Mr. Speaker has already. admitted the question. So can you tell us? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> it is a government policy to establish an S airport or airstrip in each region to boost tourism and trade. Mr. Speaker, if you read the 2019 budget statement, and I quote, the Ministry will facilitate the construction of airport, airstrips, and high pass in all regions to link economic and social activities. However, Mr. Speaker, we have some few challenges because of the COVID situation. Now that the COVID situation is now over, Mr. Speaker, we are returning to normalcy and we are revisiting the issue of constructing Halipad and airport in other regions. Mr. Speaker, with respect to the Takrade International Airport, as I speak, a feasibility study has been completed and a suitable site has been identified for the development of a new airport between Central and Western region. It is expected that the procurement process, Mr. Speaker, will be commenced in NS to engage a strategic partner for the development of the airport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, any follow-up questions? Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. May I ask uh, the Honorable Minister, what preparatory works have been done so far on both uh, airport projects? Mr. Speaker, like I said, in relationship to the Takrabadi Central one, I said that the, the physical study is not completed. We have engaged all stakeholders, and the report is ready to be submitted to Cabinet. But all things being equal, the procurement process will, be, will start this year. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, what are plans for the Upper East uh, project or airport project? Yes. Mr. Speaker, once again, like I said in the budget statement, that it is the policy of government to make sure that we have at least airport or helipad in all this. Thing. But like I said, we need to have information before we can go ahead in terms of construction. But we have some few challenges. The consultant that we had could not do the work because of the COVID. But now we are certain again. So in terms of uh, Borga and other places, the consultant is now doing the studies and you will come out with the various reports. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, is there a timeline for which the, you are intending to procure the consultants to start the feasibility on the Upper East Airport? Mr. Speaker, the consultant had already been procured by Ghana Airport Company, who is doing the work. And like I said, he had a challenge because of the COVID, but he has resumed his work, so he's now working on it. Very well. The next, yes. I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Minister, in his response, says that it is still government's plan to have an airport in all the regions of Ghana. We all know that as part of the ongoing IMF negotiations, a number of projects have been suspended. It's the Minister for Transport assuring this House that these airports have not been affected by the ongoing negotiations with the IMF, which has led to a number of projects being suspended. Are you giving us that assurance that regardless of the IMF program, these airports will be constructed. I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think it is important that 
at Kaifam. I said it is the plan of government to have airport or airstrip in this country. Airstrip might not necessarily be an airport. But we have a plan with which we are doing the study. Mr. Speaker, in terms of the IMF program, I think that if we have, the IMF are also giving us a leeway that if some projects are important to us, they will exempt us in doing it. So whatever program that we have, I think that we can also discuss with the IMF how important that program is to us. And if there's any chance, we will go ahead and implement that particular project. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, there is an airstrip in Paga, in Paga, in the Upper East region. There was, there was work towards the construction of an aerodrome in Bolga, between Bolga and then Navrongo. In fact, the contract was awarded and work had actually started. But I hear the minister saying that uh, a consultant is to be procured to carry out studies towards the construction of an airport. Can he reconcile the fact of the existence of construction for an airport within the Volga uh, uh, municipality and his statement that he is now looking to engage a consultant to propose uh, plans or design the construction of an airport. Can you reconcile these, these facts? Yes, Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, my answer was not specifically in relation to, to Boku or the project that he's talking about. I said government has plans to have airstrip or airport in all every region. For those who have run already, the studies are not going to be affected. So for the construction that he is talking about, that the procurement was, was they procured somebody for the construction. It means that it's not part of the design or the new plan that it is already ongoing. But I'll find out specifically what he's saying. If it is not going to be affected, I will let him know. But the, the studies is not part of those that we have earmarked or we are already building. But the new ones that we have plans to do the studies and build. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. The next question is by the honorable member for Akan, Mr. Yao Gomado. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to ask the Minister for Transport when the Regional Maritime University Auditorium Complex, Administration Block, and other developmental projects which have been abandoned for years to be completed. Yes, an woman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the auditorium complex comprises of a three-story with seating capacity of 2,200. The current percentage of completion as per an assessment undertaken by the project consultant is 30 percent. The project is being funded by government of Ghana, but due to some challenges related to the funding, the works have stopped. Once this challenge is resolved, work will resume. Mr. Speaker, the library and administrative administration complex comprise of seven-story offices blocks with a basement for car park and is being funded under the Get Fund project. The percentage of completion is also 35% as per the latest assessment by the project consultant. This project is also facing a similar challenge as auditorium complex and work will resume as soon as this challenge is resolved. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, can the minister explain the challenge with the GET fund? The get fund I beg your pardon. Is it the case that the GET fund is not generating enough fund for its uh, activities? And I will ask another question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to find out from the Minister if he has any idea when these challenges are likely to be resolved for work to resume on, the, on this project since they have been abandoned for many years. 
Yes. Um. Mr. Speaker, I did say that we are facing financial challenges. And like he said, idea this year we do not have any allocation for it because of difficulties comfort now. But if our finances improve, I'm sure the Ministry of Finance will keep funds to it and the project will resume. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would like to find out from the Minister if the Ministry could appeal to the other four member countries, that is Cameroon, Gambia, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, uh, to support this project since they also benefit. Thank you. Yes. And not just Cameroon, the West African countries that together constitute the uh, regional maritime organization, are they paying their contributions? Mr. Speaker, in terms of member states, yes. But because the government of Ghana is the host of the university, there are certain obligations on us that we are supposed to fulfill. And some of these obligations are the construction of the auditorium and the library building. And like I said, it is not a responsibility of other member countries to contribute to some of this infrastructure. They are also putting up other infrastructure within the Cambia as well as a hostel, which is for the use of the university. This is government of Ghana's obligation. And like I said, uh, we have no contact, but I don't think that we should divert this attention to them. It is our responsibility and we find a way to do it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are you done? Yes, Doc. Mr. Speaker, this university is of concern to us because it's a regional university. And you would think that, indeed, the collective efforts of all the member countries will contribute for this work to continue. So it is not just Ghana. And from his answer, we don't see clearly whether Ghana has the responsibility as the host country and therefore must be responsible for all the financial outlays for this work or is the collective efforts of the member countries to have the institution function so again uh, the minister should clarify the funding regime for expansion of infrastructure within the regional maritime university thank you mr speaker yes honorable minister Mr. Speaker, I said that Ghana has a responsibility because we are a host country to put up some infrastructure. And other countries also have other responsibilities, putting up other stuff. Like I said, Gambia has put up a hostel. But the auditorium and the library is part of the responsibility of the government of Ghana to put up such facilities for the university as a host country. And that is why the government of Ghana is constructing both the auditorium and the library complex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. I'll move on. By the same honorable member, question number 1277. Honorable member Falcon. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity once again. Uh, to ask the Minister for Transport what measures are being taken to retrieve the land designated to the then Ghana Nautical College, now the Regional Maritime University, being encroached on by private developers? Yes, Honorable Minister. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the land in question is currently under litigation between the Regional Maritime University and the Lungwa Lands 2. Mr. Speaker, the court case is currently at the case management stage. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you. Since you refer the case to be in court, I have no further questions. Very well, I'll move on to question number 1497, the name of the Honorable Member for Tamale North. Alassan Saibu Suini. 
Yes. Yes, Speaker. I have the permission of Honorable Alas and Suhini to ask the question on his, his behalf. So if you still permit... I, I want to investigate this permission. When did he give you permission? <laughs> I have his authority to ask the question on, the between permission and authority? on his behalf, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Very well. Thank you. I rise to ask the Minister for Transport why a new expensive tower has been constructed at the Kutuka International Airport and how much it cost the state. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, so far as I'm concerned, or the authorities concerned, there has not been any construction of a new tower at Kotoka International Airport. I'm sure the one which is there, maybe I'm sure 1953 or 1957 that they constructed. But I don't know. If the Honorable Member knows where the tower is situated, maybe he can. But so far as I'm concerned, there will not be any construction of any new tower at the Kotoka International Airport. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, is the minister aware that the, a technical committee report recommended that the anomaly such an expensive tower seeks to fix can be done by installing less expensive CCTV systems? And the fact that he, in his response, he says that he's unaware of the construction of any new tower. Am I, Mr. Speaker, I'm asking this question for and on behalf of the Honorable Alassane Suhin. And this is a follow-up question he asked me to, to ask. Yes, Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I haven't seen any new tower being constructed. There's no new tower which has been constructed. So I don't know what he's talking about. Are you aware of any technical report? Uh, he's saying that the technical report says that what they seek to do could have been done by a CCTV. Are you aware of any such technical report? Because there has not been any new tower, so I don't know any technical report concerning any new tower which has been constructed. He said the tower has been constructed, and I'm saying that I don't know any new tower which has been constructed at the Kutuko International Airport. Maybe if he's talking about plans, I don't know. But if he said the tower has been constructed at the airport, I haven't seen it. And civil aviation has not constructed any new tower. Very well. Yes. Yes, has there been any work done on the existing tower? Yes, Honorable. Are there anything being done? Anything being done on the existing tower? Mr. Mr. Speaker, the question to me was the construction of a new tower, which I found out from Ghana Airport, Com Ghana Civil Aviation, who they said they have not constructed any new tower. But if you're talking about a report that they want me to go and find out, maybe I may find out that government thing. Is but they, the are you aware that anything is being done, even on the existing tower? Mr. 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 Speaker, nothing of such came to my attention for me to find out from them. But now that he's asking those questions, I'll find out from him. But for now, I am not aware that any new tower has been constructed. Very well. Now the next question is by the Honourable Member for Tamale Central, Mr. Mutala Mohammed Ibrahim. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Minister for Transport. How much government has generated the private entities operating at the spaces within the Terminal 3 at the Kutuka International Airport from the year 2017 till date. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Kutuka International, Terminal 3 at Kutuka International Airport became operational in 2018. So we started operating the airport in 2018 and not 2017. And from the speaker, from 
from 2018 up to today, revenue generated from September 2018 to December 2022 is 136,525,961 from these private entities through royalties and rent. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. S Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, per the response given by the Minister and in my subsequent questions, a response or answer has been provided indicating that the charges for the purposes of rent and royalties are done in dollars. Now, the Minister's response indicates that between 2018 till date, the Ghana Airport Company generated 136 million 525,961 Ghana cities. Mr. Speaker, I would like to know at what exchange rate did he arrive at this figure of 136,525,961 Ghana cities? Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think the Honorable Member. I don't know whether they will quote in dollars, but when the clients are paying, they pay in cities. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, dollar rate in this country has never been stable. We have different rates at different times. So I don't know whether he wants, if they paid in dollars, we wanted to use an average rate to do the conversion. But Honorable Minister, let's confirm. Are they collecting rent in dollars? Uh, Mr. Speaker, to the best of my knowledge, no. They paid in cities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I made reference to an answer provided by the minister. And in paragraph 500 in the other paper, the minister indicated how much each of the operators pay. If you check in the table, Light Restaurant pays 280 Ghana. The heading is raise pay per square meter per annum in dollars. So the question is simple. You came, even whether the people are paying in dollars or cities, the charges are made in dollars. And therefore, if anybody is going to pay, the person is going to pay at the prevailing dollar CD exchange rate. And that is why I'm asking the question. If you provide an answer, 136 million Ghana cities plus, and the dollars, whether they pay in dollars or in cities, they must pay at the equivalent of dollar CD exchange rate. That is the answer I want. At what exchange honorable, rate? Honorable, let's leave it here. Under Ghana law, nobody can receive payment in dollars. Right? So the minister cannot report in dollars. You can convert this figure to the, CD, uh, the dollar equivalent, but the minister cannot report to us as rent received in dollars. That would be illegal. Mr. Yes, Speaker, I'm not saying that you quote it in dollars. He provided a figure as to how much they generated between September 2018 to, I think, September 2022. But the charges are made in dollars. I do understand that the people may be asked to pay in cities. For example, if a dollar rate last month is 15 cities to $1, and this month it reduces to 12 cities, one dollar. The payment in city equivalent will not be the same. So what I'm sim simply seeking from the minister is the 136 million Ghana cities. At what rate, at what exchange rate did they collect it? That's my question. And I will ask another question, please. That's, this is just going to complicate the issues with legality. So just ask another question, please. Or reframe your question. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple. The 136 million Ghana cities plus stated by the minister in his response, the charges are done in dollars. I want to know at what exchange rate did he arrive at the 136 million Ghana cities? That's what I want to know. The minister has not talked about total 
receipt in dollars. The answer he has given here is CDs. If you think that the CDs you should convert to dollars, you can do your own calculation and ask him. But he says the rate is this per dollars. He didn't say they receive the rent in dollars. That would be illegal. That would be illegal. If you're going to buy a ticket, they'll pay, they'll quote it to you in dollars. But you pay with CD. So if you cannot, if you are accounting for it, you account the CD. But if you are converting, then you convert at the rate at which, at the point it was converted. But I don't want us to insist that the figure he quoted, the CD, at what figure, as if he collected uh, the GCA, the GCA or airport company, airport company collected the rent in dollars. We don't have that any such information. So let it be gui guide your further. Mr. 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 Speaker, thank you. Perhaps if I can ask the minister to give us a breakdown of the charges they made and the payments that were made by those who were operating in those spaces. Perhaps that could help. Will our colleague should refer to the minister. This is a substantive question, and he should rather file a question to the minister. To, to, to request... Well, to ask for details, specific details, the minister cannot provide a specific details on the square of the moment. He should rather file a question, and then the minister can provide such details to him. Eh? That's what you should do. And eh? you check your orders. I don't want to ask another question. I should. The question you asked. Okay. The minister is not the receiving agent. He has to go to the uh, Ghana Airport Company to pro procure that information for you. So it requires notice. That's why I ask another question. The question relating to the answer he has given here. Mr. Speaker, I'll move to the next question. I get the sense that we may not have the answer, but I think if the minister could tell us how quickly he can provide this answer to this house, I think that it would help. But if the directive, Mr. Speaker, is that I should file another question demanded, then that's fair. That is the rule. Okay. Mr. Speaker, let me go to my second question. Very well. Question number Mr. one, Speaker, five, zero, zero. to ask the Minister for Transport, how much each of the private entities operating at the airport pay for a square meter? Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the rate per square meter is charged per annum. The different category of rate per square meter per annum as follows. One, you have a commercial category, that is the rate per square meter. We have food and beverages, light restaurant, Mr. Speaker, 280, heavy restaurant, 290, pub, 300, duty free, we have arrival space, 500, departure space, Space 520, pharmacy 300, electronics 300, jewelry 400, business lunch 425, CIP lunch 500, medical laboratory 500, hotel lunch 650, offices, that's offices for banks. Grand handlers around 650. Vending machine, 600 per location. Wrapping services, 2,500 per machine. And ATMs, 10,000 per machine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, all the figures provided by the minister, per what I have, on the other paper, 
are all in dollars. All the figures. I mean, the speaker, that give credence to the question I was asking earlier. That it would have been appropriate if the minister wanted to quote, he quote them in CD equivalent. So that we would know that $280 is this amount of money, $300 is this. But I won't belabor that point much. What I want to know, Mr. Speaker, out of the figures provided, he indicated that we have a light restaurant and a heavy restaurant. I am completely at sea. The difference between a light restaurant and a heavy restaurant. So if you could expatiate on that before I proceed with the next pull-up question I have. Thank you. Honorable Minister, he says, what's the difference between a light restaurant and a heavy restaurant? Mr. Speaker, in our definition, the light restaurants are those who are selling coffee. I think Jezira is here. You will be able to speak better for me. And the heavy restaurants are those who are serving heavy food like rice, banco, and food and other things. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Minister's response has given us a table. And it is very clear that those who operate at the airport pay different rates depending on what you deal in. Mr. Speaker, I would like to know, out of the private entities operating there, how many of them are operating in light, in light restaurants, heavy restaurants, pub? How many are pharmacies? How many are jewelry? Because the rate at which they operate there differ. I would love the minister to provide this detailed information for us. Thank you. Yes, Honourable Minister, do you have the details? Well, I'll be glad to be honest. I don't have the details. If you give me the opportunity and he ask for another question, and maybe I may come here with those details. But now I don't have the details. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the minister is saying I should file another question. If you look at the minister's response in one of my questions, the last question, and as captured in paragraph 1501, the minister is able to tell us that at duty free, 20 pri private entities operate there. As the minister of state responsible for the airport, if he's able to give us this information, he should be in the position to give us the other information I am seeking. So it is strange that he's telling me that one I should file another question. Yet you provided detailed answer yeah. with regards to the third question. Honorable Mutala, you asked specifically. He will go and ask the agency and get the details. If you don't ask him, he will answer the question you asked. 1500 says how each of the private entities operating pay per square meter. That details he has gotten them for you. But whether they are 10 or 20 uh, square meters per each, if you ask him now, he may not be able to tell you. So the details you want, ask, because the information that was sent at the ministry, the minister will go to the agency and collect the information for you. If you asked about shops operating at the duty-free, he provided the information because the uh, Ghana Airport Company We'll give him the information. So please, ask Sir Scali, as he said. If he had it here, he'll give it to you. If he doesn't, he'll say, give him notice. That is actually our rules. The rule is that the follow-up question should not introduce new matters. So please ask another question. Mr. Mr. Speaker, who am I to challenge your directive? But strangely, the the question, I, the answer I even wanted as to how he arrived at 136 million Ghana cities, when he himself has indicated that the charges are done in dollars, that one too, he gave the same excuse. But I'll go to the third question, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I asked him whether they received the money in dollars, and he said no. Oh, you heard that, didn't they you? They charge in dollars. They don't, they charge in dollars, but yes. they don't receive it in dollars. So you buy tickets, they charge you in dollars, but you pay in CD, don't you? Please ask another question. Mr. Speaker, that is why I this. needed the exchange rate at which he arrived at 136 million. The very point we are making. If they charge in dollars and the people pay in CDs. Adam, do you have another question? Please proceed. <laughs> okay. 
so, Mr. Speaker, I would like to know from the minister, currently, do they charge in dollars or do they charge in cities? Yes, Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our rates are stated in it. We charge our rates are in dollars by in paying, they convert it and pay in cities. Thank you very much. Are you done? That is the, your second follow up question on 101500. Let's proceed and ask your third follow up question. Mr. Speaker, the minister just said they convert it to cities. I wanted to know the conversion rate. Maybe perhaps the exchange. Yes, Honorable Minister, at what rate do you convert? Mr. Speaker, the rate. I have said it's not constant, it differs from time to time. So it will be difficult for me to say that we converted at 4.3 to point four because the monies are paid in different times. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No. You are finished with your follow-up. You are finished with your follow-up question. Here's a jump. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have one substantive question. I haven't asked that. We, we must finish with 1500 before we come to. I don't want to go mm. Mr. Speaker, I would like to find out from the Minister. Looking at the answer provided at uh, page 41, the head note rate per square meter per annum, and they are quoting them in dollars. But when it comes to the tail end of it, you see vending machine, 600 per location, wrapping services, 2,500 per machine, ATM, $10,000 per machine. Can the minister especiate on this? Is he telling us that if I have a square meter and then I put Three ATM machines there, I'm going to pay 30,000 or what? Yes, I don't know. Mr. Speaker, I don't think that three ATM machines will go into one square meter. So once you are saying that your ATM machine, if you fix it there, and if covered as per square meter, you pay 10,000. Yes. I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I want to seek clarity from the Honorable Minister on the ATM machines. Uh, is it the case that the ATM machine is per banking institution, or regardless of if it's, say, Zenit Bank, if you are bringing three ATM machines, you have to pay 10,000 times three? Or is it per bank, per banking institution? Just clarification. I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I said that the square meter has been read, but in terms of ATM machine and that is a charge, that's how much one square, but I'll find out from them in detail. What that if it goes beyond the square meter that is stated, you pay that additional money. That one I need to check and, come and get back to. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just would like to ask the Minister, as a matter of fact, this information is available. The Ghana Airports Company, Mr. Speaker, I used to be on the board of Airports Company, so I know. This information is available. And the question actually should have given, uh, it was, the question was clear. How much each of the private entities operating at the airport pay for a square meter space? So whether there are five light restaurants or three light restaurants, that information. As a matter of fact, you can also ask for the age, uh, the age analysis of the debt, because not all the tenants there will pay their rent on time. So that also is available. So 
I will entreat the, my colleague to ask further about the death profile also of the tenants who are there. That information is available. When it comes to that, they were very efficient, efficient at bringing that information out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. Now I'll move on to the next question. 1501, Tamale Central, Mutala Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to ask the Minister for Transport. The number of entities operating at the duty free area of Terminal 3 at the Kuduka International Airport and how the contracts were awarded. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 20 entities are currently operating in the duty free area of Terminal 3 at Kotoka International Airport. The contract were awarded following an advert placed in the Daily Graphic and Ghanaian Times or upon request. For them, for upon, upon request by private companies or entities who want to operate at the Kotoka International Airport duty free. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I would like the Minister to expatiate on the contracts awarded by, through ad, ad, advertisement and those through the individual request. Yes, Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I don't have them now, but I can cross check and get back to them. Or if you ask, I can cross it. But I don't have how many were done through advert or how many were done through uh, request. I don't have good details, but I can get back to you. Thank you. Yeah, the question, Honorable Minister, was also included how the contracts were awarded. So the question actually required you to provide that information. To ask the Minister for Transport, the number of entities operating at the duty free area of uh, Terminal 3 and Kutuka International Open, how the contracts were awarded to them. So you may have to come back to provide that information. Mr. Mr. Speaker, thank you for that emphasis. The question is not about the processes through which the contracts were awarded. The question was specific. How the contracts were awarded, and I'm happy you reminded him. I don't think it will fall in line with the questions which he would have to come back, because this question was sent to him. So it is important he tells us how the contracts were awarded, Mr. Speaker. And thank you for that clarity. You live very long. Honorable, do you have a follow-up question? Do you have another question, a follow-up? Yes, that is a follow-up question. As to Very how well, the... so we'll move on. No, it's a follow-up question, how the contract was awarded. He hasn't answered. He said, I've directed him to provide that information. So you move on to ask another question. Mr. Speaker. If not, I'll proceed. Mr. Speaker, I'll move on to my... Mr. Speaker. In the minister's response, he has indicated that 20 entities are currently operating. That 20 entities are currently operating. Is this suggestive that before these questions were put and the answer provided, there were more or less entities operating within the duty free at the Terminal 3? I'm not sure I understand your question. Is he suggesting that? Can he? Mr. Speaker, the question, his answer is that, with your permission, he said that, Mr. Speaker, 20 entities are currently, 20 entities are currently operating in the duty-free area of Terminal 3. So if he say currently operating 20, so I want to know whether prior to this answers were provided, there were more than 20 or less than 20 operating at the Due to free of terminal three. Yes, honourable minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, 
there are 20 companies operating at the duty free shop now. That's all. Mr. Speaker, the question yeah. is not answered. My question is that if you say that 20 are currently operating, my question is very clear. Is it suggestive that before these questions were put to you and same answers provided, there were more than 20 operating or less? That's what I want to know. Anabu, were they all the shops started operating at the same time? Mr. Speaker, that is more difficult. And that is why I will not be able to speak to any because the shops are many. At times, some may be empty. People will come. At times, some. So, for him to ask that whether there the are less at that point in time, it is not all the time that the shops. So, you are suggesting that the numbers fluctuate. Sometimes some come, others replace them. Yes. Some okay. leave, others replace yes. them. Yes. But, but currently, currently, 20 people are there. And I'm, and I'm being frustrated by it. And have members order. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I understood what he said, it, it means that it is possible that the entities that were operating there were less or more, if I understood him very well. Except that I would conclude that since 2018, September, there have always been 20 entities operating within the spaces that are duty-free. If that is the point he's making, then he's I want to saying understand. that the space, some companies start, they fold up, others come. But as at the time he was answering your question, 20 were in operation. Yes. I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Minister in his response has indicated that there are two categories. That is, those who come by way of advertisement and those who come by way of uh, requesting to use the space. I want to find out from the Honorable Minister, what is the breakdown of this 20, the 20? How many came by advertisement and how many came by individual or private entity requests? The breakdown of the 20. Yes, Honorable Minister, do you have the breakdown? Mr. Speaker, I don't have the breakdown, but I can check and also let you know. Very well. I'll move on. Question number 1502. The name of the Honorable Member for Sherman, Mr. and Ms. Henry Nogbe. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, I stand to ask the Minister for Transport the procurement method used in procuring the Christmas tree for decorations by the Ghana Airport Company Limited and how much was spent on this activity in 2021. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Money back home from UK, Canada, and now US. I am something like an instant charge is being I still waiting in so yeah. I am unbeatable. We should be promo code Dr. Like it. Nanya ten pound ten dollars and a ten Canadian dollars for the first transaction. Oh, this send this guy a coffee. Download the lemonade finance.
cursing again is coming from my left. It's very painful. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ayawaso has been my, my Waterloo. It's something that in the performance of the duty of the state, an individual has been unjustifiably held liable for something that that individual knows nothing about. I have perused the 500-page report of the Ayawaso West Wagon Commission, more than 500 pages. And my name was not mentioned anywhere in the report as having done anything. In fact, if you look at the findings, and I have a copy and a <laughs> Question. Thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. Granted, granted that what the Minister, Honourable Minister, is saying is true. What procurement method is used? Because whether it's rentals or purchases, it must still go through the access history of the Public Procurement Act. So, which method did you use? Because this is specifically technical services. Which procurement method did you use to arrive at the companies that render that services to you? Thank you. Yes, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Th Mr. Speaker, like you said, there are rules governing hiring of different services. And Ghana Airport Company invited bidders and upon that this those who rent those facilities based on that they selected one and they rented the facility from that person. Thank you Mr Speaker. Yes. Mr Speaker, I'm a bit confused. The minister said it was rentals and so it was not purchased. Now he's saying that Ghana Airport Company invited two bids, and out of which one was engaged. I am saying that in your answer, you said there was no procurement. It was rentals. Yes. And now you are saying that Ghana Airport Company invited two bids, and out of which one was engaged. I'm a bit confused at this stage. Now, uh, Mr. Minister, are you aware where the Public Procurement Act, when the threshold is 50,000, per your answer, DDP has paid 50,000 out of it. And when the threshold is above 50,000, you need to go through national competitive tender place that your ministry or Ghana Airport Company go through this stage, competitive tender. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, yeah, Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, let me correct some impression. Impression is being created by the Honorable Member that I have said that there was no procurement process. I have never said that here. I haven't said that there wasn't any procurement process. So I just want to put that thing on record. The fact that we rented the facility did not mean that we didn't go through the procurement process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. But ask the main, uh, Honorable Minister, can you answer the main question? The main question was that if the cost exceeded 50000 under the Procurement Act, you needed to go through national competitive bidding. So did you or did Ghana Airport Company go through national competitive bidding? Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, I'm not aware that once the figure goes beyond 50,000, we need to. We can do selective tender. It is also competitive. It's also part of procurement process. Selective tender is also part of procurement process. So for him to say, unless, so unless you're saying he did selective tender. Yes, we did selective tender. Okay. You are done. I'll go to yes. You have asked, asked three questions. <laughs> Very well. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think the minister is not helping matters. If you said you have gone through the procurement uh, method, procedure, the simple question I asked was, which method did you use? And if you are not able to tell the method... He just mentioned selective tendering. He just mentioned it. He just said selective tendering. So, Mr. Speaker, if you have engaged an amount of 128,366 and DDP has paid 50,000. You are left with almost about 78,366, which is above the threshold per the law. And so you need to go through the national competitive tendering. And so I'm asking the minister, did he go through this national competitive tendering to arrive at the, the, the vendors or those who are the company that is supposed to render that services to the company. And we has answered you. He said he doesn't agree with you that he has to only to go through only national competitive tendering. Selective tendering is also admitted and they use selective tendering. So he's answered. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to find out from the minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to find out from the minister if um, whether he's aware the Ghana Airports Company conducted any cost-benefit analysis um, before they arrived at the decision to to rent these um, Christmas trees, because I'm looking at the amount here in question. It says 128,366 on rental. So I want to find out from the minister, did they do a cost-benefit analysis since Christmas is an year? So between renting it for this amount every year and purchasing it outright, um, I don't know if they did a cost-benefit, if the minister is aware they did that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Minister, are you aware that they did a cost-benefit analysis before concluding on renting? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will... <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I know that they took the bad decision for the institution. So at that time, it was a bad decision for them to rent it, and that's what they did. Thank you. Very well. Honorable Minister, thank you for attending upon the House to answer questions. You are discharged. Mr. Speaker, to take the chair. I discharge the transport minister. Yes, Majority Chief Speaker. At the commencement of public business, um, I guess we are ready to take item 7A. Speaker, I'll seek your leave to do it for and on behalf of the Leader of the House, with your leave.
Yes, please. Mr. Speaker, we've already agreed on that. Honourable Members, we take item 7 at the commencement of public business. The request is for us to take 7A, presentation of papers, the following papers to be presented, 7A, Roman 1, 2, and 3. We take them together. Yes, Majority Chief Whip. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Public Procurement Authority for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Coastal Development Authority for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Zongo Development Fund for the year 2021. Honorable Members, the three annual statements as captured in item 7a roman 1 roman 2 the next one should be roman 3 are all referred to the public accounts committee is it the public accounts committee the speaker i thought because we said they are sectoral related they should be refer to the various sector committees. Which sectors are these? The, these development authorities, and then the public procurement authority, then also Zungo Development Fund. Which sector is that? Could we refer them to the Committee on Social Welfare and State Enterprises? Yes, please. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Speaker, uh, these are committees that committee of, these are work that Committee of Finance normally deals with. So the Finance, finance Committee. Yes, Mr. The Speaker. Audit the reports. Finance Committee deals with the Zongo Development Authority yes. and the Public Procurement Authority and all of that. As part of as part of Office of Government Machinery. Yes, I want to get a sense of the house. Yes, BT Honorable BT Baba. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think the, your committee on poverty reduction strategy wow. has had engagement to the Coastal Development Authority. And we are also in touch with the National Development Planning Commission. It means that most of these things that you are making referrals has always not been referred to us as well. So I want to appeal to your office that my committee should be part of the referral. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Majority Chief. Speaker, I, I heard my colleague, but with respect in this house, unless we want to depart from the convention, such works are always referred to the Finance Committee. So I, I, I couldn't have agreed more with the minority leader. It is for the Finance Committee. Yes. Hey, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the leadership of the Poverty Alleviation Committee have expressed strong interest. And I think to, uh, to be prudent to allow the leadership of that committee to poverty, join the Finance poverty Committee. Reduction. Poverty reduction, I mean, to join the committee, the leadership. Honorable Members, the three annual statements are referred to the Finance Committee and we encourage the leadership of the Poverty Reduction Committee to assist the Finance Committee in the consideration and report back to the House accordingly. Yes, any more guidance? Yes, Speaker. Speaker, may we turn to page six, still under public business, and take item 
7E, Speaker, with your leave, to be taken by the Deputy Minister of Finance. Item 7E, all of them. E I E I I and I I I. Honourable Members, 7E at basis of the order paper, Roman 1, Roman 2, Roman 3 to be taken together by the Deputy Minister for and on behalf of the Minister for Finance. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ghana Exim Bank for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ministry of Finance for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Office of the Head of Civil Service for the year 2021. Honorable Members, the three annual statements are accordingly referred to the Committee on Finance for consideration and report to the House. Yes, please. Speaker, we are, we are ready now for 7H. And I will again seek your leave for it to be done by the Honorable O.D. Amwa. Sorry, I didn't get the number. You said? 7H. 7H. Yes. Speaker, we are taking all of it from I to XX. By the deputy minister of local government. Honourable members, item 7H, starting from Roman 1 to Roman 20. We we'll take them together, and the minister, no, now he's deputy minister, he's not a minister. Deputy Minister at the Ministry of Local Government, Decentralization and Rural Development, Honorable Obi Amwa, to do that for and on behalf of the Minister. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of Eastern Regional Coordinating Council for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Adentan Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Alonga District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Busumi Freho District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Asante Akim North Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Doma West District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Mampo Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the New Draven South Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Century South District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Nsawum Edwardry Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Kweu West Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Fantia Kwa North District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Adaklu District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Kwaibibri Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Lower Mania Krovo Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Yilo Krovo Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Obwasi Municipal Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the North Tongu District Assembly for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ministry of local government, decentralization, and rural development for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Birim North District Assembly for the year 2021. Honorable members, all the annual statements as detailed out in item 7H, 20 in number, are referred to the Committee on Local Government 
and rural development for consideration and report to the House. Yes, please. Speaker. Speaker 7, I. And I will seek again your kind leave for it to be taken by the noble Matthew Poku Pempe, the Minister for Energy. Say the Minister for the Minister for Energy. I thought it was education. With respect, that's why I sought your leave for it to be taken by the Minister for Energy. He knows I won't allow him to lay it. He knows. Yeah. He knows that I won't allow him to lay it at me. That will be seeking your kind leave. Yeah, but I will refuse that uh, permission. He knows. Yeah, we, 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 will, we will. This is father and son matter. Don't go in. So that we will do the need for. <laughs> Why are you pleading for and on his behalf? Yes, indeed. Are you a Catholic? There is a process we go through if you are a Catholic, you understand that. But I know you are a Christian. He's a Christian. He's a good man. <laughs> Honorable members, item 7i at page 8. We are being asked to allow the Minister for Energy to present this annual statement for and on behalf of the Minister for Education. Roman 1 to Roman 14. Please, Minister, you may do so now. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the McCoy College of Education for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the University of Energy and Natural Resources for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ola College of Education, Cape Coast, for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ghana Communication Technology University for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Koforidia Technical University for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the St. Joseph's College of Education, Bichem, for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the National Film and Television Institution for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Mampom Technical College of Education for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ghana Institute of Journalism for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the St. Ambrose College of Education, Doma Akwemu, for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Pekki College of Education for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the EP College of Education, Ahmed Zofe, for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Takradi Technical University for the year 2021. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Dambai College of Education for the year 2021. Honorable members, all the annual statements are detailed out under item 7i, 14 in number are referred to the Committee on Education for consideration and report to the House. Yes, Majority Chief Whip. Speaker, as discussed, um, we are ready to take item 19 on page 19 of today's order paper. And speaker, yes. the, the chair of the committee, the majority leader has granted me the leave to take it. And I'll seek your kind leave to take the motion. Honorable members, item 19, 
at page 19 of the order paper, motion, chairman of the committee, I grant permission to the majority chief for to do so for and on behalf of the chairman of the committee. Yes, please. Speaker, with respect, I rise to move that this honorable house adopts the report of the special budget committee on the draft public elections registration of voters regulation 2022 and other related matters. Speaker, in so doing, I present the committee's report and I intend to limit myself to just some portions and invite Hansai to do the needful. Speaker, the Special Budget Committee held a briefing session on Wednesday, 27 July 2022, with the Electoral Commission of Ghana, led by the chairperson and the two deputies involved. Speaker, the Subsidiary Legislation Committee of Parliament had earlier held a pre laying meeting with the EC to review a new CI, Public Elections Registration of Voters, Regulation 2022, and other related matters that the Commission is contemplating seeking the approval of Parliament to replace the existing instruments in preparation towards election 2024. Speaker, the committee having thoroughly interrogated the issues and reforms being contemplated by the EC would like to reiterate its support for any efforts that will enable every Ghanaian to get a Ghana card because it tests the law. So that some committee members express your strong opinion that the new CI will give very limited options as many eligible voters may not be captured on the electoral roll and the time for the impending elections as access to the card has increasingly become a difficult enterprise for many Ghanaians. This situation, Speaker, the members observed, could lead to challenges where many eligible voters which obviously will be offensive to Article 42 of the Constitution. Speaker, in conclusion, the committee therefore respectfully recommends to the House, in view of the foregoing, to adopt this report on the draft CI, Public Elections, Registration of Voters Regulation 2022, and other related matters of the Electoral Commission of Ghana and subject it to further consideration by the House. Speaker, I so present. I thank you. Any seconder? Yes. Well, speaker, I write, rise to second the motion for the adoption of the report of the Committee on Special Budget on what ordinarily Mr. Speaker should raise eyebrows, a briefing session on the draft public elections registration of voters regulation 2022. Mr. Speaker, as you are aware, any regulation that comes to this House works on the strength of Article 11 of the 1992 Constitution. And with your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, I beg to quote uh, on our, your, your constitution. I beg to quote Article 11, uh, which provides, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, for the record, I, I, I quote The laws of Ghana shall comprise of, so, Mr. Speaker, yourself a good lawyer. It, uh, uh, yes, but it, it, it stipulates the hierarchy of the laws in terms of their importance and superiority. So Article 11 7 provides that any order, rule, or regulation made by a person or authority under a power conferred by the Constitution or any other law shall be laid before Parliament, published in the Gazette on the day it is laid before Parliament, and come into force 
at the expiration of 21 sitting days. So, Mr. Speaker, ordinarily, any report on a draft CI ought to belong to the mandate and remit of the subsidiary legislation committee ably chaired by Dr. Ayeni. But, Mr. Speaker, in this particular regulation, the Electoral Commission, by virtue of, and again, I refer you to Article 45 and 46 of the 1992 Constitution, the Electoral Commission has the mandate to do what it sought to do. So, Article 45, the Electoral Commission shall have the following functions. And, Mr. Speaker, uh, they have a duty to undertake programs for the expansion of the registration of voters. I'm quoting 45E in particular for our purpose. So, Mr. Speaker, when the EC introduced this particular regulation, two important observations was made by the Committee of Special Budget. One, the Electoral Commission was now informing the Ghanaian public through Parliament that only the national ID card issued by the National Identification Authority will be a sole reference document for the purpose of registration. Mr. Speaker, that is the intention of what is referred to as a draft CI. And in it, if you want, I'll refer to the particular uh, purpose. It says qualification for registration. And then it comes, Mr. Speaker, again to say two, designation of registration centers. And again, Mr. Speaker, our committee found problems with the designation of the registration center. It says a district office of the commission, a district office of the commission, or any other place that the commission considers appropriate. Mr. Speaker, throughout history in 1993, since the establishment of the Electoral Commission, voter registration exercise is done at polling stations, polling stations, not district offices. And Mr. Speaker, I'll use the example of Bole. A polling station in the Bole constituency is as far as spending four or five hours to get to Bole Township in order to be able to be captured and registered as a voter. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, maybe the Honorable UC will give me the name of the community where they have to travel very far. Babato in, in the Bole district. So, Mr. Speaker, you have to travel almost 80 kilometers to travel. So for the Electoral Commission to designate only district officers is problematic for us constitutionally, is problematic for us administratively, is problematic for us for voters to identify. Mr. Speaker, when the opportunity was given to voters to go and register at polling station, it served two purposes. One, they know where to go and verify their names and two, they know where to appear on election day to be able to cast their vote. Now, limiting it only to a district office will deny Ghanaians this opportunity, which can also amount to an attempt to deny them a constitutionally guaranteed right under Article 42. So, Mr. Speaker, may I now refer you to Article 42, which will be the trust of my argument as to why the Electoral Commission must clean up before even they submit whatever official document they have to the subsidiary legislation committee. Because, Mr. Speaker, we are committed to a democracy. As you yourself observed yesterday, the conduct of elections and change of government is not enough. The independence of the Electoral Commission as a referee is important. Mr. Speaker, I come to 42, it reads, and I quote, Article 42 reads, every citizen of Ghana of 18 years of age or above and of sound mind has a right to vote, and Mr. Speaker, the emphasis now is mine, and is entitled to be registered as a voter for the purpose of public elections and referenda. Mr. Speaker, so Article 42 imposes an onerous obligation on the Electoral Commission to provide an opportunity to every Ghanaian so qualified, without any inhibition, without any hindrance, to be able to consummate the right constitutionally guaranteed under Article 42. May I speak up for the record? 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, 
Ghanaians who have attained the age of 18 years have been denied the opportunity to be captured as registered voters. This is a constitutional wrong. Let anybody challenge me with facts and figures, Mr. Speaker. There has been no voter register opportunity for Ghanaians who have attained 18 years since 2021. That is a constitutional wrong unacceptable to a country committed to multi-party constitutional democracy. Mr. Speaker, the right to vote and to be voted for is so sacred. Even for you elected members of parliament, one of the minimum qualifications of you to get voted as MPs is to show that you are a registered voter. That is the weight the constitution imposes on this in Article 94 of the constitution. So, Mr. Speaker, the Electoral Commission, by virtue of their existing CI, have no reason to tell anybody and to tell this August House why they have so failed to capture Ghanaians who have attained 18 years. So, Mr. Speaker, we have a problem with it. One would have expected that the Electoral Commission will make a formal announcement. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, if this country is committed to mainstreaming IT in our public national life, it should be a matter of daily occurrence that anybody who attains 18 can voluntarily walk to any office of the Electoral Commission to be captured as a registered voter. That is what we should do. And Mr. Speaker, when you are given direction on this matter, it should be part of your consequential direction. Why? Ghana, IT, enabled a, a, a country. And you are saying that when I'm 18, the EC have denied me an opportunity to get to register. So Mr. Speaker, if there were elections in 2021, maybe a by-election, 2022, 2023, this category of Ghanaians would have been denied a legitimately guaranteed sacred constitutional right to register as a voter and to be voted for as required in Article 42. So, Mr. Speaker, this is another constitutional ill that we said that the EC must correct. And, Mr. Speaker, today there is no law, no law, that prohibits the Electoral Commission from going ahead to conduct voter registration exercise for Ghanaians who have attained 18. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, in my travel, and I'm sure you also, you've also come across it, I was in Colorado with you. There are some Ghanaians abroad who also want the opportunity to come home to be registered as voters. They only can do so if they are guaranteed this particular right. So, Mr. Speaker, when you say draft regulation, by virtue of the Supreme Court ruling, the subsidiary legislation committee, as I said, ably chaired by Dr. Ayene, is mindful that they cannot alter, they cannot alter any instrument or regulation brought before them, because that may render it a nullity on the basis of the earlier Supreme Court ruling on the matter. So, Mr. Speaker, when the EC submitted same to his committee, he consulted, and in his consultation, one, why does the EC want to register registration of voters to a district office? That is wrong and unacceptable, and we should not accept it. It must be at polling centers, demarcated for purposes of registration of voters and for purposes of casting their vote. So, Mr. Speaker, we are arguing that if you look at the current CI, Electoral Commission CI 91, there is nothing wrong with it. The EC can go ahead. Mr. Speaker, let me conclude so that Dr. Ayane will do justice to it. My final comment, Mr. Speaker, is that we should be interested in the wording in the Constitution. National Identification Authority is a creature of an Act of Parliament. So under Article 11, it cannot be superior to the Electoral Commission so established under Article 45. So, Mr. Speaker, may I refer you back, once I conclude to Article 46 of the uh, Electoral uh, Constitution, it reads, and I quote, except as provided in this Constitution or any other law, not inconsistent with this Constitution, Mr. Speaker, the emphasis is mine, in the performance of its functions, 
the electoral commission shall not be subject to the direction or control of any person or authority. We cannot say same for the National Identification Authority, which is under the control and oversight of the able Minister for Interior. So, Mr. Speaker, data from National Identification Authority cannot be treated as if it's data from the Electoral Commission of Ghana, even though materially I agree that the Electoral Commission can drive a source of data from the National Identification Authority. But because ministerial oversight, and I've seen a letter of President Nana uh, 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 to this House saying that the Honorable Minister for Interior is responsible to the National Identification Authority. So the Minister for Interior can direct the National Identification Authority. We do not want an instance where he will direct in a matter where he has interest. Because he himself runs for parliament. And he will support Nana Abidankwa for parliament. So Mr. Speaker, the 18 year old in Ghana, 19, 20, 21 years, who want to vote President Akufuado out, have been denied the opportunity to be captured in the voter register for the purpose of future elections. They want to. So we are saying that Mr. Speaker, make a clear distinction between an institution so established by an act of parliament, which has control, ministerial oversight and control by the Minister for Interior, and separate and distinct from the Electoral Commission established under Article 45 and 46, which shall not be subject to the direction and control of any person or authority. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, in the NRA Act, some mandate is given to the minister responsible. It didn't mention interior, though. It didn't mention interior. So, Mr. Speaker, draft. Why are we debating a draft? Because, Mr. Speaker, we want to reach a consensus guided by you as to how to proceed with the EC wanting to exercise a legitimate mandate. Nobody is questioning the authority and mandate of the Electoral Commission. But we are questioning that they cannot say that, the Electoral Commission cannot say that only district offices must be dedicated for purpose of registration. That is wrong. It must be polling centers. And this parliament must provide enough budgetary allocations. Honorable Minister of Finance, good to see you. The Electoral Commission has even paid people they use for the conduct of 2020 elections. Go and do what is right and appropriate for them and give them money to dispense of those expenses. And assure them, democracy is expensive, but at least it's better where you have no rights or freedoms and you have no system working at all. So, Mr. Speaker, I have with me here the NIA Act of 2006, Act 706. And then, Mr. Speaker, as I said, it provides that the minister, the minister in, in, in sex, uh, section 18, referring to now the minister for the interior. So therefore, Mr. Speaker, our primary concern is now data. The NIA has data. Electoral Commission has data. The Electoral Commission spent $80 million dollars to undertake an exercise for the purpose of voter registration. Where is that data? And what is wrong with that data? If you so wanted to rely on NIA, why didn't you allow the state to allocate the $80 million to the National Identification Authority? But you said, Mr. Speaker, Hansard will capture me. The Electoral Commission appeared before this House and said that they have a superior technology and that even eyelashes will be captured. We don't see that even in the register that they so have. So where is your register? We need to know. Then, Mr. Speaker, the gravamen of my issue is reconciliation of data. Currently, the Electoral Commission has about 60 million on its voter register. The NIA has less. Honor oh, Ahmed, help me with the numbers there. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the report speaks to it. I will, but I want to quote a particular figure. So, Mr. Speaker, there is a discrepancy between what the NIA have. No, 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 no. There is a discrepancy in the figure of... Uh... Mr. Speaker, we have voter register. 
17 million. Then NIA, 16.6 million. That discrepancy can occasion an opportunity of denial of the legitimate right guaranteed under Article 42. Mr. Speaker, we saw it when it came to SIM registration. They said no NIA, no SIM registration, blackout. You cannot do a blackout to a registered voter on the basis that he has no national ID card. This is what we are seeking to avoid. So on election day, you go to your police station and you are told that because you have no NIA, you can't be on the electoral roll. Mr. Speaker, that would be a constitutional wrong. That would be a constitutional wrong. So until, Mr. Speaker, the discrepancy is resolved between the NIA and the Electoral Commission that we are setting. And Mr. Speaker, in some regions, in some regions, particularly the Upper West region, your own region, and Volta region, the number of persons captured by NIA is far low than what is captured by the Electoral Commission on their voter register. We don't want to believe that this may be deliberate to disenfranchise people in areas deemed dominant for the National Democratic Congress. So, Mr. Speaker, we jealously, jealously will protect the right to vote. That is why, Mr. Speaker, we said that there must be a meeting of the Committee of the Whole where the Electoral Commission and the NIA share their data with us and assure us that we can rely on their data so that the National Identification Authority becomes the sole document. Now, Mr. Speaker, why is that easy? Why is that easy? Not making their own data. The register you capture with $80 million. How come that a person on that register cannot guarantee a voter for the purpose of registration of vote? Then what exercise did you undertake? You took, you took $80 million to register Ghanaian. You are now saying national ID card, not even a voter register issued by the Electoral Commission. Yet, you, you issued the card. So, Mr. Speaker, in other jurisdictions, they have relied on the guarantor system. They are also refusing the guarantor system. Yes, a minute. Thank you, I, Mr. Speaker. I see. I, I have not... Have you concluded? You have concluded. Yes. Honorable Minister. Mr. Mr. Speaker, following the arguments my Honorable Member for Tamale South is making, stating on this floor that because the NIA has a lesser number in Volta region than the National Ele Electoral Commission registered numbers in both Volta region and Upper West region, it presupposes that NIA is trying to disenfranchise people because those are regions, those are regions, those are regions, to make it worse, those are regions that are predominantly NBC. Mr. Speaker, what is the basis for that? Mr. Speaker, it's a very dangerous statement. The immediate past, the immediate past, the immediate past minority leader is making. The fact that you have moved from minority leader to senior member of the opposition doesn't mean you make statements without substantiating. I do sympathize with how you have been moved, but if you are making arguments now, the arguments must be grounded. The arguments that can cause problems outside this chamber should not be tolerated. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he goes on to say, he goes on to say that between 2018 and 2020 up to now, nobody 18 years has been registered. Palpable falsity. Palpable falsity. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. We should all we should all collaborate. I do I do accept it. We should all collaborate to make sure that the EC when it plays a CI has the support of both sides of the house so that we can engender peace in this country. But the arguments that my honorable former minority leader and a friend of this uh, of the special budget committee is speaking is very, very dangerous. We should not make the work of electoral commission and national identification commission partisan. Such that we make arguments. Did you hear him? Yes. 
so that such that it will cause problems for me and him outside here. I'm, I'm pleading with the I, I thought I thought we had rules. Honorable Minister, please. Honorable Minister, I thought you were raising a point of order. I was raising a, a point. Yes. I was raising a point, Mr. Speaker. I stood for three minutes. I stood for I stood for three minutes before I caught your eye. Yes. And I was quiet. You see, that gesticulation for my honorable colleague must not be allowed in this house. Address me, address me. Mr. Speaker. I, I would not attempt to even direct you to look in the direction of my very good friend. It is not nice, it is not parliamentary for somebody to cut the eye of the speaker, to be given the floor to speak, for colleagues to be jumping up and down their seats as if we are in the market. I learned, I learned parliamentary practice for the best, which includes Mr. Speaker and Minority Leader. Never, never in this house did I speak. Mr. Speaker, when he was minority leader or a member, jumping out there, up and down his chair. He doesn't behave like that. Learn, learn. On our learn. You are disgracing the speaker. Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to say that. Uh, yes, a minute. Yes, a minute. Honorable members, I taught the purpose of this exercise is to get the House to build consensus and to get agencies under S. Whether the Constitution says they are independent or not independent, we approve their budget, we do everything, and we have to hold them to account to the good people of Ghana. There's a serious challenge we want to build consensus and see how we can work with them to resolve the issue so that we get all qualified Ghanaians to enjoy they are fundamental human rights guaranteed by the Constitution. So please, let's take that as the uppermost, the reason why we are doing this, and don't be seen to rather be aggravating the situation. So I've heard your point of order. I will allow the Honourable Member for he said I should allow him a few seconds. Yes, please. Mr. Speaker, you know, in, con use in one, conclusion. One second. I know he can use one second. But Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, current voter register of the Electoral Commission is 17,041,340. Mr. Speaker, then uh, current total registered Ghanaians by the National Identification Authority is sixteen million seven hundred and fifty four thousand seventy three out of this thirteen thousand thirteen million three hundred and seventeen cars have been issued leaving three point four million Ghanaians without the Ghana card how can we ensure that this category of Ghanaians legitimately enjoy the full benefits of the rights guaranteed them under Article 42 of the Constitution. It is my submission honorable, honorable, that the NIA have honorable, no excuse the, with CI 91126 not for, to proceed yes, with the momentary yes, voter register. Thank you, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Yes, a minute. Yes, a minute. The Minister for Interior is up on his feet. Yes. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think we all look forward to resolving these matters in the uh, Committee of the Whole. But as of today, as of today I want to update the uh, Honorable Haruna Ijisu that as at 21st February 2023, the number of citizens registered is 17,381,000. Oh, no, 951. Oh, no. There will be an opportunity for us to reconcile that in the Committee of the Whole. But I need to tell you that. Yes,
Honourable members, please, the minister was just trying to update the figure. But I know... I know that when you have the Committee of the Whole, you will discuss all these things. Please, let's find a solution to the challenge. Don't let's aggravate the situation. I take it that the Honourable Member has concluded his submission. Honourable Haruna Idrisu, you concluded. Now, please, you, I have a list. I'm guided by the list, and I'm going according to the list. Leadership. Mr. Speaker, the report I have, and the page shows the report which was given to us. Honor, honorable, for honorable, purposes of this honorable report. Honorable Haruna, I haven't given you the opportunity. I will not, I will not allow anybody to impute your integrity. No, 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 no. The fact that the, even the dates and the date you gave is different. He was giving us the latest. And so that cannot be imputing your integrity. Um, we will now listen to Honorable Obi Amwa. That's the list I have. Honorable Obi Amwa. Yeah, Honorable Deputy Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, um, Yes, you, you will speak, but we ferry the message across to you. Mr. Speaker, we ferry the message across to you, and it's on the grounds of that message that I'm on my feet. Mr. Speaker, my, our position from the majority friend bench is that when our colleagues in the minority front bench are on their feet or any other colleague from the minority side is on his feet. Mr. Speaker, our side accord that honorable member that respect. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, what we witnessed a moment ago, when Honorable Aaron Idris was making his constitutional argument, the whole parliament, this chamber was quiet. We may have disagreement, but we would wait for him to finish. But when Honorable Matthew Poku Prempe got up to make an intervention on the point of order. Mr. Speaker, we saw, we heard. Mr. Speaker, I would want to plead that going forward, some of these things should not be happening. We should, we should Mr. Speaker, tolerate each other and allow debate to flow. The way, Mr. Speaker, our colleagues Mr. Speaker, this is an example. Even now, they are not patient enough. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, it appears that even, even when we are protesting for a possible change, they are not ready. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we've made our point. Honorable Member, I, I was listening to you. I haven't granted anybody any opportunity. I was listening to you. You were addressing me. So please. Because when you were the majority leader, I recall you used this phrase, reckless heckling. You said re he heckling is allowed. But yes. when that heckling becomes reckless, it's unparliamentary. Yes. Mr. Speaker, I, I, Mr. Speaker, that phrase, there was a debate. And the heckling was getting out of hand. And you got up to say that heckling is part of politics. The parliament we have, heckling is allowed. But when it becomes reckless, it's, 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 it's unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, all I am saying is that even at the bar, we do some little heckling. In this chamber, there can be some minimum heckling. But Mr. Speaker, it shouldn't get to the stage where you would describe it as reckless heckling. That is a point I want to make. Uh, Mr. Speaker, 
if that continues, things will get out of hand. So I would plead with colleagues, Mr. Speaker, I'll plead with colleagues that the way we accord Honorable Atu Fawcett with respect, they should accord our side with the same respect. The way we accorded the former minority leader with respect, they should do the same thing to us. What is happening is getting out of hand, taking advantage of the liberties of opposition to always have your way. It's not a way for democracy to try. Mr. Speaker, you see, Mr. Speaker, you see, I don't want to mention names, you see, instead of them to listen in silence, instead of them to listen in silence, okay. instead of them to listen in silence, they have a problem. Mr. Speaker, I rest my case. Honorable members, you know we started the process of renewing our mandates here in Parliament. If I have to apply the rules, it could disqualify some of you before you get to your constituencies. That's why sometimes we desist from going that far. So don't take advantage of our magnanimity and be rubbing in. So please, let's allow, let's listen to each other. Let's, at the end of the day, achieve what this whole essay is about. Add an extensive discussion with the leadership of the House. The majority leader was with me yesterday. He gave me a brief. This morning, a minority were with me. They gave me a brief. At our pre-sitting meeting, we went through this again, and we decided to take these two motions. This is the first one. Share these ideas before we get into the Committee of the Whole. Then the Committee of the Whole will now report back to the House for us to see whether we could allow the CI to be laid we are also looking at the timing. There are other issues we have to consider as a house. So please, can we listen to each other? If you decide not to do so, I will take the position that I will apply the law, and I'm sure some of you cannot get to your constituencies after that. Well, your constituents will not vote for you at all. The, the statement that the, 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 the speaker will issue will disqualify you. So please, let's listen to uh, Honorable Obi Amwa. I have the list, so I'll come back. You give me five from each side. Five from each side. So the two motions, that is ten from each side. And we need to have time. In the meantime, I'll have to extend certain look at the nature of business under outstanding orders. So sitting is extended beyond the prescribed sitting time. Please, it's now the turn of the majority caucus, and we'll have to listen to Honorable O.B. Amwa. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, I rise to comment on the report of the Special Budget Committee on the briefing session on the draft public elections regulations. Mr. Speaker, this situation appears to be very unprecedented. And as we learn every day, it will enrich our democracy. Indeed, if we look at the Constitution under Article 117, it talks about the procedure for laying of instruments before Parliament. Somewhere along the line, 
I remember very well before I even became chairman of the Social Legislation Committee. It was agreed that we as stakeholders should also be consulted. That is how come the pre-laying procedure came into being. Otherwise, the relevant agency would have to come and lay the instrument, it's referred to the committee, the committee brings its report, and if two thirds of members of parliament don't reject the instrument, it becomes the law. By bringing the pre laying we have been consulted as to the kind of regulations any institution wants to lay. The EC, in following a new procedure, appeared before the Central Legislation Committee as to the kind of instruments they intended to lay before Parliament. At the meeting, several issues came up. The main issue was the fact that the EC wanted to bring this constitutional instrument, which would then promote continuous registration. Indeed, even at that meeting, some members were saying that their interpretation of the CI was that the EC was compiling a new register which the EC denied. Indeed, the then minority leader had even granted interview to the whole world that the EC was compiling a new register and that EC had spent 80 million to compile a new register. At the meeting, and scrutinizing the CI, the EC was not compiling a new register. The EC was seeking to register those who have turned 18, and that through continuous registration, you could walk in to the district office any time to get registered. Now, reading the report, and then coming to the conclusion of the committee, the first thing is that no new register will be compiled. Secondly, we also have to acknowledge that no CI has been laid because we hear the public, we hear even some of our members telling the whole world that a CI has been laid and that CI it will seek to stop people from getting registered. No CI has been laid. Three, at the meeting, and if, even if you look at this report, we seem to acknowledge that the guarantor system has been abused. And indeed, as practitioners, even as practitioners, the thought behind the guarantor system was to acknowledge that where a prospective registrant did not have any means of identification, they could fall on their parents, their spouses, their children, close family members to guarantee and sign a form that indeed I know this person is qualified to be registered. And that as we have moved along the years, this system has been abused in the sense that people overnight became guarantee contractors where they join the queue, get registered, they stand by and say that they are waiting to endorse 10 or 5 people that they know them, they should be registered. It's a worry which we must take into consideration. And indeed, if for any reason the guarantee system has been maintained, all these issues must be addressed and in the CI that the EC wants to propose. But that is not even the issue at this stage. If you look at the report, it's first deputy speaker to take the chair. If we read the report, the various paragraphs starting from 
page 3, last but one paragraph. Even at the committee level, and Mr. Speaker, I will read the paragraph. It says, the committee further sought to know what has happened to the EC's biometric data that was recently collated and the voters' ID cards that were issued by the Commission for the 2020 elections. In other words, the committee wanted to know or wanted to understand why the recent voters' ID cards may not qualify to be used for the purposes of registration, but rather the NIA card. Mr. Speaker, this concern, this issue, has been answered further. But it shows that even for members of parliament, some are still carrying that opinion that the new CI is to ensure that the EC carries out new registration. That is not so. That is not so. And the finding it here means that our own members have not taken the trouble to even know what is in the proposed CI. Further, Mr. Speaker, if you go to page four, in the response of the EC, if you look at II of the report, page four, I want to read Mr. Speaker. It says the chairperson explained for the records that officially no CI has been presented to Parliament as is being alleged. However, as has been the convention and practice of the House, the Commission engaged the Subject Legislation Committee to solicit the inputs of the members and to enrich the draft CI as part of the processes before it is finally presented to the House. The next speech. On the use of the Ghana card, the chairperson explained that indeed we used to have various forms of identity and that even for the last registration where we all got registered, every member here got registered, otherwise we couldn't have even stood as a member of parliament. We all have that registration card, the voter ID card. And for that purpose, all the rules were applied. Going forward, the EC is saying that indeed, if we cannot stop the abuse of the guarantee system, then we should rather rely on the Ghana card to be able to register. Now, I can see from the reports that the committee on page 7 was assured in the words of the committee, in the strongest terms by the chairperson that no new register will be compiled. The issue then is how do we address what has been provided before the Special Budget Committee? I would want to say that if you look at the last paragraph of the report, it says the committee is recommending to the House that in view of the foregoing to adopt the report on the draft CI, but Mr. Speaker, indeed there is no CI before us. That should be on record. It should, it should be put on record that no CI is before us for the committee to recommend on the draft CI. The reality is that we are at the consultation stage. And at the consultation stage, most often, the EC or any institution consulting us takes on board some of the suggestions that we make. And then I believe that even if they're suggesting that instead of the district offices, we should, EC should create more centers for persons to be registered. It's a fantastic idea. And we, in the consequences, we know the implications of that. Of course, a district office is at one place, but where people will come from to come and register may be far from the district office. In which case, satellite offices can be created. And I don't see this as a major issue that we think that because of this, 
the EC should not be allowed to leave ECI. I don't see it as a major issue. And as I said, Mr. Speaker, this is unprecedented because we hear our colleagues saying that they will not allow the EC to lay the CI. It's a very dangerous statement for anybody to make. Does it mean that, does it mean that for now, any institution which wants to bring this CI to this house, if we don't agree to the CI, they will not let the CI be laid? The rules, the constitution provides that if a CI is laid, if it's referred to the committee in charge of that particular instrument. And if the committee even is not in favor of that CI being laid, it is reports to us here. And if two thirds, we should read that, is it the constitution? If two thirds are able to reject that CI, that is the end of the matter. If two thirds are not able to reject it, the CI is passed. Anybody who is not happy with this situation would have to go to court. You go to the Supreme Court to challenge why that instrument should not stand. And since July, we appear to be creating a person to the world that the EC will not be allowed to lay its instrument in this house. We should not tread that part. Honorable. That part will not help us. Honorable Mr. That Honorable. part will create chaos. Mr. Speaker, to take the chair. <laughs> Honorable Obi Amwa. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. He is not members of Parliament who allow a CI or an LI or a paper or petition to be laid in the House. He is not members of Parliament. He is a Speaker. Yes. Why you be referring to this? There's history to it. 1994, I was a chairman of the Subsidiary Legislation Committee. Because of the nature of the constitutional provision, I led the House to reject an ally presented by the Minister of Trade and Industry. That is where it started. I started looking at pre-laying discussions with stakeholders. That's 1994. Since then, it has never happened again. I was the chairman in 1994. The first chairman was the Honorable Kobia, Francis Kobia. A few months, he was made a minister. Then Honorable Cletus Avoka took over. A few months, he was made a deputy minister. Then I took over. That is what happened. That is why we decided to do the pre-laying consultations. This one is quite extensive now. We have expanded the frontiers. And please, the public is so much interested in this matter that we have to guide them to understand what is happening, so that at the end of the day, they accept the decision, not only of the House, but of the state institutions, so that we can have a credible, peaceful elections in this country. It's a very important instrument, a very important subject matter. So I expect us to have some cool heads in this matter. Please, you may continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree with you perfectly. And you have stated it here, that you are the only one who can allow an instrument to be laid. You have stated it here. I'm saying that some members, some of our members, go on air, go everywhere to say, make such statements. And it's a very dangerous thing to do, that we will not allow the CI to be laid, because we don't like what the EC wants to do. That's the point I'm making, Mr. Speaker. That's the point I'm making. That that thing should not be allowed, should not be countenanced. That persons can go out, and members of parliament indeed, can just sit on air and say that we will not allow the CI to be laid. It's a very dangerous precedent. And you have clarified the situation. And I'm saying that 
As chairman of Central Legislation Committee, we in 94, I was chairman from 2013. And we allowed free lane because it's helpless a lot. Otherwise, it's late, there's a flaw, and we get it, it has to be withdrawn. And we've seen some in this. When Minority leader. It was the majority leader. He had to well, he had to draw a CI in this house. Because it was flawed. Just to give the history to it. The most critical thing now is that part of the budget committee. The budget committee wants special budget committee wants to be assured that one the NI sufficient funds to be able to complete the exercise uh, as far as the Ghana card is concerned, so that the electoral commission also register persons mainly with the Ghana card. I would want to say that given the issues which have been raised in this report, the two institutions as they appear before us, the committee of the whole, some of these issues will come up. But that conception should not be countenanced. And indeed, we have any power authority, especially as members of the floor, to reject, not reject, to prevent the CI from being laid. As I speak of these viewers, I want to commend the Special Budget Committee for the thorough work that they've done and for the attempts they are making to have this matter resolved. Because as we heard from Munabu uh, Haruna, my good friend, um, immediate past minority leader, immediate past minority leader, as, okay, okay, I am outgoing senior deputy minister. I'm outgoing. As we heard from Onabu Haruna, the registration process is being delayed because of this so-called lockdown. The EC wants to have a new CI so that those who have attained the age of 18 or never registered could be registered. At the end of this year, there will be this level elections. And we are expected to address these issues so that a CI will be laid. It goes to the 21 sitting days. If two thirds of members don't reject, it becomes a law. Then we move on. As you said, I think that we should all agree to find a solution to this issue. But we should not stampede the EC or threaten the EC that we want to have our way when indeed the law and the constitution doesn't give us that authority. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, let's now listen to Honorable Eric Opoku. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to the motion before this house. Mr. Speaker, as earlier speakers have already alluded to, there is no constitutional instrument before this house. But the Electoral Commission, some time ago, engaged the Subsidiary Legislation Committee. And Mr. Speaker, I am a member of the committee uh, in a pre laying meeting. Mr. Speaker, in that meeting, we discussed the draft constitutional instrument. And a number of issues came out from that discussion. The major issue that came up has to do with the intention of the Electoral Commission to use the Ghana card as the only means of identification for eligible Ghanaian citizens to have their names on the electoral roll. Mr. Speaker, we asked a number of persons, including whether the Electoral Commission can provide evidence in respect of the number of Ghanaians 
who have access to the NIA card. Mr. Speaker, as the report rightly captures, the EC indicated that from the NIA, 16,654,000 Ghanaians have been registered. But 3.3 million Ghanaians who have registered have not been issued a card. And Mr. Speaker, they indicated to us that out of the 16 million they are talking about, some of them are non-citizens. And some of them are minors. They have not attained the voting age of 18. So the 16 million figure that they gave us included all those people. And that is rightly captured in this report. Mr. Speaker, then we those Ghanaians who have attained the age uh, the voting age, if all of them are not having the national identification card, and you use that as the only means for qualification, then is it not a way of denying eligible Ghanaians, some eligible Ghanaians, their right to vote in this country? That was the bone of contention. And after the meeting, whatever transpired was communicated to leadership of this house. It was based on this that the business committee referred this matter to the special budget committee for them to clarify the matters, to assuage the fears of members of parliament as well as the Ghanaian public. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to note that this report before us is a fair report. Mr. Speaker, it's a careful and well thought out report that reflects the sentiments of all of us here in Assembly. And Mr. Speaker, indeed the conclusions are logical. The conclusions are also fair. And I want to I want to highlight an important point made in the conclusion. That probably settles the matter. Mr. Speaker, the report says that conclusion of page eleven, I read. However, the committee would like to stress that it will not accept and will reject any effort that is geared towards making the EC use the Ghana card as the only medium to qualify a person who is eligible to vote in 2024 elections. So the report signed by the leader of the House, the Minister for Parliamentary Affairs, is saying that they will never accept any arrangement and they will reject by whatever means any attempt by the EC to use only the Ghana card as a means of qualifying eligible Ghanaian citizens to vote in this country. Mr. Speaker, that is the issue that we have been raising. And so after adopting the, the report, this becomes the position of this House. The Parliament of Ghana is saying that Electoral Commission, we will not allow you to provide a law that says that only the Ghana card can be used to qualify eligible Ghanaian citizens to have their names on the electoral rule. Mr. Speaker, this is what we have been looking for. And that is why I described the report as a fair report. Mr. Speaker, when you read the report, the EC indicated that this act decision was taken based on assurance that the EC had from the NIA that by the time we get to 2024, they would have captured a sizable percentage of the voting population. But when you go further, the report says that the, com the committee discussed with the EC what transpired at a meeting held between the Constitutional Legal and Parliamentary Affairs Committee and the NIA. In that meeting, the NIA highlighted a number of challenges hindering their ability to discharge the mandate bestowed on them. One of the challenges highlighted in the report has to do with budgetary constraints. And then they also talk about lack of offices and registration centers. The NIA is also talking about inaccessible network in some parts of the country. They are also talking about lack of power supply in many areas. They also talk about bad road networks. 
And Mr. Speaker, most importantly, they talk about travel distances. Travel distances. People have to travel to the centers from far away places. And the cost involved in some cases is unbearable. They talk about lack of basic equipment. And then vehicles. Vehicles. They don't have vehicles for their staff to even travel to where the people are located. So due to these challenges, the NIA is unable to speed up the processes of getting everybody enrolled on the National Identification Card. And that is the reason why uh, everybody who has the right to vote is not yet in possession of the card. It is for this reason that the committee, the Special Budget Committee, reporting to this House that in order not to disenfranchise any Ghanaian in the 2024 elections, the Electoral Commission will not be allowed the Electoral Commission will not be allowed to pass any law, to cause any law to be passed in this country that will use only the Ghana card as the means for identifying qualified citizens to have their names on the road. Mr. Speaker, this uh, is... Uh, Honourable Member, before you go on, the Electoral Commission doesn't pass laws. It's this house. So don't try to shift any blame on Electoral Commission. They are to do their work and present it to us. We pass or we decide not to pass. Let this be known to Ghanaians. If anything goes wrong, it's this house that will be held responsible, not Electoral Commission. That one, there is no pretense here and I will not be part of it. That is why this exercise is being conducted. And we have to take it serious. Please. This one is life and death. We have moved away from that African practice of ballot and bullets. I don't know how many of you have read that article. Ballots and bullets. That is election in Africa. We have moved away from that in Ghana. And so, Ghanaians are looking up to us. Don't let anybody go and misinform the public that this one is once again a political game between MPP and NDC. No. This is serious national business. A basic fundamental human right. So let's get it right. Don't blame Electoral Commission at all. Don't blame NIA. It's this house. Now you can go on. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, even the 16 million figure that the NIA is churning out, Mr. Speaker, this House needs to probe those figures. Because they have reported that in the Kintampo uh, municipality, they have captured over 57,000 people. Our, our checks from that office indicate that a little above 12,000 people have been captured. Mr. Speaker, our checks from the district officers indicate that, as we speak, some of the cars are in the offices. Because during the mass registration, when they deployed the resources to the rural communities, people registered, but they were not issued their cars instantly. They were asked to go and come for their cars. When they went back to the centers, they were told that they should go to the desert capital. Those who had the means to travel to those centers went and they got theirs. Many of these cars are locked up in the desert offices. People cannot even go there. They don't even know whether their cars are there to even go and collect them. And so there's a real difficulty. There's a real difficulty. And so, Mr. Speaker, we have a duty to safeguard the democracy that we have practiced for almost 30 years now. Just yesterday, Mr. Speaker, this House celebrated 30 years of parliamentary democracy. And I listened to your speech. I listened to the speech of Majority Leader as well as that of Minority Leader. We are all proud to, have, to be associated with that enviable feat, having chalked, having been chalked for this nation. 
But Mr. Speaker, what we have to do is to put in place mechanisms to protect this enviable uh, feat we have talked for ourselves. The only thing we have to do, and which is critical, is never to allow the electoral processes to be compromised or to be tempered in favor of one political party. That perception must be, er er must be erased completely from the minds of Ghanaians so that the sanctity of the process will be protected, will be restored, and Ghanaians will always expect that whatever happens at the end of the post reflects the opinions of Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker, on this note, I will urge this House to adopt this report that the House is ever not to allow and to reject any attempt by anybody in this country to use only the Ghana card to qualify Ghanaians to have their names on the letter room. Mr. Speaker, as you rightly said, this is not a matter of NDC MPP. This is a report signed by the majority leader, Honorable Oseche Mensa, recommending to this House, he is the leader of the majority caucus. He's the leader of government business in this House. And he's the Minister of Parliamentary Affairs. And he signs a report recommending to the House for adoption that the House will not allow and the House should be ready to reject any attempt by the Electoral Commission to introduce anything to this House to the effect that we should use only Ghana uh, card to, as a means of adaptation to have Ghanaians register. Mr. Speaker, with this few comments, Mr. Speaker, with these few comments, uh, I, I support the motion and recommend that the House approve and adopt this as the as the decision of this house. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honourable members, I don't think we have to continue to belabor this point. If you will not disagree with me, I will just ask the leaders to make their submissions. Then we go to the next, because there's another motion also on the same thing. And then you have to have a meeting, a committee of the whole, to discuss this same issue today. All this today. If you want us to continue to call more members, then I'll reduce your time. Five minutes each is two, two. Two each. No, 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 no. The motion was moved by uh, Honorable uh, Majority Chief Whip, and seconded by Honorable Haruna Idrisu, and then went back to Honorable Obi Amwa, and then came back to Honorable Eric Opoku. Yes, yeah, so now I wanted the leaders. Then after that, we can adopt the report, then move to the next motion. That is my proposal. Yes. Right, Honorable Speaker, I agree with you that we need to manage the time. But, Mr. Speaker, as you originally said, this is a very, very serious issue. Uh, you gave an option. Uh, the second option was to reduce the time uh, to five minutes each. I would prefer, uh, if my colleagues will agree, that the rest of the speakers speak for five minutes uh, whilst we wait for the leadership. That will be uh, the middle position that will be helpful to all of us as a speaker. Speaker, unfortunately, I couldn't be with you at the preceding meeting. Indeed, this motion and the one following after that are underpinned by the same principle. And indeed, if I had been around, I would have canvassed the idea that we made the two motions. So that if we were to have five speakers from either side, we could, we could have done it. I don't see the distinction that we are, we are, we are, we are making. The speaker, 
So if if we could perhaps bring the other motion on board, fair and fine. Otherwise, I will plead that we bring this first one to a conclusion by allowing the minority leader or his representative to close that chapter and then we'll move to the other one. I think that is that is better than going on this tangent. Like the leader has said, in structuring a debate, you give the legal, even when you know the people are five, you give the legal aspect to one or two persons. Then you give the political aspect to another person. Then you give the socio-economic aspect to another person. That's how grips we structure debates. So if you know from the beginning, we could have gone by this, but we didn't know. So you gave us list, and we structured, as we are speaking now, those who are here to speak have their very area. Their so if you can reduce the time, which will be a middle lane, then we can give short, short time for the legal aspect, the socioeconomic aspect, and the other aspect. Honorable members, five minutes each. Five minutes each. The leaders, ten minutes each. So I move on to Honorable Mama Yarga, five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh... Please, please go on. Don't worry. I will handle it. Please go on. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think the issues are straightforward. Fundamentally, the issue is about whether or not the Electoral Commission should pass a constitutional instrument that imposes an unreasonable an unreasonable restraint on the rights of eligible voters to be registered to vote. The other issues have been addressed, so I'll focus on just two. One is, I participated in a briefing session involving the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. And at that briefing session, she indicated that the fundamental consideration driving the decision to abolish the use of the guarantor system is that it has been subjected to abuse. And so they want to move away from the guarantor system and rely entirely on the Ghana card. Mr. Speaker, at that meeting, I had cause to draw the attention of the Electoral Commission Chairperson to the National Identification Register Act, because the National Identification Register Act prescribes how the register is compiled and what information is to be captured and how that information is to be proven. Mr. Speaker, I was surprised at that meeting to realize that the Electoral Commission itself did not realize that the National Identification Authority, which initially operated under the uh, Act 5750 and which did not provide for the use of the guarantor system, found out that it was almost impossible and difficult for them to do their job if they did not include a guarantor system. So they came to this parliament and sought an amendment to the National Identity Register Act in the National Identity Register Amendment Act of 2017, Act 950. And in Section 8 of it, they amended, in Section 3, they amended Section 8 of the principal enactment and included the use of guarantor system. So if you read the amendment to the National Identity Register Act, it says that Section 8 is being amended by B, by the substitution of subsection 2 of 2 
where an applicant is unable to submit any of the documents specified under subsection A, the authority shall require A, a relative of the applicant to identify the applicant under oath. B, two persons determined by the board to identify the applicant under oath where the applicant has no known relatives. So I ask the chairperson, you are running away from your register on grounds of the abuse of the guarantor system and you are running to embrace somebody's register. And yet that person whose register you are running to embrace is also including the guarantor system. So what is the basis of your principle? The sole document where you are going to, to use is also based on the same guarantor system. So, so, so what, 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 is the, what is the logic of what you are doing? And Mr. Speaker, I was surprised because that day it appeared that the members did not know that the National Identification Authority had come to amend their law to include a guarantor system. So, Mr. Speaker, if the fundamental issue here is the likelihood of the abuse of the guarantor system, then the Commission should know that the document that they are seeking to rely on is also based on the guarantor system. So, 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 so what is the basis? There's really no basis. Mr. Speaker, and it is unfair to those who are turning 18 between the last registration exercise and the next election for us to insist that they must have a Ghana card before they are registered. Mr. Speaker, there is a more fundamental constitutional argument. We know that the Labour Commission has the constitutional power to pass CIs regulating elections. But they must be guided by their fundamental obligation under the Constitution, which is that every Ghanaian who is 18 years of age and above and of sound mind is entitled entitled to be registered. The Labour Commission is not doing them a favor. And it is the duty of the Labour Commission to establish that they are 18 years and above and they are citizens of Ghana. There are several source documents establishing their nationality. You cannot restrict it to just one source document. The Ghana card is beautiful. It makes work easy for everybody. But it is just one document that can, one doc tool that can be used to establish the nationality of a person. You cannot insist that it must be the sole instrument that should be used. So, Mr. Speaker, we are pleading with our colleagues, we are pleading with the Electoral Commission that they should not undermine the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, they themselves and subsequently will be debating the report on the the National Identification Authority, and you can see that if the National Identification Authority also admits that they have challenges. So let's start it gradually. Let's just have it in the law that if you have a Ghana card, they should register you. And in future, many years later, when we are all convinced, in fact, it might not even be necessary, because even if we are convinced, once we put it in our law, it becomes unconstitutional because we are impeding and restricting the rights of eligible uh, honorable voters. Honorable I'll give you six minutes. I think it's more than enough. Mr. Speaker, I have actually made my point. That yes. they are moving away. Pardon? I agree with you. You have made your point. So yes, I'm saying that they are, they, they are moving away from the guarantor system and going to use a Ghana card, which is also based on the guarantor system. Right. That, that fundamentally is a logic that I'm waiting for them to explain to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honorable members, we now listen to Honorable Amiyao Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to speak to the report of the Special Budget Committee. Mr. Speaker, there have been issues about the intended CI, the 
Electoral Commission wanted to introduce in the House, which it laid before the subsidiary legislation committee for purposes of pre-laying discussions. Mr. Speaker, registration has been with us from the onset of the Fourth Republic. We even started it in 1988-89 before the district assembly elections in 89 and 90. Over the years, there have been progressive developments in our registration. We all recall that the first elections that we had in this country in 1992, we had opaque ballot boxes. We had ID cards that did not have photographs on them. Eventually, we graduated, we have transparent ballot boxes, we have ID cards that are even biometric, biometric. So, election after election, registration after registration, new concepts and ideas are introduced to uh, upgrade our electoral system. Mr. Speaker, there is no denying the fact that every day somebody turns 18. So when we do periodic registration and we go off and we hold elections, people who turn 18 between the cutoff point of the registration and the election can also be said to have been denied the opportunity to register and vote. So if the Electoral Commission is introducing a new system whereby people who turn 18 or who did not have the opportunity to register in a previous registration exercise register on a continuous basis, I think it's a good thing we must all work on. And it's one of the reforms the Electoral Commission seeks to introduce with the new CI it intends to introduce in this House. Mr. Speaker, if we are going to do continuous registration the current legal framework tells us or gives opportunity to political parties to have agents at the registration centers for purposes of identifying people who are not eligible to register. If we are going to have continuous registration in the offices of the Electoral Commission, I doubt if 365 days or 366 days, all the political parties are going to have representatives as if they are permanent workers of the Electoral Commission. So we will need a source document that is more credible. So even in the absence of political party representation at the district's offices, registration can go on and we'll all continue to have faith in the system or the process. Mr. Speaker, we should not assume or pretend that registration has never occurred at district offices before. It has happened before, in the past, where the Electoral Commission limited registration exercises to the district offices. We all complied. 
and the people came from their towns and the, their various areas to register. But for the Electoral Commission even to say that registration will happen in the district offices, they haven't said that it is to the exclusion of moving even into the electoral areas for people to assess the registration. And of course, Mr. Speaker, if we are using the Ghana card, <laughs> there will be no need for uh, uh, the guarantor system and for even objections that accompany the registrations that we have done over the period. Mr. Speaker, I listened to Honorable Harinusu very well, and one of the issues that he raised is about the use of the Ghana card and the fact that the NIA reports to the Ministry of Interior. Mr. Speaker, if we use if we use the passport, the passport office reports to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Wouldn't that also be an issue? If we use driver's license, Ministry of Transport. So whatever source document you want to use, you will link it to a particular ministry. Then we better don't do registration because you have issue with anything that you want to use and so i think what we need to do is the assurance and the from the ec that they will act right they will act right and then we can move on with it mr speaker as uh, the has been said the figures whether 16 point something million, 17 million, will have the opportunity to meet the two institutions, NIA and the Electoral Commission. They will be able to update us with current figures. And then if we are assured that the figures are good, and many Ghanaians, a very reasonable number of Ghanaians have been enrolled onto the Ghana card. Then we can proceed with uh, the process or the new thinking by the Electoral Commission. Mr. Speaker, I want to conclude. And by so doing, I want to look at page 11 of the document, which my brother, Honorable Eric Poco, referred to. And I think. His interpretation was a bit uh, swayed to support what he was saying. I, I was trying to give you the same time as that of uh, Honorable Mama Yarga, but you are adding some more seconds. Uh, I, I want to be consistent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. All that I want to say in conclusion is that if you look at page 11, paragraph 4, it says, it is clear that unless and until the challenges confronting the issuance of the Ghana card are dealt with using the Ghana card as the only medium of voter registration would negatively impact on the electoral rule and thereby deny some otherwise qualified persons from registering to vote. So if the challenges are addressed, what will be your issue? That's what I'm saying. If the challenges with the issuance of the Ghana card have been addressed or are addressed, then there will be no issue to challenge the laying of the CI or the, issue, the use of the Ghana card as a sole source document for registration. I'm most grateful, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Honorable members, we now listen to Honorable Mathieu Opoku Prempe.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you spent time to bring an understanding to an issue that has consequences for Ghana. But listening to colleagues, reading a report, I ask myself, what is this report seeking to do? Does this report help the debate out there? And does this report bring peace in the country? Mr. Speaker, I've come to the realization that anybody who picks up this report would interpret the report in the way he or she prefers. Mr. Speaker, why do I say that? The Honorable Member Eric Opoku, who spoke previously, quoting copious amounts of this document, really got it wrong. Because what he read and how he interpreted it, Mr. Speaker, was fundamentally wrong. There has never been an occasion since 1992 that any registration process of the EC has not disenfranchised Ghanaians in the true interpretation of the word. There has never been an occasion in this country since 1992 where all district registration centers or registration centers have been 100% coterminous with police centers. The speaker, or at every time, we in Ghana have tried to get the best possible way to bring peace during election. And the conduct of our leaders post-elections have also engendered peace in this country. Mr. Speaker, what my brother quoted and I wanted to quote, again, the committee would like to emphasize that it has no objection, Mr. Speaker, listen, the committee would like to emphasize that it has no objection against the EC using the NIA card to embark on the registration of eligible voters. Mr. Speaker, if you don't go on, if you don't go on to read further down, Mr. Speaker, you would have come again, Mr. Speaker, the simple advice you gave my brothers on the other side don't want to. What I'm saying is that if somebody reads this paragraph and doesn't go on further to read the second the paragraph of that, it, it depicts it depicts a committee that is siding with the Electoral Commission. In fact, Mr. Speaker, from the preceding paragraphs, the Electoral Commission had explained that its position it has taken has been agreed at IPAC. Mr. Speaker, if you go to the paragraph after, it says, however, the committee would like to stress that it will not accept, Mr. Speaker, listen carefully, it will not accept and would reject any effort that is geared towards making the EC use the Ghana card as the only medium to qualify a person who is eligible to vote. Mr. Speaker, it is very interesting if you read it. They are talking about using Ghana card, the committee, in the voting, not registration. So when you sit as a committee and you come out with a report, it will reflect the debate we are going to have here. Nowhere has the committee said they disagree with the Electoral Commission in using Ghana card for registration. What my brother quoted and what is written in the document are totally different. They are talking about eligibility to vote and what really he is seeking to do is about eligibility to register. Registration and voting are different issues. Never in this country has an ID card been a prerequisite for voting. On day of voting, every Ghanaian who attends finds his name in the register is eligible to vote. No card has ever barred anybody from voting in this country. So, Speaker, I would first like to caution that committee members, when they are bringing reports to this House, must do a better job than this. 
Why are we allowing ourselves to fight when the report that you have brought is totally different from the debate you are doing here? Because you don't read. That is our basic problem. The committee, yes, and I insist on it, the committee is talking about Ghana, the use of Ghana card as an eligibility to vote. The committee never reported the speaker to yourself about a confusion about using Ghana card as an eligibility to register. And I dare say the laws in the country for registration. Why did I interrupt you? Mr. Speaker. You are. Mr. Speaker, if my brother. Mr. Speaker. Yes, a minute. Yes. I will take the time, you know, I'm noting. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Mr. Speaker, the honorable colleague. Speak to the mic. The honorable colleague is saying something, is misinterpreting the report. Mr. Speaker, when you read down, the report says, with your indulgence, I read, it is clear that unless and until the challenges confronting the issuance of the Ghana card are dealt with, using the Ghana card as the only medium of voter registration will negatively impact on the electoral role and thereby deny some otherwise qualified persons from registering to vote. That is the yes. So it's very clear. So please, take your time to read. Mr. Speaker. Yes, please, go on. Mr. Speaker, he has even made it worse. If, if you have not opened your mouth, you would have left people in doubt. But opening your mouth again has removed all that that you don't understand what you are reading. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I again emphasize, I read it. Qualification and eligibility to register is never the same as eligibility to vote. In this country, we have never, never ever said if you are going to vote, you need a card. What he even read now, Mr. Speaker, makes it worse. All the committee said, all the committee said, what well, it might impact negatively. The committee never went on and said that because of that, the electoral commission should not bring the CR. That is what I'm saying that when you are writing reports, you should do a better and a more diligent job. This, this report, Mr. Speaker, this Mr. Speaker, is so flawed that I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why. The majority leader, I don't know why the majority, I don't know why the majority leader even appended the signature. Mr. Speaker, all I want to say is that we should proceed. Uh, well, I, I, I'll give you yes. one more minute. Don't worry. I, I'll give you, I'll give you one more minute. Let me listen to the minority chief. Right, right honorable speaker. My good friend, the... Majority Leader, you will have your time to, to take him on. Don't worry. My good friend, the minister responsible for energy, was flowing and everybody was following him. I take very strong exception to the fact that he's saying a report authored and signed by the leader of this house is not fit for purpose. He used words like they should do a better job before they write reports. And I ask him to withdraw that, that portion of his statement that the minority, majority leader did a bad job with the report. He must withdraw that portion of the statement. That is the leader of the house and your leader as well. Withdraw that portion of the your statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there we go again. The same words he has used, he doesn't understand. The same words he has just used, he doesn't understand. Mr. Speaker, people should restrain themselves from being happy with what they are saying but thinking through what they are saying. Mr. Speaker, what I said, that this report and the misinterpretation sites are giving to paragraphs they are reading means that the report is not clear. That's all I'm saying. If we are going to produce reports to bring to this house, that is not clear, and it's misrepresented by who is speaking, then we are doing ourselves a disfavor. That is why I'm saying that if the minority on, leader... Honourable member... I'm not too sure you yourself, 
you are listening to yourself. Your earlier submissions was to the effect that the report was so clear that it's rather people who are misreading and misinterpreting the report. Now you are saying that the report is not clear and you even doubted why the whole majority leader appended his signature to the report. And the ways you use that, they say no, it's offensive to our leader. Withdraw that and apologize. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in order not to cause more problems, I withdraw that and apologize. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I am saying that you, we will hear very soon in this house, we will hear very soon in this house, that two paragraphs quoted by my honorable friend is still is being misrepresented. That's why I'm saying that if the Electoral Commission is coming here on continuous voter registration, then this report, because they are not doing a new register, then this report cannot stop the Electoral Commission from bringing it. If they are not going to, if the Electoral Commission is not compiling a new register, then this report cannot stop them from bringing a CI. And that's why I was saying, if that is the intent of the committee, then they should have been clearer. Because this report doesn't say that. So I'm all I'm saying is that the committee might have, might have met the Electoral Commission. They might have listened to the Electoral Commission. But the, um, this total report does not support the position and the conclusion that is being made. Because the issue was about eligibility to vote. Because when we quote him as about the registration, the committee never said that if the Electoral Commission was going to go ahead with that CR, then this committee should reject. It said there will be a negative impact. And I'm saying that since 1992, every registration, every voting has had some negative effect on somebody. But Ghana hasn't bent because of that, because of the leadership we have exercised. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just because you are my son, I gave you more minutes. You know, um, I've, I've totally repented. From today, I'm still your son, and it's going to be even better. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we also have what we call prodigal son, so I understand. Um, can we now listen to Honorable Dominic Akurutinga Ayini? Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to the debate on this motion before this Honorable House. Mr. Speaker, if I were sitting in judgment over this matter, I would have simply said that I have nothing more useful to add to the erudite arguments of my learned brother, the Honorable Mahama Yarga of Boku Central Faith. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member for Boku Central nailed the issues. He put a nail in the coffin of this attempt to amend the law in order to bring this uh, CI. Mr. Speaker, arguments have been made in this House to the effect that this House cannot prevent the Electoral Commission from bringing an instrument to lay here. Mr. Speaker, that is the correct position of the law. And it was, it was first articulated by the Honorable Member for Mfutu, the Honorable Deputy Majority Leader. I agree in total with him. But Mr. Speaker, what they conveniently leave out is the fact that we have a gatekeeping role as the Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. And that gatekeeping role, Mr. Speaker, is in Article 11, 7 of the Constitution of the Republic. The Honorable Obi Amwa, when he made his arguments, he made his submissions, was very clear that whenever an instrument is laid, we in this House cannot change the instrument. We can change the substantive content of the instrument. 
However, we have an opportunity to annul it in accordance with Article 117 of the Constitution. Well, Mr. Speaker, we need to test majority of this House to annul it. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, the convention of having the bill laying, which, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to learn today that you were part of the history making for that pre laying uh, you know, um, convention. But, Mr. Speaker, our gatekeeping role is further stated in the standing orders of this House. And, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I would want to quote Standing Order 166 of the Standing Orders. Mr. Speaker, Standing Order 1663 says that after an order, rule, or regulation is laid before the House, the committee, that is the Committee on Subsidiary Legislation, in particular, shall consider a number of things. I want to uh, emphasize two of them. One is that they must consider whether or not the instrument accords with the general objects of the Constitution or an act passed by Parliament. And then another is, I want to quote that one verbatim. It says, whether it appears to make some unusual or unexpected use of the powers conferred by the Constitution or the act pursuant to which it is made. Mr. Speaker, we are not yet debating the substantive content of the instrument. I am sure we will have an opportunity to do that if it is ever laid before this Honorable House. Then, Mr. Speaker, I have had the opportunity at the pre-laying session to examine its substantive content. And I take the view, preliminarily, that it does not accord with the objects of the Constitution. That's the first thing. Secondly, I think that the Electoral Commission in this matter is seeking to exercise its power in an unusual and unexpected way. Mr. Speaker, what is an unusual exercise of power? Constitutional, I mean, power. Mr. Speaker, will remember uh, our first year jurisprudence and uh, Professor Gordon Woodman's distinction between the lawyer's law and the sociologist's law. The lawyer's law is a black letter law as stated in the Constitution. The sociologist's law is the law in practice. What we on this side of the House is pointing out to the people of this country and to our colleagues in the majority is that as far as the sociologist's law is concerned, this is going to be a very bad precedent. Mr. Speaker, when there is a, a substantial deviation between the lawyer's law and the sociologist law, then there is an unusual exercise of constitutional power. So, for instance, in the case of uh, Pru East, my honorable colleague, the honorable member for Pru East, just gave me the evidence. With respect to registration of the NIA in his constituency, Mr. Speaker, this is very important. He said the total registered, as he has found out, is 17,992. Total cards issued, 13,433. Total yet to issue, 2,148. And then yet to print is 2,410. So, Mr. Speaker, you will see that except those who have been issued with a card and are holding their card in their hand. If elections were held today, about 4,000 and over people in Pru East will not have the right to vote. Mr. Speaker, that, that in and of itself, no, on, yes, on the register is 44,000. The point is that the deviance between those who are, have been accorded the right to vote because they are holding the card and those who have not been given the right to vote because they have been denied the card is very, very significant statistically. So, Mr. Speaker, that is an unusual or unexpected exercise of constitutional power. Mr. Speaker, when the Electoral Commission came before the Subsidiary Legislation Committee, I asked them one fundamental question. I said, what mischief are you supposed, are you going to cure 
with this amendment? What mischief? And they said, basically the same thing that the Honorable Mahama Yerga said, that the guarantor system is subject to abuse. And so I asked them in my capacity as chairman that they should bring the evidence of the abuse to convince the committee that the system is actually being abused. Mr. Speaker, the first evidence that they brought showed only that in the entire re period of registration, only four persons, Mr. Speaker, four persons were caught abusing the system. Four. Out of 17 million, 29,908 I mean, persons registered by the Electoral Commission during that registration period, only four were caught, prosecuted, and convicted, Mr. Speaker. So four out of 17 million is the reason why we are coming to change the law. So I asked for better and better particulars, Mr. Speaker. And then what did they do? Mr. Speaker, they went and brought evidence again to back what they, what they, they had given me. They are giving, they are, they are giving the committee. And the evidence they brought was a statistical table, Mr. Speaker. A statistical table. I don't want to impugn the integrity of the commission and its staff, but the statistical table said that out of the entire 17 million, over 17 million registered voters, it was only 15,474 representing, they didn't do this, I mean, the mass. I did the mass myself with the help of uh, the Honorable Kodo, representing 0.09% of the total number of registered persons. 0.09%. Mr. Speaker, this is highly insignificant. Why are we here debating this issue and we are going to expend taxpayers' resources in, in doing a registration that is totally unnecessary? Mr. Speaker, in Ransom France and Attorney General, my, my, my uh, the former chairman of subsidiary legislation, the Honorable Obi Amwa. Mr. Speaker, he was with me in that case when I wrote an amicus brief that won the case. And in that case, the Supreme Court was very clear that the EC does not need a, 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 a constitutional instrument in order to exercise its power. In this case, we are not even confronted with we are not even confronted with a situation where they have no constitutional instrument. We have since 2016, since 2016, we have the uh, CI 91 and we have CI 126, Mr. Speaker. Gazetted. And under these instruments, continuous registration can take place. So why is it, Mr. Speaker, that we are calling upon this House to pass the, I mean, the, the new instrument in order to enable them to undertake continuous registration? Mr. Speaker, I would want to conclude by saying that if the, mat, if the thing is not broke, you don't fix it. If the, mat, the thing is not broke, don't fix it. The Electoral Commission has not convinced this House that the current law is a broken system. We don't need to fix it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Right. Honorable Afenio Markin is the next. Mr. Speaker, um, thank you for the opportunity to add my voice to the debate on the floor. Mr. Speaker, I must emphasize that on the 27th of February, 2015, the Supreme Court delivered a decision in a matter of Benjamin E. Mason. Benjamin Ehimane services at Electoral Commission with Attorney General as a second defendant. The Speaker, this was suit number J1-11-2015. The Supreme Court stated correctly the position of the law that the Electoral Commission, for the purpose of exercising the mandate under the Constitution, is required to proceed with a constitutional instrument. It was a reason why 
the 10 district assembly elections had to be postponed for a new CI to be laid. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, in arriving at that conclusion, the Supreme Court had to resort to the hands out of this house. And that is why the debate of today is so dear to me that should there be any litigation, the court would want to rely on the submissions by us. And at the time, Mr. Speaker, we were in opposition and we argued. I'm happy the lawyers in the minority are now changing their position. I don't know whether you are a lawyer. Your position will change depending on which side of government you are. But, Mr. Speaker, the Deputy Attorney General then, <laughs> Honorable Dr. Dominic Ayeni, argued that there was no such need for a new CI in the, on this floor. That's what he said. And went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, no, the Electoral Commission needed a CI for the purpose of public elections. So, Mr. Speaker, the point here is that the requirement to have a CI is constitutional. So nobody should mislead anybody. Nobody should mislead anybody into any misunderstanding of the correct position of the law. Mr. Speaker, again, Honorable Mahama Yerga, who misunderstood and misappreciated the law, had said that under the Electoral Commission's own enactment, there is a guarantor system. And same is found in the NIA law. What he failed to tell us is that under the EC system, there is no such requirement to do any deposition under oath. Mr. Speaker, that is the difference. And if you come to Act 750, under Act 750, Mr. Speaker, 750, Section 82, Section 82 provides that, Mr. Speaker, there is a requirement for the guarantor to do so under oath. And, Mr. Speaker, NI further came to do an amendment under Act 950, Mr. Speaker, the amended act, even expanded the system of guarantor where somebody apart from your parents, your MP or other persons, provided they can do so under oath. Mr. Speaker, what did they seek to achieve? All they wanted to do was to ensure that whoever did so, did so truthfully, unlike what we had under the EC system previously, where anybody at all could guarantee. And providing the guarantee, the person could choose to do so anyhow. Mr. Speaker, so the distinction is clear in the law. So nobody should mislead any of us. Mr. Speaker. Um, please, the Honorable Mr. Speaker, is free to, no problem. Yes. I, will, I yes. will take my seat. Yes, yes, sir. Mr. Speaker. The point that I sought to make is that the EC said their main reason for wanting to use only Ghana card, their main reason was that the guarantor system is subject to abuse. And I drew their attention to the fact that the NIA itself, which did not have a guarantor system has reverted to the use of a guarantor system even if it is with some qualifications. Even if it is with some qualifications. So why would they be running away from one guarantor system to another form of guarantor system? So Speaker, so address the question of a guarantor system no matter how structured. Unless you deny that the NIA system doesn't have any form of a guarantor system, then my response to them stands valid. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker.
Yes, please. He's made his case worse. In your, your in, in both submissions, you have, you have created an impression, okay, that the guarantor system in the health, in the, in the electoral commission law and that of the uh, National Identification Authority law, those guarantor systems are the same. They are not. Mr. Speaker, they are not. It, the, 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 Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I just don't get it. Mr. Speaker, I don't, don't get it. We listen to them in silence. What is that? Are you Democrats? We listen to you in silence. This is a legal argument. Listen. What is this? Because you are shouting. You don't respect the speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Electoral Commission said its guarantor system is subject to abuse because a person was not required to do so under oath. If you look at the Parent Act, and I want members to turn to the law because I have read it. Go to the Parent Act, Section 82 is there. The National Identification Authority again came back for the amendment. That amendment enhanced that earlier provision. And that amendment expanded it so that it is not only limited to your parents, so that Ghanaians will not be disenfranchised. So it shouldn't be said. It shouldn't be said by Honorable Ayaraga that the EC has said it could not fight for its own guarantor system. So why should it be that the NIA would also rely on the same guarantor system and EC would accept it. There's a difference. One, you do so freely. The second, you do so under oath. You are a lawyer. You know what is the difference between making a free statement and making a statement under oath. You know the difference. Mr. Speaker, my second point. The, in, in the argument of Honorable Harry Nedrisu, he referred to Article 42 of the Constitution. And Mr. Speaker again referred to Article 45 of the Constitution. And Mr. Speaker, he created the impression that the Electoral Commission had failed in its mandate because in 2021-2022, Ghanaians attained the age of 18 and the Electoral Commission failed to register them. That is not the correct constitutional provision he quoted. Mr. Speaker, if you read Article 45A, quote, the Electoral Commission shall have the following functions to compile the register of voters and revise it as such period as may be determined by law. Mr. Speaker, there is no such requirement, be it constitutional or through any enactment, that every year there must be a registration process. What the law says is that the Electoral Commission must ensure that it's registered within periods so that, Mr. Speaker, before there is any public election, EC should take steps to register qualified Ghanaians to vote. And this is done by an enactment. And that is a journey they have embarked on. Mr. Speaker, again, there is a provision that talks about a member qualifying to be elected as a member of parliament, a Ghanaian qualifying to be elected as a, as a member of parliament. The law does not say that you must be a registered voter before. It does not say so. So, Honorable so again, misled the Ghanaian public. The law talks about being qualified. You must qualify to be registered. And I think that matter was again dealt with in the Zanato case at the Supreme Court when she was challenged at the time that she was not a registered voter or so at the Colle Plote. And the matter was at the Supreme Court for determination. The court was clear. You must be qualified, not necessarily a registered voter. You must qualify. That is the law. But Honorable Harry Nedrusu said that you must be a registered voter. 
That is what he said. Please, you didn't pay attention. Mr. Speaker, so whatever we are seeking to do is to enable the Electoral Commission embark on a mandate required of them by law. Mr. Speaker, I, however, agree with the position taken by Honorable Harry Nadris that limiting registration at EC's district office will be very problematic. That I agree. This is not a new argument. This is an argument that, Mr. Speaker, the MPP raised in 2016 when we were in opposition. So, Mr. Speaker, just as we are pre-laying requirements, the pre-laying which allows discussions and amendments before the final laying of it, I believe that such discussions will lead to this provision being considered. That one should not be a problem. Mr. Speaker, in any event, whose business is it to make something difficult or less difficult? Mr. Speaker, in the year 2000, we had voter ID cards with on print, without pictures. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, at the time, I had, I was a student at UCC, where J.H. Mensah and Co. were saying, no vote, no photo ID, no vote. Eventually, Mr. Speaker, yes. No, it wasn't changed in 2000. In 2000, we voted with both the photo ID and the thumbprint ID. But when you are bound to win, you win. If you win, you win. <laughs> if you win, you win. Mr. Speaker, if you win, you win. So it is not this issue about somebody is trying to disenfranchise it. Mr. Speaker, the minority is creating an impression that it has set powers to deny a constitutional body its right to exercise its mandate. Who said, who said that you have that right to prevent EC from laying its here? Then it means you don't want the, the commission to do its work. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Agoja, Mr. Speaker, I want to draw attention to a matter. Honorable Agoja is a chief whip. He has sat on Honorable Collins down the seat and shouting across. Mr. Speaker, I don't think that is fair. Mr. Speaker, I don't think that is fair. So, Mr. Speaker, nobody, nobody is denying, nobody is denying any Ghanaian an opportunity to participate in the Judicial Assembly elections slated later in the year and in the 2024 elections. What we are doing is to ensure that qualified Ghanaians register so that our register will be a register of Ghanaians. All input we have, Mr. Speaker, we must forcefully may bring them on board so that the right things are done. Mr. Speaker, we should not get any impression. We should not get any impression that something untoward is being done. If you read, if you read the report of the committee, the co committee made very serious observations. And the EC explained that they are not compiling a new register. So, Mr. Speaker, the provision, there is an aspect that has been misconstrued at page 11. Page 11. Paragraph 2, I mean the second paragraph of page 11, which talks about Ghana card as the only medium to qualify a person who is eligible to vote in 2024 election. That the committee is saying that it is not going to allow easy to proceed on that path. What is trying to say, Mr. Speaker, is that for those of us who have already registered, we have other sort of documents that we use in registration. That cannot become otios. However, Going forward, it is expected that, Mr. Speaker, the requirements as expected will be respected. Mr. Speaker, it's as simple as that. I do not see how Honorable Atul Fawcett would have to be worried or any other member of Parliament would have to be worried that somebody is seeking to disenfranchise somebody. Where? Which constituency? Which region? And how does that prevent you from winning your election? Mr. Speaker, in the last elections, our colleagues made similar, I won't call it noise, came out with all manner of views. 
even on the registration, they say there was no such requirement to have registration. But when we eventually registered and we participated in the voting, you have your 137, which you are happy about, and then we won. You went to the Supreme Court, you could not produce your, 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 your pink sheets. How, how did the new registration that enabled Ghanaians to register, how did it affect you? So what became of all the Kula Balu, Mr. Speaker? What became of all the atmosphere that you poisoned, Mr. Speaker? If, as Democrats, if, as parliamentarians, we do not come together, and as Mr. Speaker, you said, this is a matter of our democracy is not NDC, it's not MPP. What we do not know, we don't have to say them. If the thing is not proper, you don't create a certain impression to undermine the democracy. Mr. Speaker, the minority leader is on the street. Uh, minority leader, I was trying to end his submission. What is it? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thought you gave us 10 minutes for leaders, but you spoke more than 10 minutes. I just wanted to... Sorry? Mr. Speaker, you gave us 10 minutes. 10 minutes. And he's been speaking on his feet for far more than that. So I thought I should draw your attention to the fact that you gave us time to speak with him. Actually, you realize that even though I stated five minutes per person, I went beyond that. Because the issues being raised are so germane and important that I found it difficult to stop members. So I gave, for example, Honorable Mama Yaga seven. I gave his counterpart here seven, 30 seconds. I gave others eight. You know, because they were making very good points. So when it comes to your turn and you are in full flight, I can't stop you at 10. It will be difficult because the second motion, we're actually truncating it to about 2-2, two, two, not 5-5 five, five again. And then we can then do the um, uh, committee of the whole. The electoral commission, the NIA, they've been here the whole day. We haven't even given them water, we haven't given them nothing, just like you seated here. So, we are all concerned. Please, wind up, wind up, so that we can move on. Mr. Speaker, thank you for ruling him out of order. Honorable Minority Leader, next time when you want to rise up, you should rise on a proper point of order, not to obstruct and disrupt my thoughts of argument. Mr. Speaker, I shall conclude by submitting that this CI is necessary for the purpose of the limited registration. We must put, make our inputs. We must make our inputs, which input will strengthen what has already been submitted. Mr. Speaker, we should aim at ensuring that all those who are qualified to vote register, participate in the limited registration exercise. And to educate our people, we should not, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we should not split heads over this. And I believe that if the right information is ferried across to the populace, our democracy will be guaranteed. But for now, the attempt by some members of parliament to poison the atmosphere, Mr. Speaker, should not in any way be entertained or encouraged. Mr. Speaker, I do not understand that the same argument that the NDC made in support of the Electoral Commission, today, they are making the same argument against them. Mr. Speaker, it is very rich. We have been consistent. The MPP majority in Parliament. Honorable Deputy Majority Leader, you have now moved away from the minority caucus to the NDC party. Oh. 
Now, some members are compelled to rise up on point of order. I'll be compelled to invite them. I know the time is of essence in this matter. Please. Yes, uh, what is it? Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity. I am rising on point of order 92, order 92, one B, order 92, one B. In the submission of the senior leader, he referred to what Honorable Haruna said in the morning, that the Electoral Commission failed Ghanaians to have not carried out limited registration in 2021, 2022, and they now want to have it done. And he, the leader, quoted Article 45, and I want to take him to, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, to Article 45E. And one of the it's one of the functions of the Electoral Commission. It says the function to under the Electoral Commission is to undertake programs for the expansion of the registration of voters. This is an this is one of the functions of them. So if Honorable Aruna referred to the fact that they failed us. He, um, he based this, I'm sure he based his, his, he, he made reference to this function of the Electoral Commission. I thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, first of all, first of all, I thank, I, 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 I thank my colleagues, I thank my honorable colleague for the courage in rising on her feet to challenge me. Mr. Speaker, but she, she, got, the, she got the rule wrong. She says she's coming under 92B, 92B, and she got it wrong. If you want to learn the rules, learn them properly. You said 92B, the provision is not what it says. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, they, don't, they, they all said yeah, yeah to her. But you see, she has misled them, and I need to correct her so that they get corrected. She corrected them, and they said he, she, she was wrong, misled them, and they said yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, 92B, 92B that you quoted was wrongly quoted. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will read it aloud for her to learn, learn the rules better. Mr. Speaker, 92B, to elucidate some matter. 92B has to do with elucidation, not a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I shall proceed. The argument, Mr. Speaker, he said, she said, Honorable Harry Nejusu was right in talking about the need for a yearly registration. Mr. Speaker, I again state that Honorable Harry Nejusu got the law wrong. Periodic registration before public election does not necessarily mean a yearly registration. That I, 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 See the way Atu is quiet. You should learn from your leader. Atu is now you no more a backbencher. You are now in the other front bench where we use legal arguments and other arguments to support our point. You don't shout. Mr. Speaker, and other arguments, and other. I say so. Mr. Speaker, so I want to state that your time, your time is up. Your time is up. Okay. Honorable member, it's now the turn of Honorable Ahmed Ibrahim for and on behalf of the leadership of the minority. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I have sat here and listen to the various contributions on the motion. Thankfully, Mr. Speaker, my A-level government teacher is in this chamber. And Mr. Speaker, my political science course mate, Honorable Dr. Bosmanasari, is in this chamber. Honorable Fantinyahin is in this chamber. 
La speaker, my A-level government teacher, is in this chamber. And he taught me one thing I have never forgotten. And that is the development of franchise in the history of Ghana. The speaker, in, oh, the speaker, he taught me for free, so I'm not ashamed to mention his name. And that's why I'm a good product and I'll be able to qualify to come here. The Honorable Former Majority Chief Whip, Honorable Ambeyao, Pesia Ambeyao Chireme, taught me A-level government in Sunyani Secondary School. Honorable Dr. Bosma Asare and Honorable Ahim and Mangusel with Honorable Dr. Professor White were all taught political science by Professor Michael Gray, University of Ghana. And I wish we implement what we were taught. Mr. Speaker, how did we develop franchise and got to this level? Mr. Speaker, before we got to Universal Adults of Bridge, franchise or voting was restricted to only the rich men. You needed to own a house before you could qualify to vote. The speaker, some people fought. Some people fought. In some countries, women were not even allowed to vote. Some people fought and shed their blood before we could attain universal adult suffrage. So, Mr. Speaker, it is very wrong for us to now be restricting and tightening the right to vote. And Mr. Speaker, I say it with my heart bleeding within. Because if we cannot open and make the electoral process participatory in nature, where more Ghanaians, eligible qualified voters in Ghana can have the right to vote, we must not close the door onto them. Why am I saying this? Mr. Speaker, I've listened to the debate from the other side. And Honorable Obi Amwa spoke about the expenses involved and the nature and the strenuous effort in carrying continuous, current, limited voter registration. So the mischief they want to cure is to embark upon continuous registration. Mr. Speaker, if that was the reason for introducing this new CI, CI 91, Section 9, Regulation 9, which was passed in 2016, made provision for continuous voter registration. And Mr. Speaker, with your permission, CI 91, Section 91, period of registration. Regulation 91, period of reg registration. The commission shall register voters on continuous basis. This is what passed in this house in 2016. So, Mr. Speaker, the commission shall register voters on continuous basis. So, if continuous registration is what Dr. Tripo wants to embark upon, you have the law. Go ahead. You don't need a new CI before you can embark upon continuous voter registration. And Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Obiamwa is aware of this. He was the chairman of subsidiary legislation and he passed this. Oh, oh, Mr. Speaker, I have the report. The report of the Committee on Subsidiary Legislation on the Public Election Registration of Voter Regulation 2016, CR91. Mr. Speaker, it is signed by Chairman of Committee of Subsidiary Legislation, Honorable Obi Amwa. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I quote from Honorable Obi Amwa's report. Mr. Speaker, page four. Page four. Oh, you did a good job. Don't run away from your old job. You did a good job. Last speaker, on page four, I have to this to say. The committee took 
the committee took note that CRN to make provision for modalities for continuous registration in consultation with registered political parties. This is what he said. And this is the CI ninety one. So if continuous registration is what the Electoral Commission wants to embark upon, the Electoral Commission was well equipped with the law from 2016. You don't need a new please. CI before you could do let, let, continuous let, registration. Let, please, may we listen to him. Since you mentioned his name and read a report which he signed, you want to deny his feet. Yes, please. Don't you deny it's not your report? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, indeed, I don't know why the Deputy Whip is seeking to drag my name in this. We passed, we passed the CI in this house. I was then the chairman. 2020, we passed another CI in this house. Dominic Aini was the chairman. Now the EC seeks to pass another CI. How does he collate this to and bring my name in this matter? I don't understand him. He's just playing to the gallery. I don't understand what he's saying. I don't understand what he's saying and he's seeking to impugn my integrity. Where is the latest CI? And who passed, who was the chair? And what is the latest CI saying? Ah. Honorable O.B. Amwa, I just didn't understand your last part. What did you say? Ah. You are addressing me. Sorry, Mr. Speaker. I, I thought I'd put on the phone. I've put off the speaker. So the eye shouldn't be part of the statement I made in the hands that it should yes. be Honorable Ahmed Ibrahim, Deputy Minority, you may continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, the first point raised by the other side, which mischief they seek to cure by introducing a new CI, has fallen flat. It has no leg to stand on. Since continuous registration is already catered for in the existing CI. Mr. Speaker, I proceed, and it is this CI, CI 91, which was used to register the 2016 general presidential and parliamentary election. Deputy Majority Leader, the Majority Leader will be making the submissions. If you have a point, pass it on to him. What is it on? Mr. Speaker, with the greatest respect. Yes. Mr. Speaker, with the greatest respect. Yes. I rise on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, point of order. It is so. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my respected colleague on his feet is referring to a 2016 CI to suggest that there is no such requirement for a new CI. Mr. Speaker, I am only on my feet to draw his attention to a Supreme Court ruling on, I, on, on I, that provision. I, 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 because I, the Supreme Court has interpreted. I beg you. And if I you permit you. me, I'll read. I didn't get that from his submission at all. Mr. Speaker, that's what he said. Mr. No. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let me help. Mr. Speaker. No. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, he said that Honorable Obi Amwa signed the CI, the report. And in that CI, there is a provision for continuous registration. Therefore, why the need for a new CI since we already have a CI in existence? Mr. Speaker, it is upon that no. basis that I have risen no, that, to draw that, his attention that, that, that please, please. There's, a consu there's a Supreme Court ruling. Please. The issue he raised there was the fact that an impression was created that that was an introduction of reforms in this new CI that is being proposed. You are simply drawing our attention to the fact that that had existed in an earlier CI. That was the issue he raised. It's not a new reform. 
that is being introduced by this current draft CI. That was the issue he raised. Please. You are under pressure, so sometimes you are compelled to whisper to one or two people and you lose trend. I'm following the debate and I'm guiding you on. Please, you may continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, so this year, 91 was used to conduct the, to register in 2016 and to conduct elections which the New Patriotic Party won with over one million difference. In 2020, Mr. Speaker, a portion of the CI-91 was amended because of the ruling of the Supreme Court. And Mr. Speaker, that gave birth to CI-126. Mr. Speaker, in CI-126, qualification criteria for identification for registration was reduced, proof of citizenship was reduced to a passport, a national identification card, and a voter registration identification guarantee system. After the ruling of the Supreme Court, Parliament amended Regulation 1 of the CI-91, and that gave birth to CI-126. Mr. Speaker, what a man saying. In 2016, CI-91. In 2020, CI-126. 2024, another CI is coming. Mr. Speaker, what are we seeking to do? Put that one aside. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Electoral Commission in the bid to embark upon a voter registration exercise. And when we met him, if you read the report, the speaker, he said, the National Identification Authority people have promised and given assurance that by 2024, all eligible registrants in Ghana will be issued with the Ghana card. The speaker, I want to remind the chairperson of the Electoral Commission and her deputies that this year, 2023, we have a district-level election to embark upon. Are you saying that you want to do away with limited registration and go and embark... Honorable, honorable uh, deputy minority whip, you cannot be addressing the Electoral Commission here. She is not a member of this house for you to address it, for her to have the opportunity to reply. So please, if you look at the standing orders, this is not permitted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was addressing you. Mr. Speaker, I was just... No, you are not addressing me. Mr. Speaker, may I remind this house and the country at large that this year, not 2024, it will be wrong for anybody to quote 2024 and say we have two years ahead and therefore we can register and give every Ghanaian a Ghana card before we can register and go to 2024. We have district level elections to carry upon in this year, 2023. Mr. Speaker, if you don't embark upon limited registration, how are you going to give eight Ghanaians of 18 years and above or Ghanaians who were outside the country before the last registration, how are you going to give them the opportunity to be able to register? So, Mr. Speaker, limited registration is inevitable, and the Electoral Commission must embark upon limited registration to enable eligible voters to be able to register and vote in the district-level elections. Mr. Speaker, the district-level election is supposed to be in September 2023. If care is not taken, it will be shifted to November. Honorable, honorable member, don't believe at this point. The Electoral Commission simply said, I am not compiling a new voter register. That is all. Revising the existing register. They haven't denied. 
Because if you are to update it, you are adding to what is already there. You are revising. And that is allowed by the Constitution and the law. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's go through the main issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, back on the report. In page 9, that is NIA reliance on the National Identification Authority. Mr. Speaker, I want to quote paragraph 2, page 9 of the report. Some committee members observed the, com the Commission's overly reliance on the NIA and therefore draw the attention of the laws that established the Commission and further set out its mandate. We do not immediately link NIA into the Ghana democratic process. And therefore, the Commission to take responsibility and reduce the attempt to make NIA operations part of its process. The Speaker, I was part of the Special Budget Committee that met the Electoral Commission. The Speaker, when we quoted the briefing of the National Identification Authority people to them, they themselves were surprised. And the Speaker, this is a ministerial briefing. When the Honorable Amrozeri led the NIA people to come and brief this house, what do we have on this ministerial briefing? Mr. Speaker, page 7 of 9, the last paragraph. Second, listen, inadequate budgetary allocation and releases by the Minister of Finance. This was a major challenge that the NIA put before us. And Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I read. A major challenge facing NIA is inadequate budgetary allocation of funds and untimely releases of funds by the Minister of Finance to implement NIA's programs and activities. NIA submitted a proposed budget of $326,740,669 CDs, 34 pesos, for the year 2022. Mr. Speaker, in January 2022, a budget ceiling of 236 million was released to NIA by the Minister of Finance. Further, the January 2022 budget ceiling of 236 has been further revised. The speaker further revised. Further revised by the Minister of Finance under the emergency rationalization messages directive from the office of the president. To 180 million. Mr. Speaker, the NIA wanted a budget of 326 million. The Minister of Finance gave them a ceiling of 236 million. And in the, within that same year, told them that you cannot even get the 236. I'm going to give you 180. Mr. Speaker, listen to what the NIA itself has to say. The net effect of the release and its subsequent downward revision is that. NIA will not have enough funds to execute its major activities, including registration of Ghanaians in diaspora and registration of children below the age of 15 years, among others. The inability of the NIA to commence these activities will gravely affect the enforcement of the use of the Ghana card, use of the Ghana card for the promotion of economic social and political activities in Ghana. Mr. Speaker, this is a ministerial briefing of the NIA. They themselves are telling us that their budget has been cut from 326 to 236 to 180. And because of that, the inability to get this amount will have great effect on using the Ghana card for political, social, and economic activities. So, why does the NI, the Electoral Commission, want to rely on this? When the NIA themselves, the Ghana card people themselves, are saying that you cannot use their Ghana card for registration purposes or for, politi for political purposes because of inadequate of funds, they cannot give card to every Ghanaian. Mr. Speaker, you put that one aside. In the same briefing, on that day, the frequent shortage of blank cars and printing of cars, that's another reason. Mr. Speaker, the fourth 
reason was delayed payment of government support agreement. The government himself is not able to pay his part of the public-private partnership agreement that the NIA has entered with their technical partners. These are the challenges they gave to us. The Speaker, time will not permit me to quote all the challenges. NIA said another problem they face is poor network coverage. And they mentioned, the Speaker, your region, the Upper West region, most of the areas NIA says that they cannot procure Ghana card for them because there's no network coverage. In the Western North region, where the cocoa farmers are, there's poor network in that region. Most part of Ghana, there's poor network region. So they are calling on the Ministry of Communication to extend connectivity. connectivity to those communities and those regions before they can give them card. Mr. Speaker, why will Parliament go ahead to pass a law in anticipation that in future the Ministry of Communication will send electric, this is net, mobile network to those areas for internet to assess East NIA before they can give them card. And what would Ghanaians say of us? If you know you are going to vote this year, you cannot extend electricity to those areas. You cannot extend network connectivity to those areas. You cannot enable all those people there to be able to register onto the Ghana card and you go ahead to pass this law in its current form at this time. Mr. Speaker, reading the report, the Electoral Commission says they met with IPAC and built a consensus before drafting this CI. The question is, was the, was the National Democratic Party, National Democratic Congress, the NDC for short, present at that meeting where the IPAC put that decision that this CI should be in this form? Mr. Speaker, that aside, the NDC controls 137 MPs in this chamber. So it will be a major problem to proceed to have a meeting with political parties without the NDC and come out with a CI and call upon us to accept it. Mr. Speaker, put that one aside. In the 2020 elections, the MPP had 6.7 million, the NDC had 6.2 million. So going ahead to convert political parties and build consensus with that, the party that gave about 7.2 million people voted for, without inviting that party to that meeting, then you say there's consensus. What kind of consensus is that? In that regard, Mr. Speaker, I want to call upon you. Since the National Democratic Congress was not party to the so-called IPAC meeting, that gave birth to this CI, Mr. Speaker, you cannot say that there was consensus. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, knowing the challenges that we have and where we have come to, Mr. Speaker, the former chairperson, the former chairman of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Kwejo Afarijan, is quoted to have said that making the Ghana card the sole criteria for identifying who a Ghanaian is and using it to embark upon voter registration will be a recipe for disaster. Mr. Speaker, I don't think any major thing involving the fundamental human right of the Ghanaian, that law should be passed in this form. Mr. Speaker, I was here. The right to information, which comes under Article 21 of the 1922 Constitution, started in this House for about 10 years. In 2002, it was passed in 2017 or 2018. We went about, about nationwide consultation. We consulted civil society organizations. We went to all the regional capitals. We explained it to them. As we are here now, most Ghanaians, most civil society organizations, people in the academia, people who queue and vote for us, are not aware that parliament or electoral commission is carrying on an exercise in this form, where people are going to be disenfranchised because they don't have Ghana card. Last speaker, in preparing to conclude, the reason why I quoted the evolution of franchise and how we move from property owing voting right to a free universal voting right is that, Mr. Speaker, in getting the Ghana card, 
rich men in Ghana are called to pay 250 Ghana cities and they are giving instant Ghana card. Oh, yes. So, if we accept this CI in its current form, since the rich men can pay the 250 Ghana cities or 2.5 million in the old, the old currency and get their Ghana card, the rich men will pay and have their Ghana card and go and register and vote. The poor man who do not have the 250 cities, the speaker, and cannot even travel from their area to the district capital, will be disenfranchised from taking part in the district level election in 2023 and in the 2024 general election. The speaker, since when? Even the white man before independence gave Ghanaians the right to vote. Huh? Why is the black man trying to use money? You pay 250 before you get Ghana card. Honorable Deputy Whip, let me listen to the Honorable Deputy Minister for Local Government, Decentralization and Rural Development. Oh, you didn't speaker. catch my eye. Mr. Speaker, thank you so much. This is a house of records. The impression the Deputy Whip is creating is that we are debating CI here. There's no CI before us. For us to reject any CI, reject any CI, we are not debating any CI. We are debating the report of the Special Budget Committee. And it has nothing to do with any intended CI by, by the EC. So I don't know why he's referring to rejecting the CI. It's going into a hazard. And it's wrong. Yes, Honorable Deputy Minority Whip, please take that along. And also be cautious about the immunities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity. But what, what I want to say and to remind this House is that since the NIE has a premium service for the rich men who can pay the 250 Ghana cities to get the Ghana card instantly, but does not have processes to help the poor man the poor cocoa farmer in the western north, the poor cocoa farmer in the Jassican I, I, I just drew your attention to be cautious about the immunities. That is why I mentioned that thing. I'm sure many of you did not get the, the issue. Here, you are immune. Free speech. You can say anything. You cannot be taken outside, you cannot be prosecuted, but that exercise has some limitation. So that is why I'm drawing attention to it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was quoting the 250 because it is in this report that the NI came to give us in this room that those who can pay 250 there's a premium service for them. Yes. It's in this report, ministerial briefly. Oh, so on a high street. And in the report that is going to be debated soon after this, yes. it's in that report, that there's a premium service for the people who can pay 250 yes. My constituents cannot pay the 250 and therefore most of them are going to be disenfranchised. Mr. Yes. Speaker, that's why I'm crying seriously on their behalf. And that's why they brought me here. So, Mr. Speaker, we need to... I, I, I read the report. And I'm aware of what you are saying. I'm only drawing your attention that there are limitations. I'm not saying don't, but the extent to which you are going, I'm just drawing your attention. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that has been established, so I'll be from there. So, Mr. Speaker, taking lessons from what Dr. Afarijan said, that you don't need a Ghana card before you can be a Ghanaian. And if you don't have Ghana card, does it mean you are not a Ghanaian? These are questions to be raised. Mr. Speaker, this House, before we proceed, proceed on that path, I will open, or this side of the House will open, that Mr. Speaker, you allow the two caucuses and the leadership to do further engagement on this issue. We are here in performing our representational function. What we are being given today is not known to our constituents. 
it's better we take this report and go to our constituents and tell them, you send me to parliament. This law is what we intend to enact in parliament. What is your view on that? We need to do nationwide consultation. Civil society organizations must come in. The two chairpersons, the former electoral commission of Farijan, must be consulted. Charlotte Osei must be consulted. The academia must be consulted. CDD must be consulted. Imani Ghana must be consulted. The role of Frederick Herbert Foundation cannot be ruled out. They must be consulted. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to conclude by calling on this House to have extensive, extensive engagement on this. What the report says, there must be a, a committee of the whole with the Electoral Commission and the National Identification Authority people. That is going to take place within this chamber. Mr. Speaker, how can we get... And that is not going to be the first meeting. Because if you read the report, the report says they engage the subsidiary legislation to take their input to enrich the CI. Mr. Speaker, my information from the chairman of the subsidiary legislation committee is that the input they gave to the electoral commission was that include the past Ghanaian passport and include the guarantee system. These were the two inputs they gave to you. None of them have found space in what you have. So what is the guarantee that the input that they gave you has been factored in? Then you bring it here, knowing very well that you need to test majority to analyze. Is it parliament that is making the law or who is making that law? So Mr. Speaker, in order for us not to be told that we came to make this law in this form, let's do extensive engagement on this. Let's do extensive consultation on this. We just had 30 years parliamentary democracy under the Fourth Republic, the journey thus far. The following day, we are here, restricting, closing the door on eligible voters. If that had been done previously, would we have come this far? Mr. Speaker, let anybody prove to me, in doing periodic registration for the district level election, how many deaths were recorded? No death. In doing registration, periodic registration, limited registration for the creation of the state's regions, how many deaths were recorded? No death. So, Mr. Speaker, it would be wrong for somebody to come and say, this is recipe for abuse. So, because of that, I'm closing the door. Is it because we are here? The people who brought us here, Mr. Speaker, somebody voted for me. That person is in the remote, he takes canoe five hours before he can get to the district capital. You are saying he must come to the district capital or the regional capital before he can qualify to vote. Oh, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. We are representatives. We don't take decisions on our own. We represent the generality of Ghanaians, and we need to go back and consult them. So in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, after the committee of the whole, that prelaying that the committee is saying that must come on, that prelaying, you must invite civil society organizations. You must invite the political parties. You must invite the chairperson or chairman of former chairperson and chairman of the electoral commission. Let's get all their input so that we can in, in reach whatever law that we want to make. We shouldn't come here and close the door on those who brought us here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity. Honorable members, let's now listen to the majority leader. He... Speaker, let me also rise to speak to the report of the Special Budget Committee in respect of the referral 
to the committee. The speaker, the point has been made that in bringing this instrument, the regulations, to Parliament, the Electoral Commission is guided by Article 117 of this Constitution. As a speaker, for the avoidance of doubt, I want to rehash what the Constitution provides. Article 11.7 says, Any order, rule, or regulation made by a person or authority under a power conferred by this Constitution or any other law shall A. Be laid before Parliament. B. Be published in the Gazette on the day it is laid before Parliament. And C. Come into force at the expiration of 21 certain days after being so late, unless Parliament before the expiration of 21 days, announce the order, rule, or regulation by votes of not less than two-thirds of all the members of Parliament. So the EC is coming to us by this route. Mr. Speaker, so there cannot be any, any fault on the part of the Electoral Commission on this. The Electoral Commission, before coming by this route, has elected to yield to this emerging trend of having consultations with members of parliament. Mr. Speaker, that indeed is what the Electoral Commission is doing. We must not bastardize this effort because, after all, it's only an emerging trend. It is not founded on any law. The Speaker, in 2012... Honorable Majority Leader, the first duty speaker to take the chair. Then I will continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in 2012, 45 new constituencies were created in this country. Mr. Speaker, issues were raised. <laughs> issues were raised in this house. And Mr. Speaker, how many months did we have to travel before the conduct of that election? 45. We raised issues. This side, the left side of the house, was at a time was headed by my dear friend, the Honorable Clarice Abuka, decided not to listen to anybody. He said all that the Electoral Commission had to do was to come to this house by a constitutional instrument. They had confirmed, and nobody had any right to question the EC on that. Check your hands. The speaker, so let's not try to bastardize the Electoral Commission. However, it is not to say that we cannot also make any inputs into what is going on. And Mr. Speaker, let me, let me, let me quote the um, page four of the report. Page four of the report, um, the bullet four, for Roman number two. The chairperson explained for the record that officially no CI has been presented to Parliament as is being alleged. Because when we met them at the, at the Special Budget Committee level, it was even alleged that the CI had come to this house. They had to explain that no CI had been laid. What they were doing was just a pre-laying consultation. The speaker, they said they were only conforming to the emerging practice of the House by doing what they were doing. But even before they came to us, the atmosphere in the country had been poisoned that the Electoral Commission has smuggled the CIA to, to this House. When people who ought to have known better were on radio stations accusing the Electoral Commission for nothing. Mr. Speaker, now the Honorable, Honorable Eric Opoku 
quoted extenso from the report that has been submitted. And in particular, he related to uh, paragraph, um, page 11, paragraph 2, when he said, and I'm quoting him, that the committee would like to stress that it will not accept and would reject any effort that is geared towards making the Letter Commission use the Ghana card as the only medium to qualify a person who is eligible to vote in the 2024 elections. The speaker, what does this, what does this paragraph mean? Who are the people who are going to vote in the 2024 elections? Already, they have their register, which they are going to add on. And that register was not predicated on the Ghana card. Now, people had alleged that they were going to do a complete re-registration of voters. And we said, the committee said, that we will not allow that. Those of them who had been registered already and being captured on their road should remain. The continuous registration is what they are going to use the Ghana card to roll people on. Mr. Speaker, I, 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 I said to one day when we're having a debate in this house, please read the thing again. Mr. Speaker, I said in a debate on this floor, that when some of us were engaged in iambic pentameter, some people were struggling to understand the prosaic free West African verse. Otherwise, this is very clear. This is very clear. Mr. Speaker, read paragraph 1 of page 11. It says, again, the committee would like to emphasize that it has no objections to the Electoral Commission using the NIA card to embark on the registration of eligible voters. That is from now on. But those of them who have been captured, you can't come and do a re-registration. So those of them like us, whose names are already on the register, the Electoral Commission cannot register us again using the Ghana card. That is the simple meaning of, of, of paragraph 2. So for you to imply that the committee is saying that would like to stress that it will not accept and will reject any effort that is geared towards making the ECU, the Ghana card, as the only medium to qualify a person who is eligible to vote in 2024. To mean that, we are saying that nobody should be rolled onto the register using the Ghana card. It's fallacious. It's fallacious. Mr. Speaker, read the two together. You, I mean, putting these two together should, should lend itself to clear vision and understanding. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, now, the other matter raised by the deputy, the deputy whip for the minority, the crux of the issue is not about continuous registration. It's about it's about clarifying, simplifying, and indeed sanitizing the process of registration. Let's not forget that progressively we have been improving the system. When we started registration, the speaker, we were using first birth, birth um, certificates plus baptismal certificates. Today, where are they? So as we move along, we are improving the system. Mr. Speaker, we used to use um, driver's license. We have done away with driver's license. We are using uh, previous voter ID cards as form of guarantees. We are, dealing, we, are, we are doing away with that. And then Ghana passports. We are, we are using Ghana passports as well as form of identifying Ghanaian citizens. Now, all that this is saying to us is that after all these, including the guarantor system, where we got into, we can use the Ghana card. 
After all, the Ghana card establishes your Ghanaianness. So let's just resort to the Ghanaian Identification Authority card. Mr. Speaker, I don't see anything wrong with this. Mr. Speaker, what is wrong with this? Mr. Speaker, what is wrong with this proposal? Mr. Speaker, in the countries surrounding us, Cote d'Ivoire, Togo, Burkina Faso, the cause of their registration of citizens by way of voting, they resort only to their cat identity. That is their identity card. Mr. Speaker, so, so when we are using the identity card, what is wrong with it? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, people are talking as if the CI, the constitutional instrument, has already been laid. It's not been laid. And Mr. Speaker, when people quote Article 42, I believe that they are really misrepresenting the import of Article 42. 42 says, and I quote, the speaker, Article 42 provides, every citizen of Ghana of 18 years of age or above and of sound mind has the right, you have the right to vote. You have the right to vote. The speaker, it doesn't mean that when you are 18 and of sound mind, when elections are due, you can walk to any any uh, uh, polling booth and declare yourself a Ghanaian. You are of 18 years, you are of sound mind, so you should be allowed to vote. That doesn't obtain. That is why, and I mean as you continue, that is why the continuation provides, and I read it. Every citizen of Ghana of 18 years of age or above and of sound mind has the right to vote and is entitled to be registered. So you must submit yourself to the registration process. That's a simple truth. You cannot just say that and the process, the registration process, is defined by the Electoral Commission. It is not you who defines it. You don't define it. They define it and come by an instrument or regulations. If we don't agree, we have the right to acknowledge. That is the position of the law. You cannot say that because you qualify, you must walk to the booth and then be allowed to vote. Who told you that? And since when have we had that regime? By necessary implication, that's the point that you, you seek to make. Mr. Speaker, so you must be registered as a voter for the purposes of public elections. Mr. Speaker, who is here telling you? They are coming, who, they are coming with the vehicle. And this is the vehicle. Submit yourself. Mr. Speaker, so for anybody to say that, and then we are being told that the former minority leader, my, my dearest friend, was saying that uh, the EC is an independent uh, body, and for it to submit to the National Education Authority, which is not an independent body, guaranteed under the Constitution, is improper. And I sat down and I laughed. Mr. Speaker, in this country, we base a lot of our, uh, our, our, our projections and whatever on figures that are given to us by the statistical service. The, the independence of the statistical service is not guaranteed under the constitution. And yet parliament relies on it. The Electoral commission relies on that. So wh where does this argument come in? That because the NIA is not an independent body created under the constitution, they, are, they, they cannot be relied on by the Electoral commission because by necessary implication, they compromise themselves. Where from this? Mr. Speaker, this really, I, I, again, is a fallacy of the highest order. Mr. Speaker, the, the, by, by my colleague, the Honorable uh, Dr. Aine, gave the impression that when the Electoral Commission was given the opportunity to provide evidence of the abuse of the Galanta system, they submitted examples of four abuses. And he says, for the records of this house, that of the 17 million registered, it's only four that they submitted and made it appear as if, as if that was the only one. That is the, that is the greatest untruth. 
That's the greatest untruth. Mr. Speaker, they brought them to us as example. But to say that it is the only one, really, I don't see where he's deriving his, his strength for. I don't know where he's, he's getting this from. Really, this house, we are required to inform the populace. We don't resort to propaganda. It doesn't, it doesn't solve any problem. It doesn't serve the public any better or any good if you do that. Mr. Speaker, as to when he said that he admits that there were challenges in relation to uh, 15,744 um, other persons, and he says that that figure is insignificant. <laughs> My colleague, the Honorable Dr. Yene, is, is, is a Christian. He knows of the parable that Jesus gave, that if you have 100 sheep and one goes astray, you leave the 99 to go searching for the one. Even if it is one person, if it is one infraction, we must do everything to cure that mischief. <laughs> the Honorable Okunjetro is saying that it doesn't apply. You can pick and choose. You can pick and choose. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, so the, the, the issues, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Deputy, the Honorable Deputy Whip was also saying that we are restricting, we are closing the door to uh, assessing the Ghanaian card because rich people have to pay 250 uh, cities to receive the Ghana card. And then, by his own conclusion, those who, are, who can pay 250 then will not be issued the Ghanaian card. Where is, it, where is it coming from? The fact that you do that to facilitate the issuance doesn't mean that if you are not able to do that, you can't have access to your card. That is not the law. So why do you contort and distort the law to suit your purposes here in, in, in this house? You are totally wrong. You know you are totally wrong and you want to mislead Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker, is that the greatest absurdity of the time when he says that is a resort by the, uh, the uh, Administration Authority to disenfranchise Ghanaians? I, I don't know where you are coming from. Mr. Speaker, the as the speaker said, in this house, we are afforded free speech, but free speech must be well informed to inform the people outside. You don't just talk from the top of your head with the intention to mislead and be populist in your declarations in this house. It doesn't serve any useful purpose. The speaker, there are matters that should concern us. I agree that. The CI, which is yet to be late, is talking about limiting the continuous registration to district offices. It's a matter that we should address. But nobody should create any impression that this is the first time it's happening. Throughout continuous registration, that's what has been done. If we want to improve the system, let's say so. And I believe that we should work to improve the system. But to create the impression that this is the first time continuous registration is going to be limited to these offices. It's rather mischievous. It's rather mischievous. But we, not, not notwithstanding, the EC has authority to create many more stations in the continuous registration. And we should ask them to do that. To me, that should be our preoccupation. Second, Mr. Speaker, the other matter that should concern us, by their own admission, when we met them, they said that about 3 million cards are outstanding. They have not been able to issue them. What should be the position of this house? The position of this house should be that you should, whatever it takes, double up your steps to ensure that those of them who have registered and who have not been issued their cards, the 3 million, are issued their cards. Necessarily, they must be issued their cards. So that should be the common position of this house. Mr. Speaker, every year, every year, about 250,000 Ghanaians turn the age of 18. So if for two years you have not registered them, or registration has stopped, it means that about 500,000, half a million people, outside the 3 million, are behind the door. What do we do? What do we do to get them on the, on the uh, uh, you know, issued, registered and issued their, their, their identification authority cards? 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, to me, that should be a matter of concern to all of us. And it's the reason why we have brought the finance minister has been here the whole day. We are going to go into that. For them to have money availed to the NIA to cover the 3 million, if you like, the 3.5 million people to be issued, to be registered and issued the, the identification authority cards so that we can move from there. Mr. Speaker, the, the issue that we are talking about, I believe, is about money. It's about money. Where do we have the money to do that? And we should have an assurance. We should have an assurance from the Minister Responsible for Finance, who is here. The, the, we are broke. Yes, we have challenges. But you are paid. You are paid every month. <laughs> so that should be a paramount concern the Minister of Finance to avail money the um, NIA to be able to set an issue to the 3 million plus the 500,000 or so people who have qualified because of the stall in the system have not been registered to also be captured. That should be the concern of us. Yeah. Finally, I'm looking at the issue of um, Article 46 that was quoted by my colleagues that in the performance of the functions of the Electoral Commission, they should not be uh, subject to any directions. Nobody is, nobody is uh, subjecting the Electoral Commission to any controls. Rather, if the Electoral Commission wants to come to this house with a CI, and you position yourself to say that you are not allowing them to present their CI, you rather will want to control the, the, the Electoral Commission in the performance of their functions. In that case, you rather can be cited for a breach of the Constitution. And we don't want to get there. Because it's the reason why since June, we have been talking to ourselves to address the salient issues. It's about money. How do we get money to pay all these outstanding? In order that no qualified Ghanaian would stand disenfranchised. That should be our paramount concern. That should be our paramount concern. And Mr. Speaker, let me repeat that the Electoral Commission cannot be prevented from presenting from presenting this CI. However, we must work together to ensure that that should be the conclusion. And to position ourselves that not until civil society people are, co are, are consulted and so on, that to me is too populist. That's not what we are here for. Mr. Speaker, that is not what we are here for. Let's dialogue amongst ourselves. Let's isolate those outstanding matters. How do you deal with them? Unfortunately, when we finish with this, we are going to recline into a committee of the whole to listen to them how to cure the mischief that we have identified. Exactly. And then we can move on. Yeah. That should be, that should be the, 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 the roadmap. But it cannot be that somebody wants to, uh, you know, pose himself Eric, as an obstructionist. Eric, that I will not allow this. Randy what authority do you have? Randy so, Mr. Speaker, I thank you, and I believe with this, we'll be able to make progress. Let's speak once again, I thank you very much. Honorable members, at the conclusion of the debate, I put the question. Why? Are you on a point of order? Point of order. So, Speaker, a little correction before it could be, but I thought maybe the leader would do it. Mr. Speaker, if you look at item one, introduction, it says the Electoral Commission EC of Ghana, led by the chairperson, Mrs. Jean Adukwe Mensa, and two deputies, Dr. Bosman Asari and Dr. Srebo Kwaku. Mr. Speaker, Dr. Srebo Kwaku is Director of Electoral Services, not a deputy chair. So since this is a report of this, that must be corrected before.
I, I don't have that report. The one you read, I don't have that edition. I have a different edition. I have a different edition. And so, uh, you have the... I have the this version. Ah, okay. <laughs> you are lucky you don't have the old Bible. But the updated King James. Yes. Honorable members, at the conclusion of the debate, I put the question. Those in favor of the adoption of the report, say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. The eyes have it. No. Honorable members, the report is accordingly adopted. Honorable members, in consultation with leadership, we will now take item 25, and I'm informed that one from east side of the house, one from east side of the house, and I will give five minutes each. It's the same thing. What you debated was a report from the EC. Now, what is coming on is the same report from the NIE. So it's the same subject matter. So we just want to hear one from each side of the house. And then we can now go into the committee of the whole. The officials of the electoral commission the officials of the NIA and the Minister of Finance. Yes, Majority Leader. Mr. Speaker, if I may, just move the motion as captured under, um, on page 20, as item 25. Speaker, I will not do any contribution, but to yield to the two people that are supposed to do the debate. So I just present the report um, before us. Uh, Speaker, Yes, I wanted to get some decorum before I call on you to move that motion. Please, my very good friend, Honorable Fred Bafo, used to say, quiescence. So please, let's have some order. Item 25, motion, Chairman of the Committee. The speaker, the chairman of the committee of the whole, is the, um, the first deputy speaker. But the indication is given to me that he's extremely exhausted. So uh, I just want to do the presentation. And as I said, the debate will be done by the two of them. So, the speaker, without yes. understanding, I beg to move that this honourable house adopt the report of the committee of the whole on the status 
of registration, printing, and issuance of the ECOWAS identity card, otherwise called the Ghana card, and related challenges. The speaker, in doing so, to present to the House a 22-page document. And I believe that everybody has been set with a copy of the report. For which reason, Mr. Speaker, I would want to urge the Hazard Department to capture the entirety of the document as having been read into the Hazard. Mr. Speaker, I so submit and I so move. Chim Yes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that is so. Mr. Speaker, I'm grateful for the opportunity to second the report as second the motion as presently did and moved by the majority leader. Mr. Speaker, in doing so, I I I I I I'm I do so in the following terms. Mr. Speaker. Yes, I'm seconding the motion. And I'm doing so in the following terms. Mr. Speaker, we were briefed by the National Identification Authority on so many issues. Mr. Speaker, one of the key issues that the National Identification Authority raised before the committee was the fact that they had staffing inadequacies. Mr. Speaker, if, if you look at the issues that they brought, they, for instance, said that in 2001, they had only 133 staffs serving them in the entire country. But this improved to about 1,459 staffs in 2022. Mr. Speaker, the difficulty we had was why with this improvement in staff numbers came with the difficulty of serving our people in terms of registering more numbers. Mr. Speaker, the factors that affected the work of the National Democratic Authority in some of the districts as captured in the report include network connectivity problems. Mr. Speaker, for instance, in South Dine, it was for the staff in South Dine, located in Peking, which is not the district capital though, but the office is cited in Peking, to actually have connectivity, to be able to serve the people when they capture data. So, Mr. Speaker, that was one of the issues. Two, the other issue that cropped up was language barrier. We also discovered that, for instance, in South Dine, some NIA staff simply could not communicate in Ebe. So it was difficult to serve the people when they thronged the, the centers and their numbers, because you needed people to, to, to interpret and between persons who had come to register as well as the officials who are capturing the data. So even though persons will come early in the morning, it took forever for one person's data to be captured. Eventually, at the end of a day, not many persons get captured, and they are told to go back and return the following day. Some persons travel from, say, Ajebi, which is about 45 or 50 kilometers to the center. And, and, and it, 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 it brings them a lot of economic burden to be able to do so. so they are demotivated from going back for their data to be captured. Mr. Speaker, the other matter that came up, which is captured in the report, is about the number of persons that NIA is alleged to have registered. Mr. Speaker, if I may refer the House to Table 2 of the report. Mr. Speaker, the data presented are captured on regional basis. Mr. Speaker, what is interesting that I, what is very interesting is that, for instance, Greater Accra, NIA claims that the 3,178,980 persons, and yet they printed 3,226,156. It meant that they printed more cards than the persons that they, 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 they registered. 
and this gave a difference of 47,177 cars. So these 47,177 cars, who did the NI printed this card for? Mr. Speaker, one other point that I noted was the fact that if you look at the difference between the road and the printed, as well as the issued, when you get to the issued for Greater Accra, NI said that they issued 2,956,000 634.33. Mr. Speaker, the question is that we are dealing with human beings who are counted as a whole. Why is the NIA giving us figures in decimals? Yes. <laughs> Which human beings are constitute the decimals or the fraction? So, so the so the data the NIA has presented to this house is questionable. Mr. Speaker, with all due respect. This is very questionable, and they need to go back and put their house in order because they cannot be giving us differences that are captured reflecting decimals and fractions of human beings, of human beings Mr. Speaker. And this is very, very important. Mr. Speaker, the other matter that we noted, which is captured in the report, is the issue of the establishment of premium centers. Mr. Speaker, this is obscene. This offends Article 17, one of the Constitution, equality before the law. You cannot, de you cannot deny people the right on economic basis. Mr. Speaker, what is happening? Asking people that they must drone your office 50 Ghana series in order for them to be issued with Ghana card Mr. Speaker, with all due respect, it's unconstitutional. They are, because they are using economic basis to deprive others from receiving the premium service. Mr. Speaker, this is my perspective on the matter. Mr. Speaker, the other issue that I think the House must concern itself critically with is the, is the guarantor system or the vouching system. Mr. Speaker, the committee noted that the guarantor system is one means by which a lot of Ghanaians get onto the register. But what, what came to the attention of the committee is the fact that officials of the NIA abused the guarantor system by vociferously interrogating and intimidating persons who are proceeding. I am not saying it. This is the report. Don't say ah. So the committee cautioned NIA to to re-educate and re-orient its officers that they should not abuse the guarantor system by intimidating and vociferously interrogating Ghanaians who want to enter onto the national register using the guarantor system. And I think, Mr. Speaker, the NIA must take this matter seriously because the deficits that we are looking at in respect of the number of persons who have been captured and whose cards or data have not been properly captured and for which cards have not been issued to them is, is, is mind boggling Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, one other factor that we have to bring to the attention of the House is this. If you look at the number of persons who are eligible to be registered, they gave a general population of 20 million three. 127,026 as persons who within the Ghanaian population are entitled to be captured onto the NIA register. Mr. Speaker, if you look at what they have actually done, a 16,627,829 printed cards. Speaker, the difference is that between the eligible and the actual, we have 4,325,779 Ghanaians who are eligible to be registered by NIA and yet are yet to be captured. And that, Mr. Speaker, is very, very instructive. And, Mr. Speaker, considering the contemplation by the Electoral Commission, 
to rely solely on the national ID card as the source document for its continuous or, in other words, its limited registration going forward. It is important that we encourage the National Identification Authority to be able to put a hands in order and ensure that our people are equally served. Mr. Speaker, we also want to urge the National Identification Authority to open its premium service offices in all the other district offices so that they don't limit the premium services to only some selected regions such as Eastern, Ashanti and the Western region. It is not fair. It is not fair. It is, it is, it is, yes, I have made a point that it is discriminated, but if they insist for the sake of IGF, Mr. Speaker, then we demand that the services is extended equally to all Ghanaians. Mr. Speaker, the other matter that is of that must be of of some relevance to the house is this the nia told the committee that they are suffering from inadequate budgetary allocations and releases and they gave some serious figures that is hampering their operations mr speaker for instance they say that they are unable to to pay their creditors and suppliers for services that they have contracted these, these entities to, 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 to render on their behalf. And it is part of the reasons why they are, their efficiency is being, is being called into question in so many areas. Mr. Speaker, for instance, they say that they are unable to pay the, the that's if you look at the data harmonization and integration services, they have some difficulties in making payments. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in order to wind up, let me say this. They indicated that, for instance, in, in 2022, their budgetary allocation of 300, 326,740,669 cities and 34 persuades was shut down and given a ceiling of 236 million. And this was further reduced to 180 million emergency rationalization measures. Mr. Speaker, if the National Identification Authority is such an important institution of state, which ought to serve our interest, is also affecting haircut in terms of its budgetary allocations, then, Mr. Speaker, there's no way they can serve the people for which other entities such as the Electoral Commission will want to rely. Mr. Speaker, finally, there is a misreading of a provision in LI 211, 2012, particularly Regulation 7. It is being suggested that there is a mandatory use of the national ID card. But the law didn't say so. The law said those who are issued with the card are enjoined to use it mandatorily. The law didn't say that the card must be mandatorily used. It is only when you are determined to have been issued with the card, that is when it is demanded of you to produce it when you are seeking other public services, such as the registration of, of, of NI, NHIS and such other things. Mr. Speaker, with this words, I second the motion on the floor. Thank you. Yes, Majority Chief. Speaker, I'm, I'm grateful for the treasured space. And Speaker, let me say that I had paid attention to listen to my colleague, your Honorable Dafemme Paul, as he contributed to the motion for the adoption of the report. So let me address a few issues my colleague raised from the outset, and I'll reference the report copiously. So, uh, it is not true, unless my friend proves me wrong, that the report has indicated that premium services are offered in 
Ashanti region and Eastern region, as my colleague is alleging. It's not true. And my colleague should just come with me to page, page 15 of the report. So with your permit, I want to read. Item 6.2. Payment of 250 Ghana cities for premium service. And he goes ahead to say, the authority in response to a question as to why some citizens are being requested to pay 250 to obtain the car indicated that the fee paying is a premium service for Ghanaians who opt for such service. Premium centers have been set up at Car Bank and the NIA headquarters for such persons to assess the service. Where in the report has it indicated that it is done in, in the Asante region and Eastern region? This is most unfair. And you see, when we speak like this, we create some bad impression from, 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 from the outset. So my colleagues should just uh, take notice of that. Speaker, thankfully, the relevant issues have been teased out. Yes, may we hear from him? Yes. Uh, uh, speaker, thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I refer to a news publication on the on the 19th of December 2022, the NIA, the NIA released a press statement announcing that it has op opened its premium services offices in Ashanti, Eastern and the Western region. And this was carried by my job online. There has not been a disclaimer by the authority. So I didn't say that it was in the report. I am saying that if they saw it fit to open further premium offices in Ashanti, Eastern and the Western, in addition to the Greater Accra region, then it be extended to other offices in other regions. I didn't say that it was in the report. Yes, please. Speaker, I'm basing my contribution on the report, and I wish my colleague would limit himself to the report. Um, so, uh, proceeding further, um, let me go on to page 14 of the report. And I heard my colleague alluding to some statistical figures. So uh, it's also important that we recognize where we are coming from, where the NIA has transited from. So uh, some time back, funding to this institution was a big matter. I mean, at a point in time, the NIA had to close its doors. You see, it, it, it's critical that we, 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 we recognize important progress being made by such an important state institution, and we don't bastardize it. Now, look at the figures. Greater Accra, as my friend, my colleague rightly quoted, 3,178,000 980 came up as an enrolled figure. Then we have printed printed documents or printed uh, details, accounts. 3 million, out of the 3 million 178, we have printed cards recorded as 3 million 226 thousand. Issued cards, 2 million 955,634,000 CDs plus. Yes. I mean, this is a, a whooping jump. A massive improvement. Why would you want to discount this? So that if we come down to the total, in terms of the enrollment, we had 16,241,323 for the enrolled cards or applicants. Printed cards, 16 million. Issued card, 15 million. Why do we throw our hands out there and say that all, all is not well and things are so bad? This is a remarkable improvement from where the NI has moved on. So, yeah, so based on the data, there is a clear significant progress being made. And we must concede to that, encourage the NIA Yes, I agree there is some room for improvement. But at least the good things that have been chalked, we need to acknowledge it and urge them to move ahead. 
I also concede on concerns about uh, budgetary allocations. And thankfully, the leader of the House has been able to um, speak to the finance minister. And we have the finance minister here who will be making some statement to that effect. Concerns about limiting registration to district offices is a genuine one. And as a House, probably when we break into committee of the whole, we may have to find a common way to deal with this matter. So the issues really bother on financing, financing, and of course, uh, the matters as raised concerning budgetary allocation. So if this budgetary allocation, there is a clear commitment from the NIA through the finance ministry that these budget allocations will be made, what again will be our concern? I think we should come to some consensus on this matter. We don't need to split our heads. The issue has been teased out. Let's confront the issues at the Committee of the Whole and come to a conclusion on this matter. Speaker, again, we have an understanding issue of cars. The three million outstanding cars that needs to be issued. And, and when, you, when you talk about it, it also goes to funding. So bottom line, we need to get the necessary oxygen for them to prosecute their agenda and make sure that they bring the cars. And I want to emphasize that from the formation of the NIA, the days that NIA could even have staff. Now, if you look at the staffing, the staffing concern as shown, page 12, page 12, speaker, the NIA as of 2021 had requested 1,910 staff to optimally perform. Out of the 1,900, they got a whooping 1,326. That is also significant. That is significant. So, Speaker, not to at the risk of being repetitive, I think that we are making progress as a nation. NIA, I bet all the difficulties they are going through, they are doing well. We need to urge them, sit with them, discuss with them, and resolve the issue. Bottom line is funding. Let's commit the finance minister who is here to give us a, his word and promise, and I'm sure we can make progress on this matter. There is no need for us to split our heads on this matter. There's a clear path that the House must find and pursue it. So with these words, I urge the House to adopt this report and for us to break its committee of the whole and deal with all the outstanding issues as discussed. I thank you. Honorable members, at the conclusion of the debate, I put the question. Those in favor of the adoption of... I am guided by the leadership. Mr. Speaker, I said there's some discrepancies on yes. the report that he wants to correct before we adopt it. On the report. <coughs> yeah, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much for indulging me. Mr. Speaker, I've glanced through the appendices, and then uh, if I, I may refer the House to Appendix 2, or page, page 2, taking a half a half, a, a half region, population aged. 15 and above, you see 675198. And then Ghanaians aged 18 and above, 292732, which is correct. I don't want to bother you with a, a many examples, but if you turn to Bia East, Bia East, population 15 and above, you will see 32,726. And then enrollment. 34,351. Total printed, 34,094. Total issued, 32,882. Issued cars, 1,212. Or issued, 1,212. Printed, printing, 136. But if we come to Ghanaians aged 18 and above, you see 33,659. Meaning, 18 and above, they are more than 15 and above. Which is not possible. Because there's a three-year interval. So 15 and above, they are 32,000. But 18 and above, 
is 33,000. How come? And then look at the population too. The total population is 32,000. Yeah. 32,000. And you are telling me those under 18, at 15, they are 32. And under 18, 33. So, we have to have a real look at this document. We do the proper call before the question is put. They are cooked. cooked. Are you the speaker? You say no, no, cooked no. Feeders. Honorable member, you are right. The I are cooked. identified a lot cooked of feeders. discrepancies. I identified them myself. So many, many, many discrepancies. Even if you look at table two, you can see Upper West there. The region is not captured at all. Upper East is captured twice, but with different figures. So there are a lot of problems with the data, and I think they have to work on it. It was difficult to call them to make all those corruptions, uh, corrections. I think we just need to call on the NIA to go through the whole data supplied and maybe try to correct the the printer's devil's work. I think that that is what I can say. So with this, we acknowledge your input, and then I'll proceed to put the question. Honorable members, those in favor of the adoption of the report captured as motion number 25 at page 20, subject to the corrections, say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The report is adopted subject to the corrections. Honorable members, I would want to officially acknowledge the presence of the people you invited to be part of this debate and also attend to the Committee of the Whole. We have the Ministry of Finance led by the Minister himself and ably supported by the Deputy Minister. They have been here and they will be part of the Committee of the Whole. We also have, from the Electoral Commission, the Deputy Chair is leading the team, that is Dr. Bosman Asari, is the Deputy Chair of the Electoral Commission. We also have the Director of Electoral Services, Dr. Sribo Kweku, and then the head of procurement of the Electoral Commission, Mr. Kofi Che Diodu. They are from the Electoral Commission. The National Identification Authority is very popular here. We have as many as, I think, 12 of them and they are prepared to give you a presentation of, I'm sure, the corrected data at the Committee of the Whole. They are being led by the Executive Secretary himself. Uh, I'm sure many of you don't know that. Uh, he even wanted to be uh, the clerk to Parliament here. Uh, I, I, I know that because I was part of the board when he made the attempt. <laughs> the prof himself, that is Professor Kenneth Ajiman Atefua. He's my very good friend. He wanted to join us here. But now he has a better place, I believe. So he's leading the team from the NIA, and we have the executive assistant to the executive secretary, uh, Theresa Esson Benjamin, 
I don't know whether that's the daughter of the Esom Benjamin that I know. And then we have the actuarial analyst, uh, Joyce Lynn Na Ashon Nati. Yes, we had one Ashon Nati here too. And then the head of operations, Colonel Peter Kwame Gansa. Are you serving or retired? You are retired? Uh, okay. I don't see that here. It's like you are a serving officer. Then we have the head of technology and biometrics, Mrs. Matilda Achampon Wilson. We also have the head of finance. I'm sure he'll be telling you about what they have in their cafes. Reverend Dr. Sebastian Baba Azuma. He's the head of finance. We have deputy head of finance, Mata Kasei Fasuranti. We have the director, PPRME, Alaji Salifu Abdullahi. We have the principal officer, corporate affairs, Ekuba Koenoti. And we have the chief operating officer, James Katamanto Kumsin. We also have head portfolio management, Ekwa Chiribwa Asari, and then the head of operations, the Sylvia Boatima Asari. So this is the team that I've been waiting since morning. I apologize on your behalf for taking them through the experience we go through here. We sit the whole day without food, without water, and then we have to do our work. But we invited them, and so we should have been very good hosts. Um, I apologize once again. Next time we'll do better. We are like you. We don't also get the resources from the Minister of Finance. The Minister is here, and I'm sure he's hearing me. Minister of Finance, have you heard me? I said, have you heard me? Even when we invite witnesses here, we can't take care of them. And so next time, uh, we'll put item for it. Even when I speak, I have guests. I can take care of them. Uh, including you yourself, when I invite you to my office and you come to explain things, I can't even get you tea. Uh, and yet, <laughs> honorable members, in view of the fact that the NIA will be doing a presentation, I want to suspend sitting for a few minutes so that they can put the uh, things in order and then you come back to go through the process of the Committee of the Whole. You have already articulated most of the issues. I'm sure you'll be listening to their responses and maybe adding more. Then after that, we'll get the report from the Committee of the Whole, I'm sure by next week, and then we we'll try to go through it together. So with your kind indulgence, I will suspend sitting for how many minutes? Huh? One five. One five. One five. Honorable members, sitting is accordingly suspended for 15 minutes.
and you be a one ton and be a man in crime be brave. Mommy, you face you can see my cottage. The bugger, send you this cup from Lemon and Finance. While Brian did the shade and let me do pounds. Lemon and Finance. Say, say, they're sending money back home from UK, Canada, and now US. I have something like an instant charge. Yeah, I still wait in this year. And you're on. We should be promo code Dr. Like it. Nigga, 10 pounds, 10 dollars, and a 10 Canadian dollars for a first transaction. Who this send this guy a coffee? You know? Download to Lemonade Finance. Chairman, I have a background in business, um, but one of the businesses that I've done in the past, a company called Into IT, have worked on a lot of IT projects with government. Uh, to chip in, my PhD focused on that uh, because I, I was able to unearth that, unearth that um, if you sharpen your vision, share it, you'll be able to achieve mutual understanding in the execution of government projects. My job, principally, is to ensure that the vision of government is sharpened, explained, the objectives so set, and I lead the, the team in the ministry, the same team, to achieve a different, much higher productivity. In fact, if you look at my background, I did a project um, at the Controller and Accountant General's Department, it was not possible to solve these ghost names problems. They had bedeviled this country for so many years. In the last eight years, my software have removed about 60,000 people from the payroll. Before we started, Mr. Chairman, before we started, it looked impossible. But we studied the problem, we designed a solution, we implemented the solution with the same people at Accountant General, and we achieved the results. We have gone on to implement other software products in government and has achieved marvelously uh, in Ghana and in the sub-region. So I have an experience with working with people and working with the public servants. And I believe that this same skill will lead me to uh, achieve the set objectives of government um, in the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Yes, there are donor funds um, at the Ministry. The Ministry is ex executing several projects that are being funded by the uh, European Union, the World Bank, and, and others. In fact, uh, in the last uh, couple of years, there have been some gaps in, in some funding that we, we received from the EU. We're going to work on all that to make sure that as things normalize around the world, we have a fair share uh, to drive uh, a great productivity in Ghana. And I'm sure that as we do that, there will be more opportunities for, for fertilizer and, and, and all the interest um, um, that private business people have in the country. Mm -hmm.